Madam President, are you ready for me to call roll? Yes. Trish Bodie. Here. Gloria Gonzalez Dolecchia. Here. Alexis Grimes. Here. Sade Fashakun. Here. Aaron Johnson. Christine Maurer. Here. Anna Smith. Here. It is 6.16 p.m. with a quorum of the board present. I declare our October 27th Leander ISD Board of Trustees regular meeting to order. Um, we will now proceed to the next item on our agenda, which is our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, before we get started, <laughs> Um, and before we stand, I would like to introduce to y'all who will be doing um, our Pledge of Allegiance this evening. I said that just a minute. Loading. It's, lo it's loading. I know who it is, but I want to tell you all the good things about it. Leading our pledge tonight is Cadet Master Sergeant Matilda Chansey, who is the daughter of Ray and Norn Chansey. Matilda serves as Leander Air Force ROTC Cadet Director of Support in charge of personal, public affairs, and logistical matters for 88 of her fellow cadets. She is also the AFJROTC Physical Fitness Competitive Team Commander. Outside of school, Matilda enjoys the outdoors and especially fishing. Matilda aspires to become a pediatrician in the U.S. Army. Matilda, thank you for being here this evening and leading us at our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one indivisible. If you'll join me in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. All right, we will now move to our next uh, favorite part, spotlighting students, our recognition. We will be spotlighting on learning our Danielson Middle School. Madam President, uh, Dr. Gearing, Board of Trustees, thank you so much for having us out here this evening. Um, I brought some students with me from Danielson. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you what grade level they are in. Hello, I'm Jackson Meekman. and I'm in eighth grade. Hello, I'm DJ Gilmore, eighth grade. Hello, I'm Sofia Duarte, seventh grade. Lucy Moy, I'm in eighth grade. Hi, my name is Brian McEwen. I'm in eighth grade. My name is Tejasvi Kashidi, and I'm in sixth grade. My name is Mark Kohler. I'm the proud principal at Danielson Middle School. Two of my three as, uh, uh, assistant principals are here with us. They're off camera over to the side because that's what they do, but they're such amazing people. So we have Leslie Stevens and Twanta Moore here, and Mr. Potter, Adrian Potter, is back at a band concert. Um, we're going to start off kind of telling the story of who we are and, and why Stacy K. Danielson Middle School. Stacy Danielson defined what it meant to be selfless in her devotion to her students. She taught them what it meant to be a team, and even more importantly, she taught it what it meant 
taught them what it meant to be the absolute best version of themselves. Over the years, it was not at all uncommon to hear the following expressed by her students. Miss Danielson made me feel loved, special, important, trusted, seen, and like a friend. They said things like, I will be forever thankful because you influenced my life, and I am a better person because of you. To live, in, to live the Stacey K way is to invest, encourage, and impact our Danielson Middle School community. Thank you, DJ. So we're going to take a second and tell you how we are empowered to invest, to encourage, and to impact, right? And so we're going to start with uh, Brayden. And Brayden, I'm going to hand you this microphone, okay? okay. Is that all right? Can yeah. you tell us how are you empowered to invest, encourage, and impact at Danielson in your classrooms? Okay, so I feel like I'm empowered to invest, encourage, and impact at Danielson Middle School from just like you know, seeing all the people from different backgrounds and like different cultures, and then seeing people that like did, didn't have as much as like I had growing up, like not as much money and like maybe didn't have both parents and they're still thriving and maybe even doing better than me. So like, I feel that's just like really encouraging me. And another thing that's like helping me is like in this advanced leadership class, it's like really showing me that like even the kids that have disabilities, they're still going through and doing their best. And I feel like if I have no disabilities, I feel like I should be doing my best. Excellent. So in your advanced leadership class, that's a PE class. Lucy, you're in that PE class, right? Right. What is your favorite part about your PE class? Football and basketball. What did you ask me every day last year, Mr. Kohler, I want to play what? Basketball. Yes, you did. Every single day you asked me to play basketball, right? And now every day you work with Brayden, right? And how is it working with Brayden in your PE class? Good. I love him. And he's sweet. Ooh. And I love him because I get thumbs up. You get thumbs up. Brayden, what is it like working with Lucy? Uh, I feel like it's fun. I, was like, I can see her improve every single day and just see her have fun. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I love dance. Oh, you like your dance class too? I like it. I like your dance class. Do you like your dance teacher? Yes. Perfect. All right. So I'm gonna, can I ask DJ a question? Is that okay? DJ... As a student at Danielson, how are you empowered to invest, encourage, and impact on a daily basis? Well, when I came into Danielson, I was in seventh grade, and I was new, so I didn't really have any friends. But, and I feel, I, there are a lot of kids this year, and many more years to come, that will be in my uh, situation, and they might not be as good as I am as making friends. So I feel like if I'm friendly and caring to everyone I see, it can give them more opportunities to express themselves and have more friends so they're not alone throughout their school years. Thank you, DJ, I appreciate that. Sophia, can I ask you a question? Yeah. As a student in dual language, can you explain to us how are you empowered through the dual language program to invest, encourage, and impact? Um, when I'm in the dual language program, it's a lot of project-based learning that helps students, such as myself, to understand the subject in a way that cannot be understood by copying something down from a screen. It helps broaden our interests and discover new things that could be hobbies, talents, or even passions we might want to pursue as a career. It also helps build and provide a safe environment for students who speak Spanish, a place where we can speak our language and not be afraid of being misunderstood. The dual language program at Danielson has provided me with the tools I need to be successful in my academic and personal journey. Okay, I like it. Thank you. All right, Jackson, we don't want to leave you out, right? Yeah. So you're, you're taking some advanced courses. Like, you take geometry before school even starts, right? Like, yes. you have zero-hour classes. What is it like taking advanced courses, and how are you able to be empowered to invest, encourage, and impact at Danielson? I'm empowered to invest, encourage, and impact by my advanced courses because they always push me to try my best and think as hard as I can which really, um, when, when I have to think and stuff gets challenging, I'm more invested and want to work more uh, towards my schoolwork. And project-based learning and working with a lot of my friends and peers on projects also just makes learning more fun. And I don't know about y'all, but I like learning a lot more when it's fun and I learn a lot better. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. All right, thank you, Mr. Meekmet. Now, Ms. Kishidi, you were upset with me because you're the only sixth grader on the panel, correct? Oh, let me get you a microphone. All right, so as a sixth grader coming into our campus, how have you been empowered to invest, encourage, and impact in your classroom? So being a sixth grader, I have a lot of expectations for myself. And 
in elementary, it was like, okay, it's fine that you missed this test. It's okay. You can do better next time. But here, it's like one opportunity. You have to do your best with it, and you have to invest all your time into what you're doing. So, like, even if you don't like doing it, you have to do it. And then you'll get, like... You get that self satisfaction that you're being you're doing better to do better than you were like yesterday. And I like doing this by putting goals for self improvement and I feel like I have to improve myself every day to make myself happy. And so Keeping goals keeps me in track to success. And if I don't keep goals, I and eventually go off topic, and I end up in results I don't want to see. So I just think that's important. All right, I'm going to keep asking you questions. Is that OK? OK. OK, because you had talked about, and we had all talked about, how much we loved all of our elementary school experiences, right? Shout out to your elementary schools. Back. All right, there it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> You, you talked about when you were in elementary school, you would, you would take an assignment, you would do the assignment, and you would be done, right? Mm -hmm. And you were usually pretty successful on them, is that correct? Yes. So what have your teachers done this year through project-based learning that has been different for you, and what has your experience been? So project-based learning is not like normal learning where they give you a few questions, and then you answer it, and then you're really done. It's more of they give you a project that ties with your learning, and that's like more like an infinity chain. So you can do like forever and forever. You can keep updating, and you can also see how much you've grown through the years because uh, you can always keep updating and making it better. For example, you're writing a narrative. At the beginning of the year, it has a good plot and everything. You did good, a good idea. But then you can add something more to it to make it better instead of being like, oh, what should I do right now? Do you use rubrics, or do your teachers give you rubrics for that? Our teachers give us rubrics to this so we can keep tweaking. So like, for example, we're at like a develop, the, developing or emerging. Mm -hmm. And we want to get to a proficient or advanced. So we can use a rubric to analyze what we have done and keep on improving. So for example, what we're doing, we're doing a, pers a fictional story right now. Mm -hmm. And they gave us rubrics of using internal conflict to get you to a proficient level. So we can start adding that. And you can be like, OK, here's where you can put it. And you can add it in while you're like done whatever the teacher planned for you. And you can just get a better grade from that. All right. Excellent. I also, I may have an opening for junior assistant principal. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> you talked a little bit about rubrics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can somebody, we, we grade differently at our campus. Oh, Jack, you want to talk? OK. Outcomes-based grading, can you kind of tell us what is that and what are we doing? Outcomes-based grading is basically grading not about like your like prior knowledge, but based on how much you learned. So like instead of just like basing grades off of like who's the smartest kid in the class, a lot of times it's based off how much you've grown and how much you've learned through the unit. So it's a lot more about outcome than it is about knowledge. So, Board of Trustees, Dr. Gearing, one of the things that we're excited about, we didn't have a performance today, we didn't have, because everybody's doing something on our campus. Last, it started Saturday, we had 27 students uh, make Region Choir. Monday, our right now, knock on whatever, uh, undefeated volleyball team was still in action and still are undefeated and they're still going. Tuesday, we had our dancers dancing uh, on the football field, our cheerleaders on the sidelines, and all six of our football teams in action. Last night, theater had a showcase and students were on stage. Tonight, our, sixth, our seventh and eighth grade band, some of our band parents are in attendance tonight, sorry, um, are, are out, uh, are performing. Tomorrow is a principal's dream, a sixth grade dance. <laughs> And, and then you come into Saturday, we have a volleyball tournament, and um, we have region band auditions. And so it is a busy time at Danielson, but uh, Dr. Green, you said uh, when you started on our campus, uh, change is about doing something amazing. This is our amazing right here every single day. Our students, we tell them, and this is old announcement stuff, but every day we say, make it a great day or not, the choice is yours. Live the Stacy K way. Thank you for having us tonight.
students, thank you so much, and for our principals and staff. We have parents and supporters in the audience for our Spotlight on Learning. Would those people who are here, parents and, spot, um, parents and supporters for our Spotlight on Learning, please stand so we can give you a round of applause. Thank y'all so much. All right, that was fun, y'all. We'll move on to the next item in our agenda, recognition of our transfer, trans, Transportation Appreciation Week. We'll get there. October 17th to the 21st, there's a video for this. First and foremost, thank you to the transportation staff and all who wake up each and every day to make this department what it is, to wake up early in the morning, 4.35 a.m. in the morning, to prepare a first class experience for the first class of the day in Leander ISD. I'm thankful to them all, and I just really appreciate and I'm grateful to all of them for all that they do in spite of all the challenges that they face each and every day. So just thank you again to them all, to the bus drivers, the bus monitors, our crossing guards, our mechanics, our routers, our dispatchers, their entire transportation team. All right, board members, we'll move next to our communication announcements. Superintendent Remarks, Dr. Gehring, do you have any? Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Oh, Madam Superintendent. <laughs> It's been a month for everybody. <laughs> I don't know if I could continue after that. Uh, we, we had a great lunch today, actually, at the Austin Chamber, um, and uh, the district was awarded two awards. I just want to share those really quickly. Um, uh, the first was for Rass High School for greatest improvement in direct-to-college enrollment for a high school campus um, in the Austin region. Yep. And then at the district level, uh, the highest college readiness rate for a school district out of uh, the Austin Chamber region. So I uh, just want to acknowledge those two things. Um, and then as we pull the thread through today, you're going to see um, a lot again of our uh, er goal areas in the strategic plan coming out. So a phenomenal presentation by our students, um, so articulate and um, you can tell how empowered they feel as students, um, that they can come up and this confidently uh, express what they're doing on their campus um, to others. But we'll see as we go through, as we talk about our campus and district improvement plan, um, we have some academic updates coming. We're gonna be talking about uh, the attendance credit election, some um, recognizing uh, our partnerships in the district with LEAF and with others. Um, and then also talking about the safety and security of our campuses uh, and also a, a, a further update on our transportation services. And so lots of variety in there that address all of these goals that are in our strategic plan. So thank you, Madam President. Board members. So Tuesday night, I got to attend the, um, the I'm gonna make sure I say this right, community-based I'm gonna mess it up, accountability system report. And uh, the charter, it was a, a steering group. And uh, I was really excited because it was parents and staff and our students, some of our students from the superintendent, uh, from your group, your SASAC people, uh, who are amazing. And it was so great to get their point of view on the report that was, that was um, presented and there's a lot of data in there. There's a lot of work in there, but to hear their kind of take on it was so refreshing because we talk about a lot of measures and all of those things, and and it's the community, you know, it's it's the accountability piece that goes with the strategic plan, and it and it it all maps with our our guiding documents and all of that stuff. But to hear the students talk about it, it's just so eye-opening to see, to hear what's important to them and how their voices are being heard. And I just want to say thank you to the staff and thank you to Dr. Gearing for starting that group, hearing their voices, and knowing that what they say matters 
because I think in the past, and this is something that they brought up um, in the meeting, was that in the past they weren't really sure that, well, why should I bother if my voice isn't going to be heard? But their voice is being heard, and you can see it. You can see it. And so it was really refreshing. So I, I really appreciated that night, and it was a lot of fun. So that's, that was just it for me. Quick update, the policy committee met last week. Um, there was, you know, a number of different items that we went through. There were some that we felt um, we needed to get additional information and, um, and really look at other, you know, kind of look at the policies in various districts and, and bring something back to the board to really have um, a more full discussion. Um, so we will be bringing some of those items to, to the board. And last night was the Vandergriff High School homecoming, and I know a lot of us have been at a lot of homecomings in the last month or so. And as I was sitting there and talking to teachers and principals and students, it was really, it was really nice to see this big celebration of our community and celebrating all of our students. Because here you have every club represented, and then on the field you have all the different student organizations, and you have all the parents cheering them on, and all these community volunteers. I just felt that, you know, these homecoming parades are more than, they're more than just you know, what I remember them growing up, it was, it was just football. And it's still a lot of football, and, but it's the whole community just coming together. I felt like it was just the best representation of one LISD. So it was beautiful. Thank you. So I went to Danielson Middle School, <clears throat> Danielson Middle School for the spot, uh, student, um, to see student learning in action. And um, even though my visit was an hour long, but we're all gonna, just gonna see a five minute video. Um, it was, I saw two of the kids that were my hosts today. Um, it was very interesting. Um, first of all, it's a beautiful building with so much light and so much space, um, flexible seating and, um, the we started off in the math area and just seeing them do what they the it's vertical he called it vertical something but it's stand up math and doing with fewer minutes he talked about how their math assessments are already showing great improvement over previous years because or over last year just because they're standing up and they're alert and they're getting their work done um, and collaborating as well and um, Christine and I had been to a DEI meeting as well, and there's going to be, they're talking about recruiting um, other parents who want to join. Um, that email should go out sometime in the next month or so. And um, also the DEI um, office working with schools and on um, STAR and other assessment information. Um, I had the privilege to visit Cedar Park High School and meet with our AP research students for Walk the Talk. It is literally Walk the Talk. I didn't realize that, and I'm glad I brought good shoes. Um, <laughs> but what was awesome is um, these students have researched and analyzed at least 12 different articles for their research paper. And I got to meet with four different students, and one of them in particular, she's the fastest runner at Cedar Park High School, that's all I'm going to say. Um, her research topic was on food waste. And so some of her researching into what food waste looks like is to visit her local cafeteria. And so she's gonna analyze how much food our CNS workers are putting out and what is left. And then what can we do to improve on what's left? And I'm like, man, that's kind of really good information. Like, you know, what else are you doing? So then she's like, I wanna take it a step further. I wanna go see what my peers are doing. And I'm gonna sit out and watch and see because a lot of the time she says, students are in the lunch line and they're just given food they really don't want and a lot of it's wasted. So she's trying to find how do we ensure that we're not wasting food and so I'm like, can I connect you to CNS? This is amazing information. But what I loved about it is that these students found a topic that was a passion of theirs and they went with it. And one in particular who is on the Student um, Superintendent Advisory Council 
was talking about bell schedules and I'm like, you should bring that up in your committee group because <laughs> it has to do with sleep schedules and what our teens are doing. And it was just, it was really good. Um, I, I just, I love this program that we have at Cedar Park High School. I just love that it gives our students the ability to research what they want and their passion. It's great. And then I also had the privilege to visit our Henry Extensions class. And I was all about community. And so they interviewed me two sixth grade classrooms about what it means to my uh, position in the community. And I thought I was gonna get like school board questions, like what do you do? First question is, is what's your favorite high school football team? <laughs> yeah, I know, I was like, oh, go Rangers. <laughs> um, again, what was awesome, another class where our students are being able to really dig into what's their passion. And it was really cool to see though, after you went the wall, like how their big um, key points and what we saw, community, collaboration, um, working together. And it's just, it makes me so excited to see some of the work, our, our guiding documents getting pushed down to the level and seeing what our kids are coming up with. And last but not least, um, I got to visit the 18 plus building. Y'all know I love that program. Um, they, if y'all haven't got a chance to visit, please go. The, this is an amazing program, and what I love about it in particular is I got to see some of the students who were seniors last year in our local high schools, and I got to see them there utilizing this amazing program that our district is able to provide more opportunities and removing a lot of those barriers for these students so they can become successful citizens in this community. And it was just so amazing just to see Trinity, I saw her, and just she remembered me and just those connections that we've made throughout the years. But that, that was it. I just wanted to say thank you, Vandegrift, for having us to homecoming. It was nice to be invited and included, and so that was a fabulous night last night. And also, I was able to attend Clue and um, the Snow. So we had uh, multiple theater programs happening in the last couple of weeks, and so those high schoolers did a fabulous job, Vista Ridge and then Rouse. And so fabulous performances, and it was so great to see them. One more thing really quick, the Lasers uh, Pancake Breakfast is Saturday morning, uh, 7.30 to 9.30 at Mighty Fine, and you can get tickets online. Um, all right, board members, I, I will point out that the event uh, that Dr. Gehring and I were at earlier when we received the awards was the State of Education and Talent. And I think that's so important to point out because it's not just about education, it was education and the workforce discussion together. So we had businesses and higher education talking about things like micro-credentialing or um, how do we get those certifications and scale them, um, how do we get our workforce ready for the future. So it was a really good conversation and uh, it was fun to also win some awards. So, all right, we will go ahead and move to citizen comments. We have a video to introduce our citizen comments for this evening. The district and the Board of Trustees are the local government body charged with serving the educational needs of all school children in the Leander Independent School District, like me, my mother's favorite child, as they pursue their mission to cultivate each individual student while creating a safe and supportive environment. The Board is now taking up the Citizen Common Agenda item, which is time set aside during this meeting to hear from the whole community, which can include a wide audience of the entire LISD family. Still, remember that there are other ways you can communicate with the board. You can send them an email, come to a board cafe, or just tell them that you would like to chat sometime. If the district believes the Leander family thrives and we ensure a welcoming, safe, and caring environment. Board operating procedures and BED locals specify guidelines, so it is important that you have read them before you speak. The board wants to hear from everyone, but still asks you to be mindful of your conduct and the example you are choosing to set when presenting complex information. If you're presenting material that only certain high schoolers may encounter, remember that school children of all ages may participate in the board meetings, either by watching them or you might see some in the audience. When the board president calls your number, remember, watch the timer and focus your remarks to the time allotted. We know it can be difficult, but please conclude your comments when you hear the chime. All right, we'll go ahead and begin with speaker number one.
Thank you, school board members, Dr. Gehring, LISD teachers and staff, and the police officers who are here to protect us. To update the request I made at the last school board, school board meeting, I am very impressed with the prompt attention the area superintendents and school staff paid to the issue I raised. You may remember the issue was how over-the-counter medicines are handled. It is unfortunately the case that many thousands of students will regularly experience the need for easy access to over-the-counter medicines. For example, up to 18,000 LISD students are likely to experience menstrual pain during their middle and high school years, and it is an unnecessary burden to ask them to visit the nurse. This, is li this likely has an educational impact and affects the school experience. I think policy should enable students to carry only the minimal, over -the -count minimal amount of over-the-counter medication required subject to parental permission. Moreover, members of, a, of the larger LISD community don't have a common understanding of the policy. I can assure you it's an issue for students. Perhaps more, more than the policy, wait, Perhaps more than the policy, simply providing information in detail LISD site could help. I and others will be following up with the staff contacts you provided. I just want to compliment you on the very effective way you have involved students in improving LISD. Thank you for all that you do. Excellent. Thank you. Speaker number two. Hello, Board of Trustees, Dr. Gehring, and everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan D'Elia. I've been a teacher in the district for over 15 years. I also have children in Leander schools. Uh, during the last few years, there's been a lot of controversy in this room and on social media, uh, but not so much on the campus. On campus, we are teaching social studies and language arts and science and math, and kids are in fine arts and doing sports and doing all kinds of wonderful things and joining clubs. For the most part, staff, teachers, and students are very accepting of each other. Uh, incidentally, no one is trying to turn anyone's kid gay or trans or anything else we teachers have been accused of. Uh, what we're trying to do is treat our diverse group of students, everybody, with respect and kindness and acceptance, and that's what a small minority of people might be upset about. They're upset that we are inclusive that on campus and in classrooms, all students can feel safe. We teachers are just doing our jobs, which is what we've been doing the whole time, and we will continue to treat all students with acceptance and kindness and respect, because that's what teachers do. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number two. Speaker number three. My topic tonight is uh, Daniel Defense. This past week, I was accused of being trespassing because I came to pray for my children in the parking lot here at Leo Center. I struggled with that a lot this week, and I, I thought, why, why, would this, why would this be happening? I've been here 15 years in this district. I've been on every campus just about pretty much every week of the school year. First time I've ever been accused of trespassing. What was my crime? The Daniel defense. I was told not to pray. I reflected during the week about this. Back in May 19th, there was a pro-abortion demonstration on Glenn High School that was approved by you. You used excuse, First Amendment. That goes both ways. The Lord gave me comfort when he told me this week that don't be afraid, don't be worried, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So he released me to give this one final statement for you tonight. As the Lord Jesus lives, before whom I stand as his servant, let it be known that because you have rejected the one true and living God, nothing that you do will prosper. Everything you touch will crumble. The ground is cursed for your sake. Repent 
and you will find that he is the God of love and mercy. Repent not, and every evil thing that you do will come back on you. Thank you, speaker number three. Speaker number four. Good evening. Tonight I'm here to speak to the teachers and urge you to vote. You need to vote all the way down the ballot for our school board members and for props A and B. This affects your job. We have five out of seven seats up for grabs. If you don't know who the best choices are for our district, there are plenty of us teachers that could help you. Remember, leaving a vote blank is a vote to tear down LISD. Now teachers, we are so happy that all in LISD has been able to help inform you about what is happening in our district. Some have also sent information about how, how you have been treated by some of these new candidates. One candidate called teachers pedophile and also threatened teachers with legal action if they teach Leander curriculum. She also stated at a recent forum that she doesn't support money going towards SPED programs. Two other candidates who are endorsed by Texas Parents United have also treated teachers and admin disrespectfully. They are also endorsed by anti-LGBTQ group Texas Values as well as Texas Homeschool Commission. Yes, homeschool. I urge you to look at the candidates who state restore parental rights as their top issue. Students should always be number one. We need to move our district forward, not backwards. Vote down the ballot for props A and B and to support our students, teachers, and our schools. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Speaker number five. Good evening. My name is Alexis Huddleston. I've been teaching in this district for five years, and I'm here tonight to urge everyone to please come out and vote and to vote for Prop A and Prop B. Prop A is our recapture ballot measure, and people who are opposing it will say we're not even in recapture, but we are going to be in recapture because of property tax increases. Over 200 school districts in the state of Texas pay and purchase attendance credits from the state because they are in recapture. It's widely regarded as the most cost-effective way to do this, so I urge you to please vote for that. We don't even really know what will happen if we vote against it because no school district has yet not passed it. Prop B is asking us to approve this measure so that we can keep our teachers in schools and we can keep programs that we want. If we do not pass Prop B, we are going to have to cut near 500 teacher positions. That's gonna increase class sizes. That's going to possibly put programs that we love, band, theater, these programs that really get our kids engaged and focused in school possibly on the chopping block. So we need to make sure that we are passing that. Um, people are going to say that it's a tax increase, but overall it is a tax decrease. You will see a tax increase due to property taxes, but the school district is not at fault for our property values. So we don't need to punish teachers and students as a result of that. So please come out and vote for Prop A and Prop B. Thank you. All right, thank you. Speaker number six. Good evening, trustees. My name is Mike Sanders. Uh, I had intended on speaking on one subject tonight, but I've, I've changed my mind a little. There's so many things on the agenda that I'd like to be able to speak on, and uh, I just wanna say that the most important thing to, to me right now is what's being done to 40, 42,000 children in our school district and the sexualization of these little children. Uh, I think that is completely wrong, uh, and I think most decent people think it's completely wrong for any adult to be telling a little six, seven, eight-year-old, maybe you're really a girl trapped in a boy's body, and what are your real preferred pronouns? Would you rather be called she and her? Or, or you know, I think that this kind of, of, of sexual grooming, all of you here should be ashamed of. You should be ashamed of what's being done to these little children in elementary schools. You should be ashamed of the pornography that's in our high schools and middle schools. You should be ashamed of what you're doing to these children. 
That's why I'm fighting for these children. I'm fighting along with my, my friends Brandy Berkman, Sean Leggy, and Paul Gauthier for a place at this seat so that we can change the direction of this school board, that we can change the direction of this school district and stop the constant raising of taxes. Every year you folks raise our taxes, our property taxes. This year, you wanna raise them by 35%. And when every single voter goes into the ballot box to vote, they're gonna see written in the language a 35% increase in taxes on Prop B. All right, thank you, speaker. Speaker number seven. Thank you all for your service. Um, we're in election season. <laughs> that, that's pretty obvious. Um, I, I just want to, to thank you. It, it's, it's a hard job. And, and you are attacked and lies are told about you. Um, no one is trying to sexualize anyone. Uh, I am a gay man and I appreciate the fact that we have teachers that will speak for diversity and will treat LGBTQ plus and trans kids with respect and include them and let them know that they understand that their lives may not be easy yet, but it's gonna get better and we appreciate that. The other thing I'll say to you is I can tell you for a fact, companies like Samsung, Companies like Dell, some of the biggest countries and uh, companies in the world want you doing diversity. They want you doing inclusion. And if we don't do it here, it's easy enough for them to put their businesses somewhere else. So thank you. And thank God too, election season will be over soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker number eight. Good evening, neighbors on the board. Hopefully this is the last time I have to speak to you. I just wanted to uh, thank Aaron Johnson for his great analysis of the STAR reports. As you know, that is uh, data that kind of recently became available. So I wanted to go over it so it doesn't escape your attention. The bottom line is that LISD is in the bottom quartile for meeting grade level across all districts across all grades, actually. 45% of students don't meet grade level. Nine in 10 elementary schools are below average. Two thirds of elementary schools are bottom feeders. I call that because they're in the bottom quartile. Eight in nine middle schools, so 80% of the middle schools are below average. I'm sure this is shocking to some people. A third of the middle schools are bottom feeders. All LISD high schools are below average, including Vandegrift, where my kids went. I don't think it was like that back then. A third of LISD high schools are bottom feeders. In fact, in the lowest 10%. This is not a funny thing. So how are you going to fix this, board? Isn't this your only issue? Should be. My favorite Nemo character was hired by your board to run this district. You did it. You need to undo that, or we're going to fire you, too. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker number nine. Good evening. Thank you to the Board of Trustees. Every single voter in this district needs to vote in this election like your kid's future depends on it, because it does. Understand Proposition A and B and vote for both to ensure that we retain staff and continue programs. Be educated on the candidates, listen to and read their exact statements on topics, and most of all, issue them the natural consequence for their disregard for your students' rights and programs if they fall into that category. If a candidate states that we need to only look at K through 12 and cut everything else, they are demonstrating their ignorance. Public schools are legally obligated to provide vital early intervention services, assure that child find is utilized to identify 
every individual in need of services birth to age 21, provide 18 plus services, provide pre-K to qualifying three and four year olds, and on and on and on. If a candidate tells you there is no diversity problem or equity is a bad word, they are demonstrating their ignorance. We have seen the fact that students who are part of minority populations, such as special education, disability, black, Hispanic, and economically disadvantaged populations, have lower access to achievement as compared to peers, and they end up in LEO at higher rates. In addition, these populations have come to the district time and again to firsthand express these barriers. We want to overcome those. We better have people on this board that understand students and care for students and place them first and foremost. If a candidate cannot follow basic rules, then complains about the consequences they are demonstrating that they are less fit than my second grader who already masters the concept of social responsibility, rules, and consequences. Vote accordingly. Thank you, speaker. Speaker number 10. Hi, my name is Joel, and I'm a parent of kids in this district. You know, it, it really does hurt me when I see people come up here and say, LISD is bottom feeders. It really, really does hurt me, because my kids go to this school, and they are really benefiting from the teachers that really go above and beyond for them every single day. We have people that come in here that don't care about our district, that then want to tell us, oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. No, you should be proud. Our teachers should be proud. I, want, I came up here to talk about Prop B because I'm proud about our district and I want to fund our teachers. My kids come into school and our, our teachers go above and beyond for them every single day and I want them to be rewarded for that. Right now, our teachers are not being paid enough to actually live in this area. And this is an opportunity that we can invest in our teachers in the future of our school. So please, when we say vote up and down the ballot, learn who the school board candidates are, learn who are the ones that care about our school district, because if, you're, if they're saying I'm against, that you should vote against Prop B, they're not for our school district. So I think, I think everybody needs to go up Vote down the ballot, and please vote for Prop A and Prop B. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 11. Thank you, Board of Trustees and Dr. Gehring for giving us time tonight to speak. As many of you have heard, early voting is going on right now from October 24th through November 4th, Election Day, November 8th. Had someone tell me once, the further down the ballot you go, the closer to your front door you get, the bigger the impact on you personally. Our Council of PTAs recently put on a forum that included all 14 candidates. That's amazing. I know there were lots of forums. That's the only one I've heard of that had all 14 candidates. Not only that, our Council of PTAs brought in student moderators that represented our high school students from Cedar Park High School and Leander High School. They also had a student from Leander High School in the back of the room doing a streaming video. So anyone that wants to can go online to the lisdptacouncil.com slash advocacy, click the link and watch on YouTube the entire stream of the candidate forum Closed captioning is available, and there is also a link access to the transcript if you don't have time to watch the video. It is important that we vote where our values are for our families so that our district continue to offer the amazing things that they have throughout the district. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Speaker number 12. Thank you to the board, the teachers, the staff of Leander, and to the police as well. I just want to say it must be very difficult to ask you to listen to some of these speakers. Um, the teachers and the staff of the board, you should all be really proud of the work that you're doing uh, to try to support kids. This stuff gets really politicized. People get attacked. 
uh, and it's a, it's a real shame. Uh, and sometimes when you just repeat what people say, you can look a little crazy when you just report what they say. So I'm going to say some stuff that you need to be aware of. Uh, because your experience, speaking of diversity, equity, and inclusion, your experience might not be other people's experience. That's the whole point about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Your experience might not be the same. What you need might not be the same. And so there was a concerted effort this last week uh, by some right-wing groups to launch a campaign against interracial marriage and biracial kids, calling it a sin. Uh, and that's going to be showing up and has already shown up in Leander ISD. And you as and with some of your families that you have wouldn't directly experience that, but that's a thing. It's the kind of thing that you've approached in a positive way, uh, in a way that's fair to people who hold attitudes like this, but don't allow that to infect or hurt the larger population or hurt kids who are vulnerable. And I think it's wonderful that you do that. Uh, and uh, there's so many other things that are like that. Uh, I think it's just really important for people to really consider the ethics of their decision as they vote, as they go into the ballot box, you've, you've got to make a good decision and vote for people who don't do things like that. And there are a lot of them, a majority of all the candidates. Um, thank you very much for all you do. Thank you, Speaker. All right, this concludes our citizen comments. We'll move on to our consent agenda. If there is not a motion to sever, is there a motion to approve? I move the board approve the consent agenda items as presented. I second. I have a motion from Anna, second from Christine. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven ayes, no nays, motion carries. All right, I'd like to thank our citizens for coming out again and speaking. I'd like to thank y'all for moving us quickly through the consent agenda. We're going to hop over the superintendent's report to have um, a speaker. We have a guest speaker here to come up and present this evening. We're going to item 8B1, the governance issue, discussion of school finance, recapture, attendance credit elections, and potential TEA actions. Madam President, if I may, please welcome our brand new CFO, uh, Pete Pape, uh, for his first board meeting and his first presentation. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board, Madam President, uh, Super, uh, Dr. Gearing, our superintendent. Uh, tonight, I appreciate the opportunity we have uh, to talk about school finance, recapture, attendance credit elections and the potential TA actions. As we know, uh, Leander ISD, uh, based on the increased value, our local values have put us in a situation where we are facing recapture. Our recapture amount has gotten to the point where it's above any of the state funding we've ever received in the past. So we're not able to offset it like we had in prior years. And as such, we are holding an attendance credit election. And so there's a lot of information out there. Uh, it's, it's confusing. It's a very complex situation. I can tell you, 21 years as a CFO, there's not much simple about school finance. And we've entered a, a realm of the school finance that's, not any, that's even more complex. <coughs> so tonight we have with us, we've invited Mr. Uh, Leo Lopez uh, with Moat Casey. Uh, Moat Casey is a firm, been in, around Texas over 20 years. Very well respected. Uh, it's a, the, the elite firm when it comes to school finance issues work with the legislature, individual legislators, work with individual schools and groups uh, to promote and help them through complex school finance situations. Uh, before uh, transitioning, he's recently transitioned to Milk and Casey. Before uh, he was, before he worked at Milk and Casey, Mr. Lopez was actually the uh, associate commissioner for school finance at TEA. He actually worked at TEA when Houston ISD's ACE uh, first election failed, and he will be able to provide us some information from both TA's perspective and throughout that process, and to be able to clarify any uh, questions or, or concerns we, that, are, are, that are pertaining to our particular situation right now. Uh, before that, he was a deputy CFO at Austin ISD, and then prior to that, he worked in TA in another capacity. So we have put together a present, let's rephrase that. Mr. Lopez has put together a presentation <laughs> I looked at it, gave it my thumbs up. It looked great. Uh, but I will turn the time over to Mr. Lopez. Uh, he will walk you through the, the process, uh, the, the, the presentation, and then obviously at the end we anticipate there could be some questions and, and probably expect to be some pretty complex ones. And we'll be, he'll be here to answer those questions as well. All right, thank you. Mr. Lopez. Uh, thank you very much, Pete. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Again, like Pete mentioned, uh, my name is Leo Lopez. I've been in 
public school finance for over 20 years, as that pains me to say out loud. Um, like he said, I spent the last six years um, as associate commissioner for school finance, uh, four years at Austin ISD, and then 10 years in, in school finance, uh, seven of which uh, back then spent either directly or indirectly running ReCapture. So I've got about 15 years experience with ReCapture and with the topics that we'll be talking, talking about today. Uh, I also went through three major school finance rewrites in, in 2006, 2009, and in 2019 with, with House Bill 3. So, uh, you know, uh, he wanted me to, to say, to just let you know that, you know, the, one, the person that's talking knows a little bit about the subject. So, so with that, I will try to uh, be brief, but yet thorough. This is a very important topic, and I think it deserves uh, some respect, and, and I need to present it thoroughly so that way all the information is communicated accordingly, and you have all the information, and all those listening also have uh, all the information they need to make their decisions. And here we go. Um, so what I'm gonna begin with first is level setting. So uh, some of you may, may know a little bit about school finance, others may know more, others may know less. And so I'm gonna start kind of just really basic high level and then we're gonna uh, drill down to more details uh, related to recapture. Um, it's important uh, to understand how the basic school finance system works and then we can build upon that knowledge, uh, that shared knowledge as, as I move through the presentation. So uh, as you can see on this slide here, public, public school finance, uh, it's, it's uh, schools in Texas receive their funding through a series of formulas and allotments called the Foundation School Program. Uh, that, that those are set in chapters 48, 49, and 46 of the Education Code. And, and those formulas determine how much a district can receive in total funding um, from state and local dollars. And so you can think of this entitlement as a bucket, and I'll, I'll use the bucket analogy in the next few slides to demonstrate how how entitlement works, how, how local funding works, and then how recapture works uh, to fill in the buckets. Now, everything I'm gonna be talking about right now is really limited to maintenance and operations. So there's a component about, of school finance related to interest and in sinking or debt service. Those are the, the, the dollars that, that go to, to pay for, for debt service on voter approved bonds. We won't really be talking about that. This is really limited to maintenance, maintenance and operations funding. And of course, there are a few exceptions and additional allotments outside of the bucket, but for the recapture conversation, this analogy is a really good way to explain how it works. So again, so everything is based on your bucket. Uh, generally speaking, uh, there's only a few ways to increase the size of your district's bucket. So you can either have more students or you can have more students participate in specific programs such as special education, current technology, dual language, et cetera. Uh, those, those all uh, drive additional weighted funding in the system, and that drives to increase the size of your bucket. Uh, additionally, you can, you can also increase the MNO tax rate. I'll, uh, I'll explain in a few slides uh, the different components of the MNO tax rate. Uh, there's tier one, tier two, and how that all interacts, uh, but generally speaking, uh, boards can, can increase the tax rate to a certain extent, and then voters can go approve additional tax rate increases, and that provides additional revenue as well. See, on the next slide, uh, what happens is first, the way the, the funding formulas work is that the state first looks to see what a district can raise locally through local funds. So what you have here on, in the slide in front of you uh, is the green represents the local component. So it's, it's called the local share or the local fund, local fund assignment. Now, one, one thing to note here is that this is, there's a slight difference between this isn't exactly local tax collections. This is the state's approximation of your local tax collection. So instead of taking your actual collections generated by your tier one tax rate, what the state does is it takes your tier one tax rate and it applies it to your comptroller property value. Um, I'll refer to that value throughout the presentation as either comptroller value or T2 value. And so what happens uh, with that is that the, the local appraisal district, uh, you, you have your local values, which is what you tax on and, and collect taxes on, that information gets sent to the state comptroller's office. They do what's called a property value study, and they make certain adjustments. There's certain exemptions that the state doesn't recognize, and, and then the state publishes what they call the property value study, and, and they come up with a set of T values. There's a several, there's, there's many more than just, just the T2, but that's the main one that's used in school finance, and then that T2 value is what TEA applies your, uh, your adopted tier one tax rate on that generates your local share. So 
what happens uh, for districts that do not pay recapture is the orange is, is represents the state aid that the state fills in. So th the district in this example could only raise a certain amount in green and then the state fills them up their in, all the way to their entitlement. Now in districts like yours on the next slide, as you can see, due to the vast property value growth that, that has occurred in tax year 2022, my understanding is it's roughly around 27, 27 percent in year-over-year -year growth. Because of that, your local collections are spilling over the bucket. So, so the, the amount that, that spills over the bucket is called excess local revenue, otherwise known as recapture. This, this extra revenue must be dealt with according to, the, according to what's in statute. So there's a number of different ways which I will explain the different options available to school districts, uh, but, but, the sh but the short uh, version of that is that that money needs to get sent away from the school district so it can be used to redistribute to other school districts um, in the state. So now I'm gonna quickly talk about the MNO tax rate because there's a few components that affect recapture and affect uh, certain things later in the, in the presentation. So you have the tier one tax rate on the left and then you have uh, two versions of, of, or two components of tier two. So there's 17 pennies available to school districts to levy above the tier one tax rate. The first eight pennies are for the first level of tier two and then the, the next nine pennies are for the second level of tier two. They're collo colloquially known as golden pennies and copper pennies. The tier one portion of, of the tax rate is what gets compressed. And so in 2019, when I, I mentioned House Bill 3, uh, that creates ongoing compression. So what happens there is that a school, all school districts go through uh, two parallel processes where the state runs two formulas. So it runs state, state compression based on statewide property value growth, and then it, it runs what's called local compression. And so whichever methodology results in the tax rate, in the lowest tax rate, that's the tax rate that gets uh, assigned to the school district. So TEA does that calculation each summer and then in early August publishes the maximum tier one tax rate. Uh, for, for your district, uh, that tax rate is, is a point eight eight zero four six or 80, about eight and a half cents. And so what happens here is that um, the, the tier one uh, pennies are subject to recapture. The golden pennies are not subject to recapture, and but the, the copper pennies are subject to recapture. And so again, I kind of went through this, I just talked about this, so this just, again, reiterates what I just said, so I'll move on in the interest of time. So the, uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is the timing of school finance data. So uh, I, I understand that there's been a little bit of, of confusion in the community lately about uh, certain information that's been reported on the, the TEA's website versus what's been communicated from the, from the LIC's finance office. And so uh, the way I, I want to explain what happens in school finance, so generally speaking, the agency does not have access to real-time data. So, so the, the agency operates on estimate, estimated data and provides cash flows to school districts based on estimates. And then at the end of the year, the, the, or, and throughout the year, the, the agency gets information from school districts and then does what's called a settle-up process. So you'll get to the end of uh, September. So last month, September 2022, the agency settled up for the 21-22 school year, right? So there is a, a bit of a lag, and I'll show how that lag affects the, the LIC's recapture information shortly. But uh, just for some examples, for uh, comptroller property values and tax rates, uh, even though you already know what your tax rate is because you already adopted it, the agency won't get that information until late January, early February. They get that information from the comptroller's office. Same thing with the, with the comptroller T2 property value. Uh, you all know what your local values are, and uh, your business office has a, probably a really good idea what your T2 values are going to be, uh, because any good business office, which, which you all have one of those, uh, any good business office is able to use uh, you know, historical ratios to project uh, you know, what they think the comptroller property values are going to be. So, so there's a reasonable, uh, th there's, a, there's a really good, uh, reasonable expectation that a good business office would actually know in advance, uh, you know, what, what their property values and student counts projections are gonna shape up to be before the, end, before the beginning of the school year. And so uh, for student counts, again, uh, the business office is, is, again, updating that information probably on a six weeks basis. I know at the beginning of the school year when I was at AISD, 
I'd be looking at attendance reports on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and then I'd plug that into my template. I'd see how that would uh, track against what we had originally adopted our budget on, and and, and the business office would continually be making uh, adjustments to the to the revenue forecast. The agency, however, doesn't get any of that information until the following August. The agency does get a snapshot of your enrollment in October, and then the state funding division actually doesn't actually get that information until February or March. And then in March, the state funding division makes a pro an updated projection on student counts just for their internal uh, projection uh, purposes. But again, they, they, don't, they don't actually fund districts on those counts until the following September. Now, uh, in the end, I want to make it very clear, actual data is always used uh, to calculate state aid and recapture for every school district and charter school in Texas for, every, for any school year. So there's no case where the state funds on estimates and then just lets it go. It, there's always a settle up. If the state owes money to a district, the state will cut a check the following uh, September. If a district owes uh, the state, then, then the payments for the following school year are, are reduced accordingly. And the same thing happens with recapture. If recapture was overpaid or underpaid, there is a settle up that's expected in September and October of the following school year. And so next I wanna cover how a district is actually designated as a, recap as a recapture district. So there's a few things here. Um, so prior to the school year, again, TEA using estimated comptroller property values and then using estimated WADA, what's called WADA. So WADA is an acronym in school finance. You may or may not have, have heard of it, um, but it stands for weighted students and average daily attendance. And despite the name, it represents more than just student counts. The vast majority of those allotments feeding into that calculation are generated by student allotments, but there are a few other things in there that, that play into the mix. I won't go into that to tonight because that's a, probably another 30 minute conversation. Uh, but just so, so there's a concept of WADA, there's a concept of wealth per WADA. And so wealth per WADA in school finance is determined by taking the comptroller's T2 property values and dividing it by WADA. Now, if, if I'm going too fast, please uh, let me know and I will slow down. Uh, so what happens um, every year Prior to, prior to July 15th, and that, that date is in statute, so statute says by July 15th, the agency must notify every district that is going to be subject to recapture for the following school year. So prior to July 15th, TEA sends out notices. It used to be a hard copy notice, and then uh, the agency moved to email notices uh, with a few years ago um, after COVID happened. And so uh, what the agency does is it, it notifies every single district that has a projected estimated excess local revenue for tier one, and if there's uh, any estimated excess, excess wealth per water greater than the copper penny yield of $49.28 per penny per water. Now, the reason why that's important is because even though you might have a district that is not currently taxing at that zone right now, the agency doesn't know what the, what the district's going to do the following fall. They might decide to have an election. So in, in, in order to guard against that, the agency and statute uh, accounts for that. And so the, every district that potentially could uh, be above the 49.28 level is notified as being subject to recapture. So even if, if the district does not um, intend to levy those rates or those pennies, excuse me, uh, they will get a notice from TEA and the district will have to take action, administrative action uh, by certain time, time frames according to the agency's uh, statute and rule. And so uh, I apologize for the size of this on the screen, uh, but uh, what this next uh, slide shows is the actual notice that's on TEA's website. And this explains why Leander ISD was actually designated as a recapture for 22-23. And so uh, uh, what this shows is that according to TEA's estimates, uh, your wealth per student as of that time using agency data was $61.87. That's, again, that's greater than the copper penny threshold of 49.28. And again, I've highlighted that in blue because this is gonna come back and I'm gonna um, explain this a little bit. Importantly, this threshold applies whether a district attacks in the copper penny zone. Now, if you look at the slide, if you look in, in, in the middle of it, even though it says estimated tier one, it says estimated tier one excess revenue, zero, right? And it says estimated tier two recapture, zero. So that leads me to the next slide or the next question. But TEA's notification shows $0 recapture. Why was the district notified? 
Well, again, I explain that because, because your current wealth, according to the agency, is above that $49.28. And if you decide to go for a tax increase, then those pennies would be subject to recapture. Now, separately, which we all know here, and I'll show you in the next few slides, you already know that you're actually gonna owe tier one recapture. The agency just does not know that yet. So here, this slide shows a couple of different versions of some questions that I've gotten in the past uh, uh, from districts now in my capacity at the agency. Uh, you know, uh, pretend that this question was for a different district, but this applies here, uh, and I'm just gonna read them. Does this mean that LSD is not required to take action regarding this notification of recapture status? Or, uh, you know, could an LSD simply forego the Vatri election, avoid recapture pennies, and avoid paying any recapture in 2022-23? No. That's cut and dry, the answer is no. While TEA's, and I'm just gonna read this, while TEA's preliminary recapture notification shows zero dollars recapture in both tier one and tier two, the reality is that once TEA receives updated data throughout the year, TEA's website will be updated to, to reflect estimates of recapture that more closely match what the district's current internal projections already show, and which show that the district will owe a substantial amount of recapture in tier one regardless of the outcome of the Vatri election. And TEA will expect the district to make a recapture payment in August 2023. Now, what happens is if the, Vatri, if the um, ACE election fails, the district does not have the authority to make that payment and the state will have to take other action. So next, I wanna cover uh, the differences between the agency's projections from July and, and the information I've received from the district uh, recently that shows the distinction. And so well, I'm gonna kind of orient you to what this calculation shows. The, this calculation shows uh, what's it intended to show uh, current uh, tier one, uh, it, total cost of tier one, which is the size of the bucket. The size of the bucket is, is line five. And then you have the local fund, fund assignment, which is line four that would represent the, the green part of the bucket that I explained earlier. And now you look here on, on the left column, under the TEA's notification, they are projecting a 33.3 roughly billion dollar uh, T2 value. That's based on a, a estimate of 4.36% growth. So I'm gonna say that again, uh, which I think I didn't, I didn't hone in on this um, earlier. Uh, this, this uh, if you go back two slides, if you can see in the, in the, in the, in the red, that shows what that, that projection is based off of that 2021 state certified property values increased by 4.36%. As we all know, what, what's going on locally, it's been closer to 27% is my understanding. And, and based on the figures that I've seen from, um, from, from the district, uh, I, I would see, see that that's very reasonable and probably very accurate. And so, this shows that uh, using TEA's numbers, using 4% value growth, and with a, a student with a WADA of 53,812. Uh, okay, so so if you remember, everything's based on a wealth wealth per student basis. That has again a wealth per student of 6187. Uh, however, uh, with that version of, of the TEA data, there's there's no tier one recapture, and then TEA doesn't have any information about a Vatri. So looking at the LISD numbers on the right, as you can see, we're working with a projected T2 value of 41.3 billion. Now again, th th that's, that's projected. We don't really know what the actual T2 value is gonna be in January, uh, but a couple of hundred million up or down really is not gonna make a huge difference. I know that sounds like a lot, but in school finance, uh, millions of dollars can be a rounding error. And, and when I was running things in, at TEA, tens of millions could be a rounding error. It's, it's a large system. And so, so uh, 41.3 billion, roughly, again, another key component of that is that the, the projected WADA for the current school year is closer to 51,400, um, so, or, or nearly 2,000 less, or more than 2,400 less than TEA's projection. For context, on, in the side of, of line two, I included what the district's WADA was for 21-22. As you can see, that was 49,445, okay? And so, if, if you go down to line nine, the wealth per WADA that, that right now the district is projecting is well over $80 per WADA, okay? And because, uh, and this column does assume a successful Vatri. So, uh, so I can explain uh, the question, well, what happens if the Vatri fails? What happens with recapture at that point? If you look at lines seven and eight on the right-hand side, right now that's broken up to about 22 million and roughly about 9 million. And so there's still gonna be recapture. 
And so, uh, you know, I just want to clear up the notion that uh, of voting no on the Votri will escape the district on its recaptured liabilities because that's not the case. And so uh, what I want to show you next is what are our options? And so there are five options in statute, um, options one through five. Uh, option three, highlighted in blue, is the most commonly selected option that's 100% of districts choose option three. A long time ago in the mid-2000s, uh, there were many more districts that chose option four. Uh, for a variety of reasons I won't get into, but, but option three is really the one that, that's, that's the choice. That's the one where voters vote, they approve it, and the district writes, writes a check. Well, they don't write a check anymore, but they send a wire to, to, to the agency. <laughs> and so options three, four, and five, uh, there are elections required on those three options. So option four uh, would be uh, to send money directly to a partner district. That's a, what I'll use the term property poor uh, district and then the state would then reduce state aid for that partner district. So it's kind of like, like a, a money triangle, if you will. So, so instead, of, instead of Leander sending money to the state and the state sending money to that district, Leander then sent, would send money directly to that district and the state would just reduce its funding to that district, right? So it's just a different way of doing it. Um, option five is a consolidation of tax bases. That's a little more complicated. Again, that's never been done to my knowledge, um, but that's where you have two boards that get together create another, create essentially a taxing entity uh, for maintenance and operations purposes, and then share the wealth that, that way. Uh, but again, that would also require an election. Uh, both of those are not really on the table because they're not on the ballot. So both of those options would have needed to have been called earlier uh, at the same time when you call the option three. Options one and four, or excuse me, one and two are volunt voluntarily consolidation, which I think happened once, I think, in, in 04, and voluntarily detached property, that has not happened uh, to my knowledge. Now, option two is different than detachment by commission or order, which I'll get to uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but voluntarily detaching property would mean that you all would take a vote to pick certain parcels of data and find a district that would be willing to take that property, and then you would reduce your wealth. However, if you remember, everything that I've been talking about has, has been related to maintenance and operations. Um, any loss of property would impact the, the INS rate. Because if you have the same debt service, but now you have less property to service that debt, that would result in an increase on the INS rate. So what are, what are requirements? Uh, and I say are because I'm presenting to you all and, and I'm trying to help you understand this. So what are our requirements? Uh, I've listed four. These are not all the requirements. And, and by no means is this meant to, to say that this is an inclusive list of everything that's required when the district gets notified. Uh, but but what I'm going to go through here is explaining uh, what each of these requirements means and, and, and why you, uh, you as a recapture district uh, has to do that. So the first one, uh, TEC 49.004C. So the district notified uh, as being a recapture district may not adopt a tax rate for the tax year uh, and that we're talking about until, until the commissioner certifies that the district has reduced its local revenue. So what does that mean? That means that upon, once you got, you got your notice, that means that the district is not allowed to adopt its tax rate un, unless you sent the agency a letter saying, we intend to equalize our wealth a certain way, you know, options one, two, three, four, five. So the agency, or excuse me, the district sent to the agency a, a letter of intent, that's what it's called, a letter of intent saying, we, we intend to exercise option three. And so you would have done that sometime in, in the summer, probably in, in July or August is, is my guess. And then, so the second requirement, what's required for a district that has never had an election uh, because of a court case that happened a long time ago, uh, a district can't simply send local property values, or excuse me, local tax collections uh, away to educate students in another, in another district. Voters need to approve that. And so an election is required under 49004B and must be ordered by September 1, which you, you all did that, you all ordered the election back in August. Now, one of the, um, I guess, biggest misconceptions, and I've heard throughout the years, I've heard this many times, I hear uh, prospective uh, stakeholders saying, well, what if we just, you know, I don't want to send my money back to the state. I'm going to vote no. I get to escape recapture, keep my money. Well, that's not really the way it works. So the state, so there's, there's no way that the district can escape recapture, but the state is given the district option saying, if you, if you don't want to vote, to, if the voters don't want to vote to, uh, to send the funds back to the state, then you need to have commission or order detachment or consolidation. 
And so uh, th that, that I kind of wanted to, to touch on that and just kind of um, elaborate on that a little bit. The third requirement, uh, TEC 49.151, uh, this says that a school district may execute an, an agreement with the commissioner. So that's really a contract. So there's a, a chapter 49 manual that the agency puts out and it's a, about a one and a half page contract that just says that you're intending to, to send an attendance credit back to the state and an attendance credit is a payment in the amount of the extra, excess local revenue and, and the, the, the um, superintendent and then some board members would sign that agreement and send it back to the state. Now, uh, because the agency recently moved to an online submission of that contract and typically only district, school district administrators have access to that system, uh, I believe you, you have on your agenda tonight an item where you authorize the superintendent to submit that agreement on, on the board's behalf. And that, that's all that means. That just means that because, because uh, the district has those, those accounts in, in the TEA system that he can log in and submit it once it's approved. And you can still sign the form and send that paper copy to the agency. But this just, uh, from an administrative standpoint, the agency did that in order to, to simplify things and not require all the school board members to suddenly have to go and, 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 and develop login or sign up for logins for the TEA system. The, the fourth requirement here that I want to talk about is the election under this chapter. Uh, it must be called and it, and it must be entered uh, not more than 45 days after the date of the agreement. So the, the, the election is November 8th and, and, the elect, and the agreement that you're going to be voting on later tonight, per my understanding, is within that 45 days. So that's, that's the, another reason why that agenda item is, is here. And so that's the reason why the, the, the administration cannot wait until after the election passes to submit the agreement for you because then they'd be violating uh, the timeline prescribed in statute. So now with all that said, what happens if the ACE election fails? I think that's really the, the big question that's been every, on everyone's mind. So, what I'm gonna, so normally speaking, what would happen is that once a commissioner determines that a school district can't reduce its excess local revenue, then the commissioner would order, an, order the detachment and annexation of property under subchapter G or would order, order the consolidation, the outright consolidation under subchapter H. And in terms, of, in terms of the timing about when that would occur, uh, the commissioner notifies districts the, 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 the rule says that the, the commissioner will notify districts uh, as soon as practical, practicable after receiving the election results, um, but by May 31. So in Texas, every piece of property needs to be in a school district. There's, there's no exceptions for that. And then any change in jurisdiction for school districts needs to happen by July, thir by, by July 1. And there's this, uh, in, the, in the recapture uh, statute, there's a, a sort of 30-day notice ahead of that. So that's why there's a May 31 deadline for that. However, the education code says that the commissioner shall order the detachment and annexation not later than November 8th, which is actually election day. Now, so, you, so uh, you know, some of you may be asking, well, would the agency actually do that on the day of the election, given that the, result, the results uh, aren't finalized? Now, it's my understanding that the agency has already reached out to the two appraisal districts for partial data in anticipation of what would happen for an unsuccessful, unsuccessful election. And then, uh, you know, if I can speak real quick on the next slide to what, what we did with Houston ISD. So back in, in the fall of 2016, I was Associate Commissioner for School Finance at TEA. Uh, Houston ISD had an election, it failed. Uh, the agency sent out, we sent out a, what I'll call the first round of, of detachment notification. Uh, and I went back and verified the dates. I checked with the agency that it was November 8th, 2016. So what happened with allies, with, excuse me, with Houston ISD ultimately that year, uh, they, were hope, they were hopeful for legislative re relief during the 2017 session. They found none when it was apparent that they were not gonna get legislative relief. Um, and at that point throughout the spring, uh, we sent out additional notices of detachment with more specific amounts and actual property, uh, actual, an actual listing of the parcel data to the district. They went ahead and called for an election they had an election in May, they passed it, they, uh, they then signed the agreement very, very quickly. They wired us the, the, the money that they owed because back then recapture was due February through August. And so they were delinquent February through May. They wired, once that happened, the agency, the commissioner then did send an order at the very end of May rescinding that. 
to my recollection that that order was dated right in the last week of May. That's obviously something that the district would not want to find itself in that position. Um, I did speak with agency officials a few weeks ago about this, trying to you know, see if I can get some sense as to the timelines that they were thinking. Of course, they weren't going to really tell me much. Um, I wouldn't tell me much if I was still there. Uh, <laughs> But, but you know, they, they, the, the general counsel did, did uh, point out that he reminded me that, um, you know, I'll cover this a little bit later, but that, that there's nothing in statute or in rule that requires the agency to reconsider a, a, a detachment order, right? So, so we did that in Houston ISD, uh, but there's nothing that says, hey, if an election passes after the fact, can you undo it? And so I, yeah, I just want to cover that real quick. Yes, and so to finish up this slide, uh, what happens or what would happen if TEA would need to detach or how much property would TEA need to detach in order to bring your district into compliance? So I won't run through the, through the algebra, but let's call it around 16 billion of T2 property value. All right, now that's a lot of money. That, that's a lot of property values. That represents around 39% of the district's comptroller values. Now that's not the exact amount that the district would detach or the the agency would detach. They've got to detach a certain amount of local property values that they think would result in 16 billion of T2, right? So they're gonna go through through a process of iteration and figure out what that ratio is. Uh, but however, when I was looking at this and when I was, uh, uh, you know, talking with the agency about it, you know, a few other things, a few other things uh, came to light, which I'll share in a minute. But another frequently asked question, you know, is a commissioner ordered detachment and annexation permanent? The answer is yes. It's a very simple answer. There's no need for elaboration. It's, it's permanent. Uh, does the district get to choose which property gets detached and where it goes? The answer is no. The commissioner chooses the parcels and the commissioner chooses where it goes. Now, uh, w one of the things that I, I wanted to, to, to cover here, though, is that in review of everything, uh, and then uh, kind of verifying this with the agency, although they were noncommittal, is um, one unique problem that I think is facing your district that Houston ISD did not face is that you're primarily a bedroom community and most of your property value is in residential, right? And so if you look at the top of this slide here, um, the, the only, what this, I'm gonna read this real quick and explain what it means. Um, under subchapter G, which is the, the commissioner detachment, the commissioner can only detach mineral property real property used in operation of a public utility, and there's a few other things there, and then real property used primarily for industrial or commercial purposes. So the commissioner cannot, and this is in blue, this is what the blue means, other than property used primarily for agriculture or for residential. So what that means is that the agency cannot detach that 16 billion from those categories, right? And so I'm gonna jump forward to a slide and I'm gonna jump back. So this is what your 2021 uh, T2 uh, designation looks like, not designation, but, but break out of your categories. As you can see, 92% of your tax base in 2021 was combined uh, for, for single family and multifamily residential. And so typically in my experience, these, these ratios hold pretty, pretty consistently. Um, and especially with, with what happened recently with the housing boom, um, I can see that, that I don't see this happening. I don't see this ratios moving much. So uh, what I would expect is when the, the comptroller property values come out in January, let's, let's just say that it's 40, 42 billion or 41, 42 billion and change, 90% of that's gonna be in residential, right? So, so 90% of that. So, so the, 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 up, the short version of that is that you all don't have 16 billion to detach, okay? Go, go, going back uh, this one slide here, and so again, I'm just gonna read this. Uh, because the amount of property necessary for detachments larger than what you have eligible, then the agency would have to follow statute which directs the commissioner to set detachment aside altogether and move straight into a forced consolidation, okay? So this is unprecedented. Again, this is something that, to my knowledge, has never happened. Uh, you know, I did try to press the agency when I talked with them about, well, you know, could they hold another election in May? Um, you know, with the, what happens if the Vatri election passes or fails, does that change anything? And, and they really made the point, uh, again, not committing anything. Um, they didn't want to commit anything. And they said, well, you know, we're still analyzing the data. But, you know, one of the things to remember is that detachment or consolidation, it's not a carrot, it's a stick. 
it, it's meant to, con to in incentivize voters to vote yes for ACE elections. And so, you know, uh, the point of the slide is that, that the district, I, I don't have any more information in terms of what, what district it, the district would be consolidated with. Um, I, do, I do know that what the statute says is that the statute says that the newly resulting district, the newly consolidated district, um, must not have a revenue level that exceeds the recapture level, right? So you can't create a recapture district through consolidation. Um, and then it goes through several different uh, priority levels, if you want to call it, in terms of the first districts that, that the state would need to look at would be contiguous districts, uh, you know, but the, you know, one, of the, one of the challenges with that is all your contiguous districts already pay recapture in, in, in the same county. Also, you're in two counties, you're not just in, in one county, right? Majority, you're in Williamson County, but you do have some in Travis. Uh, so the, the next priority of districts will be districts that aren't contiguous, but still in the same county, but again, uh, you know, have a revenue level below the recapture level. And so I didn't really want to speculate as to which districts the district would be consolidated with because that would really be up to the agency. The agency would need to pull together a list of all the districts in the county, in Williamson County, Travis County, and then if they can't find school partners, it expands to the region, Region 13. And there's, so there's a whole, horse, a whole host of variables that would come into play uh, in terms of what would be a suitable consolidation partner or partners. Uh, but again, I wish I had, had better news. Um, I, I find it strange to think that a detachment would be preferred, right, because that's typically the, what I'll call the nuclear option, no one wants detachment. Um, but consolidation, um, I think I would venture to guess that that's not something that the district would, would want either. And so I know I went through that fairly quickly, uh, but th th that's what I have for you uh, right now this evening. I don't know if, Pete, if you wanted to add anything or ask any questions, if, if you wanted me to cover something that I missed. I think you got it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, board members, um, you all may have several questions. I was writing a list. I try to ask one or two and then let somebody else because I imagine our covers will, our questions will end up getting covered, but that way everybody gets a chance. Um, I have a question. When people say, why can't you just lower the tax rate so low that there is no recapture? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll separate that into, two, into two, two components. So you have the, the recapture that's on the copper pennies. So you could reduce or not have the Vatri or just reduce your not tax in the copper zone and you don't pay any recapture on that. Then there's the tier one component. Well, there's, again, the tier one component is based on the, what's called the MCR. It's called the maximum compressed tax rate for tier one. That, that's both floor and, a floor and a ceiling. Now, it, a district can choose to tax below that. So right now you're at 80.8046. A district can choose to tax below their MCR, but their basic allotment would get proportionately reduced. So y you, would, you would reduce your local share, but you would at the same time be reducing the size of your bucket because the BA is the, is the founding, uh, the basic allotment is the founding block of, of all, all the revenue, right? So yeah, you can certainly adopt say a 70 cent rate. So, you know, 0.7 divided by 0.8, and then you apply the same ratio, and the agency would then just reduce uh, all your entitlements accordingly. So that really wouldn't get you out of the, the I mean, you, you could run a template and to see if there's, there, there's something that to be had there, but I really don't, don't think that that's an option. I guess that would be teachers and programs, which isn't an option to uh, me, so. Y y yes, that, that's also a very good point, Pete. Um, it, it, the agency, so what, what the statute does on the pennies, is that uh, you wouldn't get your five golden pennies if you weren't levying your full tier one tax rate. And so if you did drop below the tier one tax rate, then the yield on the pennies, which are richer than the tier one yield, right? They're, they're generating a $98 yield versus the base allotment, which is roughly around a $61 yield. Uh, if you did that, you would lose the recapture yield. Well, number one, you'd, you'd lose the, the richness of that yield, and then those pennies would then be subject to recapture as well. I'll remind board members too, we had some discussions focused on finance that Elaine brought to us, and it was interesting, we saw the surrounding districts, because you're like, man, it seems like they could pay their teacher more, they had access to more, they weren't as much rooftops or bedroom communities. We, we have a tremendous amount. We saw that in the information we got in our finance and in the recent audit we did. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it was super helpful. Covered a lot of questions that I had. One has to do with um, if we get some relief because the basic allotment has been fixed since 2019. Um, and there's just going to be a lot of advocacy, and, but you did say that Houston ISD was hoping for the same thing and didn't get any relief. But if we get some relief and if for some miraculous reason we fall out of recapture, passing Prop A just prepares us for the future, right? Or we just don't have to write any checks this time. I mean, is there any benefit from just doing it now, um, aside from the fact that we know that we owe recapture, but if for some reason we get relief and we don't owe it? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer all the questions I heard in there, and then you tell me if I missed, if I left one out. Uh, so uh, normally when the legislature meets, and let, let's say they do increase the basic allotment, that's typically not effective until the following school year. And so because everything runs on a school year by school year basis, uh, you know, even if an increased BA would, would increase the size of your bucket so much that you would just fall out of recapture, uh, you know, you still have the problem of, of the 22-23 school year. And, and like I said, right now, um, and again, I, the agency wouldn't, wouldn't uh, commit because they hadn't done the analysis, but they did acknowledge hypothetically if they did the analysis and they, sh they showed that there was not enough uh, property to be detached, then yes, the statute does say to move to consolidation. So I guess my answer to that is that if, you know, if, if there's nothing that would happen, assuming nothing happens in the legislature to retroactively change the situation for 22-23, then assuming that the agency would move forward with a consolidation, then, you know, I don't know what 20, what the following school year would be because I don't, I can't tell you whether or not Leander ISD would still be in existence. Ouch. Okay. Any other questions? I just, can I have a second one just, and yes. then that's my yeah. last one. Yes. Okay. So going back to the table that you have on. This one? No, sorry. No. The, just above. It's the one that is called, yes, that one. Yes. Yes, that one. So I can see how um, someone who does not have the benefit of listening to this discussion would say, well, that middle column says they don't owe any recapture because that's what TEA says. Right. And they're only going to owe recapture because of the VADA. But um, I just wanted to clarify that what you have there is line seven is really what we would owe in recapture when TEA gets the data even without the VADA or with, with the VADA not being successful? That's that 22 billion. The, that is correct. And actually, if, if one were to assume that the 41 billion was a conservative estimate, uh, you know, and the, that number could actually be higher than 22 million. Did, Dr. Gearing, did you just, have a Just to clarify, um, we would still owe some recapture on tier two because not all of that tier two is new in the VATRE. Some of that exists already. Uh, am I correct? Uh, so right, let me check with your CFO. I believe you have. We have the five gold. You have the five golden so pennies. If, if the Vader were not to pass, then we would only have recapture on tier one. Okay, thank you. Right, but, but again. And, I'm sorry, no. also, we're also assuming we're also this this is assumption is built on uh, 51,443 wada and our, our enrollment is a little bit lower than what we originally started so even that is a uh, non-conservative number <laughs> yes but and but then i think to answer, you had another question um is there a downside to approving a, an election in advance uh, to, to me i can't think of a downside it, it's uh, some districts sometimes even have it a year in advance, and then it's good for any years that you would need it. So in other words, you, if the voters were to decide to pass it this in a few weeks, and then something happens where there is no recapture ode, let's say, um, then there's no recapture ode. That's, that's all that happens. Um, so so the, the passing of that election doesn't trigger any, any extra authority for the district to do anything different. Right, it, the the A selection is separate and apart from the Vator election, so the A selection just says, you know, if the district has to pay money back to the state, then the voters are allowing it. The Vator election is what actually controls 
the number of pennies that, that you're levying. So they're two separate, they're related and they're interrelated and, and they've, you know, the Vader affects the recapture election in terms of the, um, excuse me, it affects the recapture amount, uh, but they're not linked in, in any way, in, in that way. But once the ACE passes, then it's, we don't ever have to do that again. That's correct. Because it, it, it yes. takes care of all recapture in the future. That's right. It, yes, it, it, if, if you wanted to later on do option four, which is what I said, send it to another district, you would need to go to the voters for that. But, but sending money to the state is, is good, good for life. I just want to clarify something you said. Um, there's nowhere in that TA says we are allowed a second try at this. That, that's right. Um, you know, I would hate to, I mean, I can give you my, my, my guess, but what I would say is that regardless of what my guess is, that's not something to, you know, to play, play with chicken with, uh, with the state, right? Uh, another district did that, right? We talked about it and it, it, it didn't, didn't pan out. I guess I'm, I'm struggling to understand why, which I know you can't help us with, but why anyone would be advocating for, for that to fail why a detachment, I, I'm just, I'm, why anyone would, would be advocating that for our school district, I'd feel like that, that is pretty much the end of Leander ISD. And so I'm really struggling with that. So if somebody is advocating for that and laughing and thinking that that's funny and that's something that would be good for our district, I think that's kind of, how is that like advocating for our schools? I'm just curious, have you seen this in other places where you see people advocating for, um, for that type of detachment? So the, the only experience I, I have where I've seen that was with Houston ISD and that there were some members of the community that were advocating against it. I believe that they didn't like recapture. They didn't like that, that they were having to pay a significant portion at that point and they believe that the legislature would, would, would change the formulas and not allow them to fall into recapture. And so there were some members of the community, it's my understanding, that advocated for it strategically, strategically to go into the session and then expecting relief. And again, that, that did not occur uh, that time. Yes. Um, it, it's a strange season. So, um, I think sometimes there's, there's information out there and it's like, wait, where is this? Is this something you just made up to make us nervous or, or where do I find it? So I'm always gonna be like, you know, let's ground this. When I'm looking at 19, you give me a formula that talks about um, the detachment value. Can you tell me, is that um, sure. yeah, the, where we find that formula or? So, so this, this is my way of trying to simplify things and, and trying to um, arrive at, at an amount you know, because that's the big question, well, how much, mm -hmm. right? And so, so um, a detachment will, would be to, to the lowest level, according to what, what the agency has told me. Again, um, you know, if, if, if something happens, you know, again, the district could go back to the agency and say, hey, is there a different wealth level? Is there the tier one level that you would detach to instead? As of right now, my understanding is that, no, the answer is they would detach down to the 49, 28, and so what, what that formula is, is it's just a shorthand version or shorthand formula to get to uh, what the property value that you would have to have in order to not go above 49.28, right? So think of it this way. If you had your funding formulas or, or your funding template and said, hey, I've got 51,443 WADA and my property values were 25.35 uh, billion, then your template should theoretically have a zero recapture because you're right at the, the, the level. Now, it might need to be a dollar below, but, but uh, essentially that, that's the amount. And so once you have that threshold, you know that you can't be above 25 billion. Now, if your student counts come in higher, then you can have a higher property value. But we just heard from your CFO that right now the watt is trending a little lower. So really uh, you could take that 4928, multiply by whatever the, the current projection of watt is, and you'd come out with a threshold, maybe that's 24 and a half billion, I'm not sure what it would be. But then when you get your T2 property value in January, uh, in February, February 1st, you know, if that's, if let's say, let's just say it's 40 billion for easy math, and let's say this ends up being 25 billion for easy math, that's 15 billion 
you know, and so that, that's essentially how you get there. Um, and help me if I'm saying this correctly. When the recapture goes back to the state, I know it goes back into, in theory, education, but it doesn't really expand the FSP, right? That recapture reduces the amount that the state has to put in in GR to cover it. So we don't see education increasing, right? That number is going to stay what it is. Yeah, so, so the answer to that question depends on where you stand on that depends on where you sit, right? So um, it, it, by statute, recapture receipts have to be redistributed into the foundation school program. But like you mentioned, the foundation school program um, is what's called some certain appropriation. And so it's just a method of financing, like lottery, like state GR. And so you're right, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't expand the value of, of how much they're getting. So it's not like, um, you know, the non-recapture districts were getting a certain amount, and now you pass your election, and now that money can increase it. Now, you know, the state would say that, that the recapture is an important method of finance, and without the recapture money, the base allotment would, wouldn't be at the level it's at right now. So that's, that's the counter argument. But from the district perspective, from, I'm not with the state anymore, from the, from the consultant perspective, I, I'd say yes, that, that you're right, that, that the money goes back to the state, and while it doesn't get used for other funds, it, it does get redistributed to the FSP, um, it does have the direct impact of reducing state GR. So if the state budgeted, let's say, $4 billion for recapture and 4.2 ended up coming in, then that would just reduce $200 million that the state needed to put in from GR. It wouldn't change the amount of the entitlements. All right, is that all clear? Okay, um, we're getting ready to move into our next agenda item. Before we hop into that one, because it's gonna require um, discussion and a vote, I just wanna make sure um, that we talk about your slide that, that does it again. We cannot, which, I, I just, I find this statute, which I slide? mean, um, the, the item where we need to vote on, let me see, this the one? consider approval of a purchase attendance credits and delegation of authority to obligate the district. Right. And you said that this just allows basically our district approval. But we have, as a board, have asked our, our, our community to vote. Why wouldn't we wait until they vote before we do this? Why does statute set this up this way? And what, I just want to make sure we're very clear on the messaging and that we're clear as a board of trustees of exactly what we're doing again. Mm -hmm. um, and let's make sure we're all on the same page. Right. So uh, yeah, I, I think this goes to um, the whole point of, w when you're reading these requirements, one of the things you need to do, or a per anyone needs to do, is you need to read the whole statute in context, right? So the whole of chapter 49, not just you know one, one subparagraph, one subsection, and understand all of chapter 48, and then understand the intent behind it. So the intent behind, the, the intent behind all of these uh, you know, uh, thresholds, what, what I'll call them, uh, you know, deadlines, you know, step by step saying, hey, you can't adopt your tax rate until you tell us you're gonna comply with recapture. Hey, you can't, you know, do this until you sign the contract. So the state wants to know that everyone, every district is complying. Um, if a district misses one or two deadlines along the way, they have an early, not a warning, but you know, you're on the TA's radar, hey, we need to start with some proceedings, uh, you know, for detachment. Because even if a district has already had a, a successful election in the past, if they don't submit the contract on time, if they don't submit the intent letter on time, they, they actually can't adopt their tax rate legally. You know, they could theoretically do it, you know, uh, without that. And, you know, but if they don't submit the contract, then the agency will start detachment proceedings for those districts. So the detachment isn't just for the new district entering recapture. It's, like I said, it's not a carrot, it's a stick meant to make sure that every district complies with recapture because no one wants to, to lose the property permanently. So, so that's that's the main reason, is is I, in my opinion, is just to keep keep everything moving and and so that there's no surprises. And if the community comes back and says they've decided for some reason against, this doesn't tell the community otherwise. We are not um, usurping what the community is going to vote on. Correct. Mm -hmm. This is just a step before. Right. Exactly. So what would happen is so normally you would submit the election results. So TEA requires the election results, 
right? And so typically it would be a, a successful election, but if it's not, then they would just file that and the agreement that your district submits would really have no, no effect, essentially, and then they would just move to their, their parcel analysis and then in your case, um, if everything I've seen is correct, which I, I believe it is, would then move to quickly to, okay, well, there's no detachment, um, you know, there's consolidation. So, it, you know, they would follow a sequence of, of orders and, and subsequent orders. And I couldn't tell you the timing of that. I mean, I can't tell you whether they would send you an order on, on November 8th or it would be a week later or if it would be December. I, I just don't know that. But, uh, you know, and plus I don't want to give them a blueprint on how to do things. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, but again, we did that it, for Houston ISD. We did it November 8th. So it would not surprise me if they were ready to go with some sort of notice in early November. And, and just to clarify, um, a commissioner ordered detachment of territory is not a detachment of physical property in the district at all. It's a detachment of the value of that property from our tax roll. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, yeah. So, so you can think of, um, so in Houston's case, it was the Galleria was the big, you know, it was several different parcels. And I think, it, I think it's still actually on the TA website, which addresses and parcels and so it, you know there's real property and then business property and there's inventory and there's things like that and so those those physical locations aren't moved but now if that had happened the galleria would have just now been taxed for all the nisd and pay taxes to, to all the nisd and so it, i hope that does that answer the question yes so we're still responsible for it still sits inside our boundaries yes. it's just the value has gone off our, our tax roll which right. means that we don't generate revenue from that Th that's value. correct. Yeah. So e even if, if let's say detachment was still an option for Leander, and the and detachment was going to happen, yes, the the values the property would still be here within the district, and they would just pay their taxes somewhere else. And then again, importantly, you would lose the revenue on the INS side, and and you'd ha either have to restructure your debt or increase your ta your INS rate. But just to clarify, you said that we don't actually have enough value in the categories that they can by statute detach, and so that will preclude them from even exercising that option. Th that's, They'd have to go to correct. the next option, which is a forced consolidation. Yes, according to my analysis, that's correct, yes. So, um, Pete, welcome. <laughs> Boy, you, you picked an interesting time to be the first to introduce yourself to us. Um, do you have any comments and anything about, because, you know, we also have a, a Prop B, and I think there's some, I, just to be clear, right, when we talk about that Prop B, um, there's some discussion of there's a link, but they're not connected, um, and, and how that finance piece kind of works together. So do you have anything that you want to help kind of level set for we get ready to go on the next agenda item. I mean, I'll just, just reiterate, like you mentioned, uh, you know, A and B are, are two separate things. Uh, a is really, if it passes, uh, then it'll all allow Le uh, Leander ISD, uh, you know, to continue based on the analysis provided by Mr. Lopez, unless something else happens with the legislature. Proposition B, you know, in and of itself, if assuming A passes, then what uh, B, allows the district two things. One is it allows the local community to vote uh, to, for enrichment pennies, for enrichment opportunities for, for Leander ISD. It happens to be, this happens during the same time, we become eligible for our first recapture payment of significant size that we can't offset against the state. So if you were to look at this completely separate and just take recapture, and we're gonna just set it over there at that table right now, and just assuming we're not even subject to recapture, we're just talking about having you know, a, a Vader election. We would get those additional, you know, we would get the additional, uh, you know, th uh, sorry, uh, three gold and then the, the, the six copper pennies and the funds that they would provide. Now, the next, those three pennies, you know, $99 and, and uh, 56 cents or 98.56, sorry, uh, per penny per water, not subject to recapture. And then you have the six uh, copper pennies at 49.28 and, and subject to recapture. So we would pay, according to the analysis on that, on the, we had up there, uh, you'd pay nine million. You know, you'd get if we if we get about four million per penny, forty billion. Uh, we get about four four million per penny. 
So we would go, just forget the gold, the six copper, that's about uh, 60 million, and we would have give nine of that back in recapture payments, so a net of 50 million. Uh, then you have the three gold, which are worth, you know, almost $100 per penny per water, um, and the amount of money you get from that. So if we didn't have recapture, it wasn't even on the table, we would be looking, going to our taxpayer and saying, hey, if you increase, you en en enrich, you increase the, our m and rate, you vote for it, the state's going to say, okay, Leander ISD community, you, by your vote, are willing to go up to this level, and as such, we are willing to match you at the gold penny level and then give you these additional uh, monies at the copper penny. Sub some of those will be subject to recapture. But the amount of monies that we would be able to get is for, our, is, is for maximizing the state system. It's what the state legislature has put in place. I don't want to say force, but it has very much put that carrot out in front of you that this is what you have to do to, to, uh, to, to compete with districts around you that have done it or to provide the services or to remain a leader in, in, your, in your community or in the, with the districts around you. Uh, over 600, approximately 600 districts, over half of the school districts in the state of Texas have held a successful, either a TRE or a, or a Vader election. They were TRE up until 2019. And then they, uh, with House Bill 3, the, the terminology changed. Um, so Leander, we are not the first school district by any stretch of the imagination to, to go to our taxpayers and ask for a, a additional uh, pennies and additional uh, state funding. So we are on the second half, you know, already half of them have already done it. Uh, it. It's just a matter of time, the way the school funding system is set up. And if you really go back, I'm gonna go on a limb here, but if you go back 20 years, we're kind of getting back to the magical dollar fifty back that we had in 05 when this school funding was deemed unconstitutional and they changed it and the only reason they changed it, they put everybody at a dollar instead of a dollar fifty, but they said now it's up to local communities can go up a little, they can change their rates a little bit, give you the discretion and the flexibility so now the system is deemed legal. And that's this very similar system we are and now our community is, is and the school boards are, are, for, are, for, are, are not forced, but they're faced with do we have an election and do we increase the funding and do we maximize the state funding in this process. Uh, so then you add on to that, we'd be facing payback recapture. So some of those monies that we are getting both from local and state would, uh, we would still pay some recapture, but we're able to keep a lot of those monies locally instead of giving them back to the state because we are able to increase our rate, the, the three gold and the, and the six copper. So I hope that was, I needed slides for that because that was, uh, but it just puts us in a situation uh, and it's a tough situation because we're asking our community at this time, high inflation, uh, everything costs more. Uh, teacher shortage, staff shortage, not even just teachers, everybody's shortage. Uh, so in all the, in, in this environment, and then, and then we hit recapture because the values put us in that level. And then we have a, and then we have to go out and ask, or we don't have to, but we've chosen to go ask our community to say, hey, this is, the way that the, the, game, the rules of the game are, but in order to do this, we can not only, you know, we maximize, we get funds locally, but we also maximize the state funding formulas and, and the state funding system. And as such, with those monies, we will be able to be competitive, not have to, you know, reduce staff to an extent that we've been talked about and reduce and find cost saving opportunities. We'll still find some, but we won't have to be as much. All right, are we ready to move to the next agenda item? Is that okay? Do y'all have anything else before I move to that one? You good? No, we're good. Okay, so we're moving now to 8C4, consider approval of purchase of attendance credits and de delegation of authority to obligate the district. I know we've talked about it, but let's just make sure we go through it one more <coughs> quick time. Just give me an overview when we recommend this motion because it says we're delegating contractual authority. Just make sure we understand what we're doing when we make this motion. Okay, when you make this motion tonight, uh, Madam President, uh, assuming the board approves and votes, uh, you are deeming or giving a, a authority to, the, to Dr. Gearing, our superintendent, to enter into a contractual or submit the agreement to TEA via the online TEAL account system 
where it will sit, and then if the election passes, uh, or Prop A passes, then it, we don't really, it, it just sits there. If, if, it, if it doesn't pass, then the, did I say that backwards? It, it's okay, yeah. yeah. It doesn't affect it, and then it, uh, and we are meeting the statutory requirement uh, by doing it within the 45 days prior to the election date, which is what we are in. Uh, and then if the doesn't pass, or if the Prop A doesn't pass, then we have the position already in place, submitted to TEA, and that really, that allows TEA, like in, in the example Mr. Lopez says, that we could, they could send that email or that letter the, that night or the very next morning, and that, since that's already on file, they are able to do so. All right, board members, if there are no other questions, then I need a motion. Madam President, I move that for the 2022-2023 school year, the Leander ISD Board of Trustee delegate, Trustees delegates contractual authority to obligate the school district under Texas Education Code, section 11.1511C4, to the superintendent solely for the purpose of obligating the district under TEC section 48.257 and TEC chapter 49 subchapters A and D and the rules adopted by the Commissioner of Education as authorized under TEC 49.006. This included approval of the agreement for the purchase of attendance credits. I second. I have a motion from here. Aaron, second from Anna. Are there any other questions? All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven eyes, no nays, motion carries. How is that for dropping you in the deep end of the pool for your first presentation? I'm now officially can swim and I'm excited. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll, we'll have you come back later for something a little lighter. All right. so. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo, for coming and presenting. We appreciate the information. Um, it was a little frightening, but thank you. Welcome. Good information to know. All right, we will go ahead and I think I'm seeing break, break. Uh, so it is 8.16, we'll take a 10 minutes, 8.17, we'll take a 10 minute break and be back.
All right, it is 827. And we are back in open session. We have um, another guest speaker that we're going to move up, board members, if there's no objection. It's under our governance item, 8B2, legislative update. And we'll go ahead and turn it over to Colby Nichols with Ensera Strategies to give us an update. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, as always. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to go over. Uh, number one, you had your first uh, what would we say biannual, I think would be our goal, right? Uh, first uh, biannual um, legislative summit. Uh, I thought it went really, really well. You had uh, the vast majority of your um, legislators were there. Um, had a few that couldn't make it, but we, uh, we've communicated with all those offices. Um, just as far as attendees, kind of want to throw out who, who was there uh, here in the district. Uh, we had Representative Terry Wilson, we had Representative John Busey, uh, Representative Vicki Goodwin, and then we also had several uh, education-related organizations here as well. Uh, Texas Association of School Administrators, uh, Fast Growth School Coalition was represented, Texas Association of School Boards, and then of course T-Case on the special education aspect. So um, a lot of good discussion. Um, I, I think if we when we do this again, um, a couple of, uh, of additional parties that I would like to see added, um, you know, probably representatives of, of the chambers that you have here in the community. Uh, I would also say, you know, possibly representatives from higher education, just sort of completing uh, that alignment. Um, and so that's, that's something to take back. I also want to add that Leander ISD's uh, PTA uh, was in attendance as well, and they did a great job um, from the parent perspective. Uh, we covered, obviously, the ledge priorities that y'all set out. Um, I, I think it was, it was good to hear uh, from the representative's perspective some of the issues that y'all have been having. We've talked about 4545, we've talked about reading academies, and also the application of, of how that impacts our workforce as well and our, our morale. Um, I, I will say, from my vantage point, it, I think that the representatives have heard that from other districts as well. Um, and they certainly, um, you know, were discussing some possible changes to those, those items. Um, the other thing we talked about were unfunded mandates, sort of the certification, yeah, the certification uh, aspects of, of teachers um, and sort of the, I guess, the requirements that we place on our, on our teachers and, and what does that look like and how can we uh, take some of those requirements away to free them up to do what they do best. Um, we had discussions about enrollment funding versus a, uh, attendance funding, and pretty much every legislator recognized the issue of whether the child is coming to school or not, you have to fund as if they are going to, right? You have to prepare your budget as if they are going to. Uh, we talked about the basic allotment, and I will say that since our meeting, there's been a lot of discussion about the basic allotment and indexing and inflationary measures and how do we take that into account. And uh, one of the questions that we got was on what does that look like in terms of money? Um, and I will say that sort of the general rule since that meeting we found out was uh, approximately every $100 that you increase the basic allotment, which it's at 6160 right now, is about $700 million for the state. Um, so obviously that's a, that's a big chunk as you continue to increase that, but I will say there, there is a lot of uh, favorability. I'm sorry, um, would you repeat that number? I went to go ask you and then I accidentally turned off your mic. But... Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, I know it was a big number, Trish, but gosh. Um, every $100 that you increase the basic allotment is approximately $700 million for the state of Texas. Um, and so obviously with an inflationary measure, you have to take that into account. Uh, I do want to sort of get the thoughts of, of the three board members that were present. Uh, and by the way, y'all did a great job. I, I thought it was very beneficial. Um, and again, a lot of good questions from the representatives about ongoing things that are happening within the district um, and how they can make an impact. And then also uh, Dr. Gearing, um, get your thoughts as well as what you thought the, the summit was was like. 
I enjoyed the summit. I, it was great to be in the room with a bunch of our local elected officials and um, shocking. Uh, my, I really enjoyed the questions and the, um, the need to get more information in regards to special education. Um, we heard from our representatives a lot of the calls they get, complaints, concerns, are in regards to special education. And I know that Representative Wilson, ha I met, saw him at the chamber um, meet and greet, I can't remember what that was. And he's like, you're the special education lady. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna talk more about it. What are you looking for? And I, and I was like, it's just that special education allotment. It hasn't been updated in 30 years. And we have an increase of students being identified for special education. And so I really enjoyed hearing our representatives recognize this committee's report and work that they did about two years ago. And um, I, I, I did, I just, it seems to, since 2017, it just seems um, our state legislator, uh, legislative sessions hasn't really put an emphasis on special education after the cap was exposed. So it was really nice to hear our local elected officials and plus also our uh, community, uh, the school associations also understand the constraints that districts are under, but also they understand that parents are getting frustrated and what we need to do to help advocate. So I was really, really excited and impressed as well just to hear the um, support to see what we can do to expand that allotment. And, and following up on that point, we actually had Kristen McGuire who was representing TCase that day. Um, and Kristen is fantastic, a wealth of knowledge on special ed. Kristen is now at TEA. So in a way, we had TA and TKs there, right? Uh, uh, but that's, that's gonna be very helpful to us in the future. Yeah, I thought it was really great to have everyone in attendance and talk through, we talked through SPED, we talked through um, our legislative priorities, we talked about workforce issues, we talked about a lot of things. But we also were able to, and CTEs, and the robust programs we do have, and the numbers of certificates that we are giving out, and I followed up um, with Terry Wilson and gave him those that presentation, but also it was inter good to talk about cost of living adjustments and that they don't realize that Austin is not in that metrics and that metrics has not been looked at since 1999. And so I think that was really good um, insight for them to know we're facing a challenge of rising inflation costs and uh, not being able to compete with the metroplexes that get that bump in their funding formulas. So I was grateful to have that opportunity in that setting, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I enjoyed the dialogue. It was just great to be able to have the discussion. What I, I'm so appreciative of is the board's hard work that y'all have done on our legislative priorities and really um, thankful for the legislative committee as well, being ready to do extra meetings because there were some extra meetings to prepare and get ready for this. Uh, but I'll point out to the board that the items that we adopted, our priorities that we adopted, it, adopted are um, the tear sheet is actually on this agenda item if you want to look at it. And you'll see two parts. One is the targeted priorities, and these are the things that Leander ISD that we identified as a board are really ones we're going to carry this initiative. Uh, we'll be more at the forefront of it, um, kind of developing, leading some of this dialogue. The collaborative opportunities are ones that we, and we even had that with some of our partners here of going, we know you are working on this. We want to come alongside you. What data can we do? How can we work together? Again, it's about leveraging our voices to get our students what they need in the district. Um, so having that dialogue and that opportunity um, was reflective of all the hard work that the board had already done ahead of time to have us ready to have that discussion. And um, you'll notice too the the items that we did at the the for the TASB submission for those extra priorities, those were adopted. And so you just see these conversations keep building, we're scaffolding and looking forward to an 88 legislative session where we can advocate for our students. I was so thankful for the summit. I think there were great lessons learned. I appreciate the committee being so willing to just try it, um, but um, you know, I think we want to continue to see. You know, how can we once we take this and we do things? How do we keep getting board, our whole board, kind of engaged? What does getting a board engaged during the legislative session look like? And so, um, Colby, you've got your work cut out for you, but hopefully, <laughs> we've laid some good groundwork. And, I, and I'll add, uh, going back to the collaborative opportunities, just one example of what came out of this meeting. So. Uh, Representative Wilson brought up the unfunded mandates discussion and about, you know, he's, 
he hears that all the time and, and he knows it's there, but you know, he's never seen like an actual list. And so because we had TASA and TASB there, uh, they were able to say, well, we actually put out a report every two years about all the unfunded mandates um, and, and here's where they are in the code and all that. So he actually has that report now because of our meeting, so. Trish, yeah. sorry, real quick. Um, going back to like collaboration and getting our board involved, um, I think a good opportunity would be PTA Rally Day coming up in February. I know in the past board members have attended and it was a really nice event because our students were there, our lawmakers were there and board members were present. And it's just another way for us, I think we could get involved and just help advocate as a capital. Yeah, from, from the superintendent perspective, um, I'm a member of a lot of those associations. We also had the Fast Growth School Coalition with us at the summit. And um, we talk a lot in, in those sessions about making sure that we connect with our local legislators. Um, and this is the most effective way that I've seen that done um, because when, when you visit one-on-one -on -one with them, they don't, they don't always bounce off of each other. And so to have all those associations at the local level um, and, and be talking about our specific issues, I think is very powerful um, with those legislators. And so uh, thank you, you know, for bringing it up, uh, President Bodie, and then for Colby for putting it all together. I think, I think it's an extremely powerful opportunity. I love this idea of bringing the chambers and higher ed to the table with us next time. I think that that, that was an oversight and, and that would complete that. So I think that's really important that we do that. Um, and, and that we continue, like Anna said, to, to follow up in this process as we go through preparing for the session, you know, when it starts in January and then how that works through because, you know, the, as a local entity, we can make a, a large impact if we continue to have our voice heard and, and that becomes really, really important. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate how strongly the board is advocating um, that is part of the framework for school board development in the state and, and you've paid attention to that and so thank you for that that strong work on, on advocacy through things like this summit so no I, I thought it was great I, I did want to add one thing to that that uh, basic allotment um, discussion uh, that's especially applicable here uh, every dollar that they add to the basic allotment uh, assists in the recapture issue. Um, it actually reduces the amount of recapture. Um, and so obviously, and, and it's the most equitable outlet that we have uh, for school funding. So uh, again, having all the legislators there and having all the groups, you know, basically support uh, almost everything on our agenda um, was something that all the groups could find some, some merit in. So. Um, any questions on that before I move to the next topic update? Can I just add too on that basic allotment? Mm -hmm. When we increase it, you mentioned recapture, getting lowered that a bit, but we also get to see increase in funding for our workforce too because of the That's way right. the statute set up. That's right. Absolutely. Um, and you know, one of the things we did talk about uh, that I thought was interesting is that all of the, the reps and the staff that were present, you know, talked about your Prop A. Uh, situation and you know are, are sort of I, I think the word that was used was awkward right that the, the whole process itself is awkward I mean you just had um, you know the former uh, TEA CFO Leo um, up here and I don't know how long he was up here but a, a long time and that's part of the problem right is that it, it takes that long to describe a process that, that truly shouldn't be that that complicated um, and I think so all the reps sort of you know, Republican, Democrat, it didn't matter. They all kind of said, look, that's a problem. We need, to, we need to look at this ballot language and see how we can make it more clear for the public for what they're voting on in, in this process. So I thought that was important. Um, sort of a quick update, actually a big update for today. As some of you might have seen this come across the newswire. Um, the, the big three, as we call them, the, the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, and the speaker uh, did a special budget execution item today and are releasing another $400 million, approximately, I think it's 415 actually, $415 million um, for school safety. Um, and this is, the, the things they cite are windows, doors, fencing, um, and other items. I think it's, it's probably gonna be a little more broad than that. Um, and, and it's unclear exactly uh, what that money can be used for, but uh, we'll, we'll find more in the coming days. I also 
uh, think that you will probably see um, at some point some uh, different rules on um, facility standards. Um, we've, we've known that the, the agency has been looking at that in the past and, and with Uvalde, I think that's something you may see. A um, lot of discussion at the Capitol about the school safety allotment. Um, I can tell you um, part of the discussion at our summit, um, we talked about the school safety allotment and what exactly that means uh, for districts. And obviously we all know that $9.72, which is where it's at now per kid, uh, simply didn't didn't put a dent in the in issues that we have, and so uh, I think there's a lot of discussion of you know what does that number need to be? Does it need to be a hundred dollars? Does it need to be a hundred and fifty dollars per kid? Uh, I think you're going to see some legislation on that. Uh, on the teacher workforce issue, um, the public ed committee, uh, House Public Ed Committee, had a hearing. Uh, it was a very very long hearing. There's a lot of great ideas that came out of it. I mean, obviously, you know, compensation, benefits, those are, those are the big ones. Uh, we talked about, you know, getting rid of some of the, the onerous requirements that are in the code on teachers that may take away from their time uh, with students. Uh, the other things that came out, um, obviously, I think the problem is really a, a twofold problem. Um, on a macro level, you've got the pipeline issue itself, right, that's going to take years to fix. It's, it's going to take years. In the meantime, we have issues with, um, TRS and getting, getting some of these great retired teachers back in the classroom. I think one of the things that we saw from the hearing uh, was that there is some willingness both from the agency as well as several of the groups that are involved with TRS to, to sort of find some middle ground and, and hopefully find a way to, to make it easier for us to have access to some of those great educators and bring them back into the fold. Um, that's really all I have is in regards to an update. Uh, as we get more information on that safety piece, I'll, I'll be sure to send it out, but that, that came out today, so. We'll have you back once bill filing started, not that far away. Not far away at all. Sadly. Yeah. <laughs> all right, board members, any questions? Yeah, one question, Colby. Can you talk to anything you're hearing on the street around the topic of vouchers? Yes. Um, Still hearing that it's, it's going to be an issue this session. There's going to be legislation filed. Um, you know, I think with the election cycle where it's at right now, we're not hearing as much. Um, but I think, you know, once the election's over, pre-filing starts, and we get into that sort of session gear, you're going to hear a lot more. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of uh, programs across the country that they could model it after. Um, we could, you know, we could see a, an Arizona type model, um, which I'll remind folks that it started off a lot smaller than what it is now, right? And so I think what you may see is, is maybe a smaller bite of the apple to, to begin with, um, and that sort of be the push, and then move into something a little larger after that. But it's certainly still going to be an issue this session. All right, Colby, thank you so much. Thank you all. All right, that concludes um, our out of order agenda item and agenda item 8B2. We'll be moving back up to the top to our superintendent's report. All right, thank you, Madam President. Uh, we'll start out with this uh, experience that we had uh, last week with the Leander Excellence in Education Foundation Grand Patrol Day. Um, and they awarded 20 teaching grants on this day across 17 campuses and departments for a total of uh, $9,650. And so we just want to give a huge shout out to LEAF um, for the joy that they bring to so many teachers and programs across the district uh, and through their, their very generous giving. So. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about safe and innovative learning environments. We are undergoing, you're going to hear more about this in a little bit, uh, intruded detection audits through the Texas School Safety Center um, as uh, mandated by the Texas Education Agency and coming from the governor's office. And so we'll talk a little bit about what those are. Um, and one of the things you'll hear is that this is helping us and, and, and making us better as a district. And so um, it's helping us to make improvements uh, to make sure that we keep our, our faculty and our students safe. So you heard from Danielson students earlier, um, and this is Danielson's cafeteria, and I just happened to be uh, 
over there for a visit and I was standing in this spot talking to uh, Mr. Kohler and you can't see in this picture, but I will point out that there are four boys um, who have latex gloves on who are wiping tables down and picking up trash and clearing up after this is eighth grade lunch. And so I just asked, you know, what, what are they doing um, and why? Uh, and so Mr. Kohler wouldn't answer my question. He just grabbed one of them and, and made him come over and, and stand and explain to me. And this young man, very polite, um, told me that he had seen that our child nutrition workers were overburdened and working really hard and needed help. And so he took it on himself to get permission to start helping after the end of lunch to wipe down the tables and create a safe and uh, learning environment. And then he got permission to start recruiting some others. Um, and so he went and recruited some of his friends um, and did it all above board. He made sure that they had passes at the end so they could go late to class and, and still be on the up and up. But um, that's the kind of student that we have in Leander ISD that are empowered to help when they see something that needs to be done. I wanted to talk a little bit about impactful family engagement as well. Um, and this, we got an email from Pam um, and I'm just going to read it to you because um, sometimes we forget the impact of decisions that are made right here in this room. And so she said, I'm reaching out today to say thank you to you, your team, the LISD board, and everyone else who was involved in the annexation of our section of the Larkspur division, subdivision. I don't know how I let so much time go by, but I want you all to know how meaningful this annexation is to us and our community and how grateful we are. My boys and I really enjoy our walks together to and from school, and I also get to see the smiles on several other families' faces as they walk their kids to school. So thank you for all of your hard work, and thank you for always having an open door to help us figure out this process along the way. We truly appreciate it. I just happened to be at Plain Elementary School um, to do actually a proposition A, proposition B, factual presentation. And uh, this is in the hallway as you walk in the, in the front door. And so um, I stopped to have a look. And, and every time a parent comes to campus for any reason, um, they get to grab a sticky note and write on it, what is the very best thing about your child? And they get to put it up on this board. And if you have a chance, I'd urge you to go by and just stand there and read what these parents are communicating to the educators in this building about how fabulous their children are. Um, and so just a powerful connection uh, between our parents uh, and, and their kids, because their kids get to see those messages too, um, and the educators who are helping with them. So let's talk a little bit about empowered student learning. Um, and I talked to you a little while ago about the school improvement visit process that we have. And so this is one of the classrooms that we visited. Um, and um, partly I point this out because you can see that kids are seated in, in table groups and they're interacting with each other. And as we go through the school improvement visit process, that's something that's starting to come out very strongly as a theme is that um, we empower students when we encourage student discourse, student to student discourse um, about rigorous academic concepts. And so um, certainly that's one of the things that we're starting to see more and more of. Um, before I came to Leander ISD, I wish I had invested in, in 3M post-it note, like, <laughs> because we use a lot of post-it notes in this district. Um, in the CIV process, we use those notes. You've seen that before. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, this math teacher, this is a third grade math classroom. I say math classroom, it's a third grade classroom. The teacher happens to be teaching math at this time. Um, but she was doing pictographs with them. And so they had sticky notes. And they were putting them up on the dry erase board to, to make personal decisions about uh, what particular kinds of books they like to read. And so um, just a fascinating process. And so um, in the sticky note theme, uh, these are the notes that I wrote after those visits. And I, I just wanted to point out that um, 
as part of these visits, we are identifying at the beginning of the visits what our look-fors are. So what are we looking for in these classrooms as we go through um, and, and what are we seeing? Um, and in this case, we were looking for content, um, both level and vocabulary. We're looking for engagement and ownership of learning on the, for the, from the kids. And, and as I said, you know, how is that evidence through the student discourse that they're having student to student? And so we visited three different classrooms, and what you see is that, you know, in the first classroom, we saw all three of those things clearly evident. In the second classroom, we saw the, the content and the vocabulary and the curriculum in place, um, but, but there was a lack of classroom management that didn't allow them to get to the student engagement and student discourse. And then in the third classroom, we had some questions about, you know, what's the content even there um, in the first place? And so we're asking questions like, what is the one thing that we can do in every subject and every classroom that will improve student learning through challenge, through engagement with the challenge, and through student discourse? Um, and to point out that this process is in place not to identify all the good things that are going on, but to identify where we can make improvements and, and how we can really grow our teachers and the learning that's happening with our students in the classroom. To switch gears entirely, um, as part of, uh, um, we mentioned this state of education and talent this morning, as part of that, we were fortunate to be able to um, give an award to Toyota of Cedar Park. Um, and, and the reason that we uh, acknowledge them as a, a really significant business partner for the district is because of the partnership that we have with them. And so um, this picture was taken from an article that was published in April of 22. Um, uh, and since at that time, there were 24 of the 70 service technicians working at Cedar Park um, Toyota that had come from either um, Round Rock ISD or Leander ISD um, high school auto tech programs. Um, as of today, actually, they mentioned that they have now 30 of our alumni working as service uh, technicians in, in, their, in their department. And so for the past several years, Toyota Cedar Park has partnered with Leander ISD in a variety of ways. They work very closely with Rouse High School in our auto tech program. Um, they donated three car engines and a vehicle to afford a true hands-on experience for our students. They have over now 30 Rouse Automotive students working at their location, and they've donated 10000 a year to the Leander Educational Excellence Foundation, or LEAF, so that LEAF can turn around and, and make those teacher grants available to our teachers. Um, due to this strong partnership, Toyota of North America and Gulf States Toyota visited our high school program to learn more about how their company can continue to connect and contribute to schools across the country. So we're modeling not only that happening in our district, but, but also across the country. The training opportunities and materials provided by Toyota of Cedar Park through this partnership have been integral in helping students earn their industry-based certifications and gaining the base knowledge to find employment with any service department. We truly value the opportunity to appreciate them, and we, that's why we nominated them for the Austin Chamber of Commerce Business Champion Award um, that, that they won today at the Austin Chamber meeting. So a huge shout out to the team at, at, at Cedar Park Toyota. All right, let's talk about our empowered staff for a second. Um, and I want to start by giving a huge shout out to our special education team and the work that they're doing. Um, and, and really because they're not only doing their work, but they're working double and triple overtime to care for our kids. Um, to not only care for our kids in the day, but to make sure then that, that a lot of times after hours, they're having to complete paperwork and take care of their plans and make sure that the legal documents, the IEPs and the requirements that we have for each and every one of our special education students is being met. And while they are doing incredible work, they are exhausted. They um, have been burning the candle at both ends. We are very short staffed in special education. We are short 26 teachers and 57 IAs um, across the district. And that's causing us to have to be extremely creative with how we meet the needs of each and every one of our students. Um, so I want to say to our special education team, Kimberly, and everyone who's in that team, 
a very special thank you and we appreciate your hard work and you do not go unnoticed um, and we're going to continue to do everything in our power to meet those needs and make sure that that you are able to continue the, the outstanding work that you're doing. We have other empowered staff uh, across this district um, doing work from maintenance to other instructional aides who are working with our youngest learners in pre-K three and four and all across elementary schools and high schools. Our custodians are in a very similar position of being short staffed and working many extra shifts and making sure that we have safe learning environments for our students. Our child nutrition department continues to provide outstanding service and make sure that the nutritional needs of our kids are met. And you've heard that we're in transportation appreciation and bus safety week this week and you're gonna about to hear from the team a little more. Um, but these are the folks who provide the first smile in the morning and the last smile in the evening uh, to make sure that our students have what they need. And I'll just end with uh, another couple of exciting events. We had both the Tarvin and the Carol Ann North uh, elementary school dedications in the last little while. Um, and such, such moving events, uh, really, because um, in this picture you can see um, Dave North, who's Carol Ann North's husband, um, and our new principal, um, Mrs. Maginal, and the incredible work that they're doing um, as the North Navigators. And um, so we just want to end on that note and let you know that there are really, truly life-changing and incredible things happening all across this district, um, but it's because of the people and the dedication and commitment that they have to each and every one of our students. So thank you. Board members, any questions? Okay, we'll move on to our next agenda items. An excellent presentation, Dr. Gehring. Um, we'll move now to our discussion and action items, um, or the rest of them. 8A, under student experience, we're going to talk about the discussion of the district and campus improvement plans report. I bet you are glad you don't have school finance to talk about. I was just fixing to say, you don't have to worry about any finance conversations happening right now. Sarah and I are gonna leave that to Pete. Yes. <laughs> move your chair. All right, so good evening, Madam President. Um, tonight we are here to present the uh, district improvement plan and campus improvement plans. And I really talked to you tonight about the alignment, uh, the intentional alignment throughout our system. And so we've got an activity coming up for you, but I'm gonna let Sarah kick us off real quick. All right, over the past couple of years, we have worked incredibly hard to um, create this alignment in our system. Um, and this visual just tries to cap encapsulate that, the, between the, I'm sorry, strategic plan, the community-based accountability system, superintendent evaluation, and district and campus improvement plans. Um, so like Dr. Arterberry said, we do have an activity just to reinforce that. It's just always good to continue to make those connections. So, um, Dr. Gehring. Yeah, thank you. And so part of what uh, we've been thinking about as we, as we talked about board meetings is the fact that we would like to continue to model the kinds of learning that we want to see in our classrooms, um, even up at the board level. So I'm going to ask you, if you didn't mind, to just get up. We're going to go over to that table, and we're going to do a quick activity um, just about alignment. If you guys want to come around this side, then they can see you on that camera, you know. All right, so we've talked a lot about alignment, and so we want to ask you to wrestle with the alignment a little bit, and, and we're going to introduce a couple of new concepts tonight and make sure <laughs> you're not cold anymore. Um, we keep you moving. So, um, and so I'm going to start with these three. 
Um, we have strategic plan and superintendent evaluation and community-based accountability. And the question I'm asking you is, what are the connections that you see between these three? Um, and we're going to start to kind of build uh, a flow chart of how these things connect together and start to arrange them on the table. So I want you to just talk to each other briefly and, and then start to see, like, what are the connections that you see between these three items that we've already started working on? And if you wouldn't mind, we've got this on, but if you want to pass this as you talk so that the, the community can hear you too. So I'll go first, and then if I'm wrong, we can always correct it and clean it up as we move along. Strategic plan, um, we have that in place, but really how we can achieve the strategic plan and explain to our community, are we getting where we want to get? Are we getting the learning done that our community has the hopes and dreams? We need our community-based accountability to help inform that. Um, same thing with our superintendent evaluation, because if our community says this is what learning looks like to us, then we are going to evaluate our superintendent on does the learning look like that. But the strategic plan still gives us the direction and the pieces in, in place. Yep. So I don't see a linear type of connection. I see kind of like overlap. And then for the community to be involved in that uh, community-based accountability system, that's part of the um, impactful family engagement, and then also um, a way to check on the uh, access for all, equitable access for all students, so. Okay, so, um, so, so far I'm hearing we don't want to arrange them in any way on the table. Okay, so I'm going to throw the next one out there. We've talked about the board agenda planning calendar, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, is, are you starting to see Wait. some other connections? <laughs> oh, there it is. I don't know where that goes yet. No, I think, yeah. There go. Wait, these are together. They okay, say more. I feel like that these, these kind of work hand in hand, cause, and this helps. What's this? this though, oh, sorry. Strategic plan and community-based accountability system, I feel, work hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And then I feel like these two items help drive this, but we need these two items, right, to figure out where we're going so then we can plan our board agenda because I feel... Talk about the stuff that's in that. It yes. Makes sense. It makes sense for the board agenda planning to kind of, in order, in order to make sure we're talking about the things that are in the system report, we want to make sure that those things are on the agenda. And, go ahead. I think also as well, it's, it's also the community-based accountability system is a chance for our community to give input, right? Mm -hmm. And give valuable feedback. And I feel like in the past, a lot of the times our board agenda calendar is very just general and basic. And I, what I like about this is parents in the community feel like their voices are being heard. They're having a chance to hear something that they're passionate about or have concerns being brought to the board level and we get to have a discussion on it. But I feel like the strategic plan community-based calendar system, excuse me, drives the board agenda plan and calendar. I'm struggling with these. I, I, my brain wants to see them a little bit like this. I see this as this is our community-based accountability system. These are the items that our community has told us. This is this is the where this is the target, and I feel like this is the map of how we're going to get to that target. So I feel like this is there and this is here. And once we have determined this, this is the route that we're taking to this target then we can flesh out these pieces of what's the order, when do we need to do those things, and then, yeah, I feel like this is at the point where we're looking at these at this accountability system and reflecting on the superintendent evaluation as to whether or not we met, you know, how, how we address the items in the community-based accountability system. But I really feel that the community-based accountability system comes first because it is, that's the goal, that's the destination, and the strategic plan is the map of how we're going to get to that destination. Yes, yeah, so in the CBAS meeting we had the other night, they talked about a map and a compass. And so you, you need the compass to be directed 
to be able to find your way on the map. And so they kind of tied together. It was really interesting. Okay, yes, so I'm going to lay these two now because tonight we're going to address district improve, improvement plan and campus improvement plan. So now how do these play in? And we might have to go the other way now and come down here. Those go under these go in? Yep. There you go. See that? This is derivative yeah. of this. Yep, there you go. I can't, I want to put this sideways. That's right. Because it's like, I don't like this one. <laughs> it's there though. I know it is. I mean, personally, I just think that all of these need to be on the agenda. Um, the question is just how often and which ones when, but the this is a big part all these um, measures whether it's a community-based accountability system strategic plan the improvement plans measuring them they're all sitting on the calendar so i almost want to put that out by itself but it's up to the others anybody else are you putting the board agenda calendar on this in front of all of this are you saying that you want the board agenda planning calendar to drive no. the CBAS and strategic plan? No, it's not. It's not driving them, but they all need to be on there, on the calendar, often. Well, see what I what I when I I'd want to move this down here, the board agenda planning calendar, because again, the district improvement plan and campus improvement plans, I feel like that now with our strategic plan, if you go and look at each individual one, you see a lot of our strategic plan being aligned in our individual campus improvement plans. And so for me, because I like reading all of the campus improvement plans, it gives me as a trustee a way to see where our schools are at through the year and a way to hold them accountable for what their improvement plans are for that year. And so once we do see, say, district improvement plan, one of our goals, when we see that, say, halfway through the year, as a board member, I want to see what improvements we've made or not improvements, and then this is where the board agenda plan and calendar happens. Okay, so he has two more, so I'm not going to put too much work on this because it's going to throw us off. But I feel like the superintendent evaluation and the board agenda planning calendar are both two areas where the board checks in. The campus go. improvement, district improvement, you've got district, you've got admin working on here, you've got community here, community here, you've got your district here. So I feel like the board agenda and superintendent evaluation is really where the board weighs into the process kind of more directly versus oversight. Yep. No, no, slow down. I'm just going to challenge you a little bit here. Um, so, so we've got the community driving the direction of the district, right? Um, and then I think what this is is that the district improvement plan drives campus improvement plans. Is that how you think that should happen? I think it's a two-way street. It's, it's side by side. Because each campus has different needs and different needs for the year. But I do think that they do align with what we have in our strategic plan. Yeah. We need and a bigger table. Honestly, we <laughs> and honestly, the district improvement plan up until now has been driving these. Right. That's how we've built the process up until now. This year, we've started to change that. That's what you're going to hear from these folks. I'm going to introduce two new ones that you haven't seen before, because these are going to show up in, in the next little while. The first one is called formative review. Um, and this is going to be specifically about the work that we're doing. So these are quarterly updates. Quarterly? No. Close? No. Monthly. Monthly. Monthly updates. <laughs> this is why they're here. <laughs> Monthly updates on the progress that we're making on the work that we're doing, right? But it is about process um, and about here's what's happening in our, in our work as we work with campuses based on what's in these documents, right? So all of this is connected. And then we're going to have an additional quarterly update on leading measures. <laughs> and these leading measures are going to be based on the work that we're doing that's connected to all of these things. Here are the results that we're starting to see. And so this is going to be more data driven, um, but not just quantitative data, but also qualitative data. And so, but this is much more data driven. And these ones are going to be tied directly to the superintendent evaluation. And so these quarterly updates are going to be the updates of what you've asked for the administration to be responsible for from the strategic plan in year one specifically. 
to make sure that we stay focused and driving towards what we said we wanted to accomplish by the end. Okay, so I think pretty clear that all of these things are connected to each other and it's very difficult to say which one goes exactly where, that shifts a little bit over time, um, but absolutely aligned and connected to each other. Okay, good. Did I do it? Yes. Okay. You can sit down. All right, so as Dr. Gearing said, we are going to um, highlight for you um, part of the district improvement plans as well as the campus improvement plans. And so um, just wanted to point out, yes, you, you've already indicated that alignment between the district improvement plan and the campus improvement plans. We have the five-year strategic plan so that's the five-year improvement cycle, and the district improvement plan is the one-year improvement cycle of the larger five-year plan. So just our standard process when we are looking at um, improvements, we start with the comprehensive needs assessment, and then we move into a selection of key questions, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Move to strategy development, we definitely get feedback from stakeholders, including DWIC and SiteBase, and then we are implementing the plans and monitoring and adjusting. What is so important about um, improvement plans is that we wanna be responsive to what we are seeing, not only in the data, but what we're hearing from our stakeholders, and so making adjustments throughout the year. So keeping with the vein of alignment, this graphic was created by Brenda Cruz, and I think it does a beautiful job of kind of showing um, our current system and our former system. And so we wanted to use this tonight. And so if you look on the far right, you'll see the old district improvement and campus improvement process. And so these terms probably look very familiar, goals, performance objectives. And so we know as a board, you approve um, the district and campus improvement plans at the goal and performance objectives level. Well, you can see on the very far left there, the strategic plan and the work that Dr. Grissom and Dr. Martinez led us through, those were the terms that were used. And so again, in an effort to align that, using that community-based accountability system, we have used the, the terms in the center there in the gold um, in our district improvement plan and our campus improvement plan. And so as Sarah mentioned just a moment ago, you'll see um, the goal level, you'll see the benefit, the key questions, the system response, and the strategies. And we pointed this out because what we're gonna be asking you as a board to approve is that same goal and performance objective level, but what you'll see this year is that they are called goals and system responses. And so it's the same thing, um, same thing that you're gonna be approving. The terms just look a little different and that was intentional on our part so that there was alignment from the strategic plan and to make sure that we were using that terminology from the community-based accountability system. Okay, so we have a snapshot of just one of our district improvement plan um, strategies here. So as Dr. Arterberry mentioned that we do have the goal, we have key question um, that is identified with that, again, straight from the strategic plan. The system response, and so what is the big work um, to address that, and then you get into the smaller strategy level. Also embedded in here is the evidence that is gonna show success towards um, answering that key question. A couple of things we just wanted to point out, um, just some minor differences beyond what has already been mentioned, is that as you look at the campus improvement plans, you will notice that we actually challenged each of our campuses to narrow their focus. So historically, we have said, write an improvement plan over every goal area, every performance objective, and we know when we focus on everything, it is very hard to make improvements in any one area. So we challenged our campuses, based on your, your comprehensive needs assessment, based on what you're hearing from your community, what are the three areas that are most important? That does not mean that campuses aren't focusing on the other work, but when you think about prioritizing efforts and resources and energy, this is where they decided um, to focus their efforts. Also just wanna point out, you will notice that key question 1.2, which is all related to academic and personal growth of our students, was a requirement for our campuses. 
we know that academic growth for each and every student is imperative. So that was a non-negotiable for every campus to have that embedded in their campus improvement plan. Finally, you will also see this year we, were, um, we embedded the House Bill 3 goals and performance objectives. So for each campus as well as the district, you will see those targeted um, specific plans um, along with specific measures in literacy, math, and CCMR. And so you have all of these um, with for you to review and then we will be back um, in a couple of weeks asking for approval. I really appreciate having the documents together, seeing those HB3, um, because sometimes it just feels like we look at the information in silos. And so now we're talking about, okay, what's our literacy? What's our mathematics? I mean, everyone's talking about reading and math, especially with the NAP and, and STAR uh, accountability talking about, you know, the concerns with math. This addresses literacy, mathematics, as well as our other goals. So it's just all together in a document. Y'all did a great job of laying that out. Board members, any questions? All right, well, there's a lot of material to read, um, and I'm going to give you a heads up. I think I'm going to have questions. Um, I'm thinking board members may have questions. If y'all do, please reach out uh, before we get to our next board meeting. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll move to 8A2, Academic Data Update, House Bill 3, Early Reading Instruments, I Station Indicator of Progress, and Measures of Academic Progress. That must have been your chair, Laura Lynn. I was like sitting very low. <laughs> yes. Uh, so as we get the presentation loaded, um, this, that was a perfect transition for us. Um, it's time to share some of that uh, data. And also based on that, that goal that they, that they shared just a moment ago. So we are bringing you that that beginning of the year data. Um, we're gonna bring you an update on the House Bill 3 goals. Um, we're gonna take a look at early reading inventory uh, information about our students. And of course, that includes um, ICIP data from other grade levels as well we'll be sharing, and um, data from our um, district-wide implementation of the measures of academic progress or, or M MAP. And I'm going to hand it over to, to my people, because I just said the purpose. Awesome. So we are going to start by looking backwards. So we're going to start with the end of year data from last year, which is the data that's required for House Bill 3. So we're going to break this um, report up into three different sections. We're going to start with reading, then we'll move to math, and then we'll move to CCMR. And we'll pause along the way to see if you have questions about each of the different content areas as we move through. So we are going to look at charts that are similar to the um, layout that we have used in the past. So just as a reminder, um, back in 2018, we we used some baseline data to line out what we wanted our goals to be for the 24-25 school year specific to the requirements for House Bill 3. So as we think about third grade reading back in 2018, we looked ahead to where we wanted to be five years down the road. The state of Texas had a goal that all student groups would be at the 60% um, expectation at the meets level. So that's the standard that the state of Texas set. You will see here as you look at this reading chart that our ultimate goal for the 24-25 school year in Leander ISD for reading was the 66%, right? We were already so close to 60 that we set our goal a little bit higher. So as a reminder, this is at the meets level. This is not approaches. This is not the passing level. This is a higher standard. Um, in the 20, uh, 22 school year for approaches, we were actually at 86% last year, right? But we had 64% at the meets level. So this chart right here shows over time the actual on the left and then the goals that we've set for the future years on the right. Of course, the X for 1920 is because there was no star in the 1920 school year. So you're going to see a lot of charts that are laid out similar to this. Any questions about these charts before we move forward? Um, 
question, when we look at that data for 2021, that's also looking at that small population, right? That's exactly that right. So in, during the 2021 school year, we had very low participation um, across um, our entire school district. And so that's why we do feel like we're back on a more normal trajectory here for the 21-22 data. Thank you for bringing that up, Gloria. Um, so for, for this particular chart, we are at 2021-22 uh, 20, 20, for the district for meets for third reading is at 64. Correct. Um, but then you have the goals set lower. So, is that what it? So these were goals that were set back in the 2018-2019 okay. school year. So we're just projecting ahead and showing you the goals that were set. We had to do five years of goals. And so those are the goals that were set way back for 2018-2019. So we're excited to see that we really have already reached the place where we hoped that we would be 23-24. And we didn't even know we were going to have a pandemic, right? And so look at where we are. Um, and I think that it's a real celebration. All right, so this next chart is still specific about reading, but we are looking at um, student groups by race and ethnicity. Um, you see the same type of trend with the data that um, we did take a tick up for each of those groups um, specific to race and ethnicity. And then the next chart is specific to economically disadvantaged students as well as um, specific special programs. So this is the kind of looking back. Bef um, before we leave, though, yeah. um, did, did you want to ask a question? Okay. okay. I just saw his mic on. I okay. want to make sure we. Sorry, Aaron. No worries. All right. So we want to take some time now to look forward. So we want to look at some beginning of year data because STAR gives us an opportunity to reflect backwards. And now we want to look at the beginning of your data, which really is used to support plans for instructional implications, right? And so Alicia is going to talk with us a little bit about the moving forward. So while House Bill 3 sets us up to look at STAR data specifically, what our universal screen of data allows us to do is to take those beginning of the year data points and start looking forward and making instructional plans based on that. So when we go into these reports, you kind of have to shift your thinking a little bit because STAR is a criterion referenced test. There, it's possible to be at the top. There's possible to get every question right and be 100. These, other tests, our universal screeners, are norm referenced. So it's nationally, you have to think of it in terms of a bell curve. So I just want you to kind of have that mentality when we go into these, because it is a little different. For example, we're going to start with this very first chart, which shows us the beginning of year data looking at a second grade cohort. So these are our elementary reading ICIP scores for our current second graders, but it's allowing us to look back when those students were kindergartners, first graders, and then second graders. So we're able to see a little bit of growth over time. The thing to look at here when you're looking at these scores, for example, first grade, 61% does not mean that they had 61% mastery. That means that 61% of Leander ISD students were in the 40th percentile or greater when you think of the bell curve of a norm reference test. And 60th per 60% of our students being in that place is what we would expect to be compared nationally. So on a national level, our students are doing well as they're, ex they're performing as we would expect them to do on the beginning of the year. But this doesn't mean that they've mastered 60% of the skills or that they haven't mastered 40, it just means this is where they line up nationally. The other thing to note too about this particular one is if you look at the 21, 2021 data for kindergarten, there was a drop between those two years. That's been a little while, but that was the pandemic year. And so for our little kindergartners, that was the very first time they had ever taken ISIP and they were doing it at home. So their supports were probably a little different than they would be if they were at school because they're having to learn how to navigate that new test. So that's an important piece to remember as well. So, that's a nice way of putting it, right? <laughs> they might have had a little help at home. <laughs> Um, we can look at this data in lots of different ways, and we can pull this data in lots of different ways. And if you're wanting to have this data in different ways, we absolutely can prepare that for you. What we're looking at today is to just kind of quickly go through a few cohorts. So we're going to look at second grade, third grade, and sixth grade over time so that you can see that. 
So then you look at this chart, and this shows you then our current third graders. So this is the beginning of the year data for those. And you can see kind of that stability across our system as projected as we would hope and wish that our students are performing in a pretty stable place. Those third graders at the beginning of each of those year, uh, years scored where we it would anticipate them to. Aaron, did you have a question? Sorry. I do have a question. Sure. Um, going back to your earlier comments about expecting a 60% performance rate to be essentially at national average, if I understand your, your comment correctly in terms of the, the norm reference test. Um, but of course, Leander ISD isn't an average district in the nation. Is there a way for us to extrapolate what an appropriate expectation would be for performance of Leander students in a norm reference, norm reference test in the US, given where Leander sits relative to its peer districts in the data set? So it's a good question. I think the simple answer is no. And I, although I'm not a testing expert, what the testing experts tell us with our universal screeners is unlike something like STAR, which is criterion referenced, like we own our data. So unless school districts all over or unless our comparative districts were to share their data with us, if we wanted to look at districts like, that, like us, then we would be able to see how their students also perform nationally. But there really isn't a way for us to be able to pull that kind of data to see how, how a school system like ours, which does traditionally perform above what we would expect, how that would line up with other schools like us, not on a norm yep. reference test okay. like this. So in my mind, that means then that this data should really only be used for showing period over period change, uh, but we're not going to be able to use it to show how we're performing against an objective expectation. It is meant to show, yes, you're not going to be able to use it to compare to someone else or compare to a set level, but you can use it to inform instruction and you can use it to determine how students are growing or how a grade level is growing or how instruction in the classroom is affecting a grade level. And that is really the whole purpose of a universal screener. We put this all together in this presentation because in the past we've done it separately and so then it seems a little disjointed. While this isn't directly House Bill 3, which is holding us to a standard of saying what is your goal and where is it going, this is in the data that we use at the beginning of the your snapshot to inform where are our current students and where do we need to take them to help improve then naturally those other standardized scores which are more criterion referenced. And you made a mention about um, kind of national what you're expecting for the beginning of year and I get it like a beginning of year doesn't mean our students have had that instruction necessarily at Leander ISD. Beginning of year could be students coming in from the area, summer melt. So beginning of year is kind of an interesting start. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about you know how can we perform at higher levels that we expect. I think I, I'm expecting to see this increase as we go through middle and end of year. Correct. But at the beginning of year, you did make a comment that this is kind of what you were thinking nationally. Um, so you made the comment, we can't do peer to peer, but I guess you have then some type of overall thought of where these numbers should lie nationally. Is that what you're saying when you say that it's national? I think the easiest thing to say is if a student performs at the 50th percentile nationally, that really is saying that 50% of the students who took that test at that time in that grade performed better than that student did, and 50% of the students performed not as well as they did. I hate to say poorly, I hate to use that terminology, but they didn't perform as well. And so that's kind of the difference between that national norming. It's not saying that they got a 50% on the test, it's not saying that they know 50% of the material or they know less than more, but when you're comparing a group of students and you're looking at it that way. Uh, another way to think of it is like when, when a student takes the PSAT, when they go to score the PSAT, that's normed, right, on, on a bell curve. And these, these screeners are, are done in that similar way. So just to clarify, I think when you presented this, and I apologize, we really don't need to spend a ton of time here, but um, because this is performance at the 40th percentile, that would mean that if 60% of your students are performing at the 40th percentile or higher, you're essentially at the median. You're, right? you're where you're supposed if to be. That, if that marker were 20th percentile, you would expect 80% of your students Correct. To, per, to meet that 20th 
percentile standard to be essentially at the median. Correct, yeah. correct. Alicia, would you, let's look at this one again. I just want to provide a clarification that I think might be helpful as well. As we look at the cohort, uh, and if you were going to explain this, Alicia, I apologize, but the reason why it's kind of helpful to look at a cohort is because if, if we had every single student making one year of progress, then that number, that kindergarten number at 67, would be 67% every single year, because that 67% more or less is students performing at grade level. And so what, when, when we see that number grow, that's an increase in the percentage of students in LISD that are performing at grade level. So one of the things that, that makes this third grade um, cohort, or this third grade for 22-23, uh, interesting is that you do see in kindergarten that group of students 67 percent of them were performing at grade level first grade 66 then second grade 71 and now in third grade 72 so you do see the the percentage of students that are performing at grade level increase um, over time which is what we want right well we definitely want students to achieve one year of growth but now we're seeing more students achieve that, that level where they're on grade level, which would indicate they've, they've achieved more than one year's growth. So this is the slide to show you for that, a different cohort, our current third graders. So we've got four years of data for them. And then I'm gonna move to this being our sixth grade cohort. So this now that we've had ISIP in our system, we have a longitudinal data for that entire cohort, which will then now continue up till eighth grade since we have ISIP going on all the way through our eighth grade class. Again, going back to that stability place where all of our students are showing that growth year over year to kind of be at that stable place when they start the next year year as well. And then this next slide, it's a little bit hard to see up there, but you can kind of see that this is really kind of taking that same kind of data and allowing us to look at, the, at four years of data in grade chunks. So then you can see as a kindergarten system, what does that change look like between 2019 and now 2022-23 school year? And you can see that for each one of the grade levels. Again, showing a relative amount of stability all the way across the board um, with a few minor places where it's a little different, but that is relative stability throughout the system. And then our, our, we go to middle school because we have now the last two years, this year and last year, had ISIP in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So we don't have as much data to be able to show trends over time, but you can see just in those first two years of um, giving ISIP at those grade levels last year and this year that we have that same kind of stability going on throughout our system. Um, seventh graders and eighth graders had not had ISIP since fifth grade, whereas our sixth, sixth graders had ISIP the previous year before. So that could be an indication of, of their data here as well. Um, for the middle grade, middle school, you have it at tier one. Is that, what percentile is that one? It's, it's all the same it's thing. All they're 40. all at tier, they're okay. all tier one at 40%, yes. We okay to move on to math? Okay, so we have very similar um, data that we're gonna look at for mathematics, but as you guys were talking about earlier, nationally across the state of Texas and here in Leander ISD, our math trend data does look different than what we've seen um, in reading. And so we wanna talk very honestly about what we're seeing in this data. So our goals, again, were set during the 18-19 school year using that baseline data. And we um, were encouraged by the state of Texas to set a goal of at least 60, and you'll see that we set goals higher um, than 60% for the 24-25 school year. Um, our current um, state here um, with the 21-22 data is that as a district, we are at the 46th percentile um, at the meets level. Again, that's, um, the state wants us to be at 60, and we're currently at 46% at that level. Um, for when you're talking just about passing, um, so at the approaches level, we had 76% of our students at the approaches level. So this is that same data by race and ethnicity. 
um, again, we are um, aware and um, are dissatisfied with what we're seeing in the data here and know that we have lots of work to do as we look at individual student groups. And then um, the next chart as well, specific to economically disadvantaged and students in special programs. Um, again, just other views of the same data, knowing that we need to focus our um, instructional strategies differently for students in the area of mathematics. What type of math interventions do we are we looking at or have in place right now? Yeah, so as a reminder, this is our students who were in third grade right. last year, right? So we're talking about early um, mathematics as we think about these. And so we have um, um, Bridges has um, an intervention program that is available for usage on all of our campuses. I will say honestly that over the last couple of years, the implementation of interventions for our students who are um, struggling in the classroom um, and may need some additional supports hasn't looked as robust as it has previous to the pandemic. Our students who are in special programs um, that have um, specialized instruction geared for them, those students are getting what they need. I would say that it's kind of that um, tier one, tier two, um, problem solving kind of strategies that's been more of a struggle for us. Um, and so I, I would say that the um, intervention is available, but it's been a real focus for us this year with classroom teachers as we're thinking about not only focusing on core instruction, but focusing on those intervention programs. Is there a reason why it's not um, being used? Because in my mind, I'm thinking if we can catch those students before they say go into a 504 or into special education, which is a whole nother ball game. Um, I'm just like, what is the trigger point, I guess, for that campus to understand, hey, this child needs this intervention now before we say this child gets, you know, three, four months behind? Because we know that's incredibly hard for children and a parent to try to figure out how do you get your children caught up? What is, what is that trigger point? Are we, have we figured that out yet? I, I know y'all are working on the tier one, tier two status response intervention, but how is how can we make sure that each campus un understands we have those intervention programs in place? Like, what can we do to help? Yeah, I think that it really has been a focus for us through the beginning of year professional learning that we've been doing with our teachers and with our interventionists on campus, as well as with campus leaders, so that we are meeting the needs of students right whenever we know that they need that support. Um, and I would say that it has been just a huge um, impetus for knowing we need to do things differently. Through the pandemic, you know that um, our focus was on bringing students into the building. We needed to keep them safe. My own daughter last year was quarantined three times, right? So think about 30 days out of the classroom, and that just was the current reality last year. And so we feel like this is a great reboot and that that is a huge focus on what we're doing this year in our classrooms. Uh, and I'll say, Anna, too, since we've added MAP and this is just our second year, we now have more data available to teachers from the beginning that's very easy for them to use so they can look at their class and see who at the beginning of the year scored in um, the 0 to 20 percentile which is red or the 20 to 40 which is orange and so they can instantly see who those students are right after they've taken their map test and so that can then also help inform at least an easy identification for these are students who I might need to focus on who may be struggling it's just one data point and it takes the whole picture to make those determinations but it's at least a place for them to start I, I will say we got our first our parent teacher conference I have two kids in elementary and I do appreciate the feedback of the what we got from the map and it, it gave us an idea of where my third grader was and what we need to do to intervene to get them caught up. So I do appreciate that. It was really well put out. So one thing I want to just touch on the math really quick is that, you know, you're, we've, we've seen reports, we, you know, it's nationwide. This is not a Leander problem. This is not a Texas problem. This is a country problem. And when, it's a world problem really, when the pandemic happened, Parents were like, oh, I can reach you at home. We can do all kinds of things. And parents were like, math, mm, hands off, okay? So lots of different options. I mean, I will tell you the, the Bridges Intervention thing that you discussed is something that I use as an IA at Reagan. Love it, it's a great program. I mean, you give a kid a, a kind of a little screener, you know where they are, it, it, it's got built-in lessons for you. So it is a great program. Things like, you know, playing math games on campus. Um, literacy partners that we have that go and read to kids, why can't they do? math games with kids. There's lots of options. So I think that this is great information for beginning of the year. We all know that it's not great to look at. However, I think that coming off of something that these kids, that the whole world, right, didn't expect to have to go through and having 
parents at home doing that reading, doing that other stuff, yes, the math got behind. That doesn't mean they can't take two dice and roll them and multiply them or add them or whatever, and we can get kids back on track. This is just going to take time. It is, and we're heavily focused on it on our team. I can tell you that. They're out there all the time trying to help with those things, and it's a good segue into talking about that beginning of the year data like we just did with reading with math. And so this is our beginning of the year map data, and we have two years of data in elementary and middle school because we've this is our second year of implementation. So again, I, I caution to make conjecture in the fact that we've only had it for two years, but again, these data points point to kind of that sort of stability. So at the beginning of the year, our overall data shows that our students are relatively stable, and again, they are performing in that average or above average category, which is ICIP's version of tier one. They have different terminologies, but it's the same 40 percentile or higher. So we have, for example, 74% of our, or 75% of our second graders performing at that average or above average category for beginning of the year. And then if we go to the next slide, this is middle school, again, two years worth of data. And then you can see here where our middle school students have performed over the past two years. And then very excited that we have um, now added high school. So this year we have implemented our MAP uh, growth screener in all of our high schools for both for math, ELA, and science. And so now we do have eighth to ninth grade data as well, which I can tell you our teachers are super excited about because those Algebra One teachers were able to pull up and look at data from their eighth graders that we have trained them on because they're giving the same assessment so they understand it in ways that I don't know that they had been able to understand before because it's a seamless transition from those grade levels. And um, you can see that, I can also tell you that we also did grow, if you look at eighth to ninth, which isn't on here, from the 78th percentile to the 80th percentile for, I'm sorry, 77th percentile to the 80th percentile for our math students. Uh, a couple of clarifications. In 11th grade, it's not that we have fewer students meeting that, it's that we don't give MAP in all courses. Our AP courses do not take the MAP screener. So you're taking out a good portion of our, our AP students are not in there. And the reason and there's an NA for um, science in 11th grade is because MAP is very, very data driven and they require a certain number of students nationally to take a test before they will norm it. And not a ton, not enough districts give science in 11th grade for there to be norming data for 11th grade. So that's why that says NA. We can give percentages of Students can see their individual data. Teachers can see how they performed on their test, but there is not a measure to compare it nationally because there isn't a norm as there aren't enough students for that. Any questions about the map data that we see there? All right. All right. I'll just grab that from him. Uh, as a requirement of House Bill 3, um, we are also sharing uh, college career military readiness data that you've seen a number of times. So just the uh, disclaimer there, before I dive into that, um, I do wanna go back to kind of addressing that idea of, of planning and interventions for math. And just mention, um, Dr. Gearing talked a little bit about the school improvement visits that um, we are engaged in with our area superintendents and our campus support teams um, with teaching and learning folks. And one of the really exciting, first of all, they're, they're the best part of my day, every single day. And I think um, most of my, all of my teammates would agree, but one of the things coming out of that is just this really heightened level of collaboration between teaching and learning, the area superintendents, the, and the principal and really coming together and having those conversations and not only looking at the data, but then saying, okay, so you know, with our campuses that are, have students that are struggling the most, what can we do? How can we be bold? How can we develop that plan? Um, training teachers, uh, getting, getting interventions in for, for specific students, and those conversations are, are happening right now, and the development of those plans is happening right now. We just had a meeting talking about that right before we came to the board to, uh, tonight, so look for more developments and more discussions about that. So, with CCMR data, getting back to our House Bill 3 requirements, um, remember that it's lagging data. So we, 
And I, everybody always says, why do you say data? So every time I say it, now I'm thinking about data. Okay, so we have data from the class of 2021. Um, I can't wait to show you data from the class of 2022 but when it becomes um, official because we will see that continued uptick. You can see it when we talk about the um, industry-based certifications and, and CTE. You'll see it with students that are, are meeting TSI as well as we look at 2022 data, as we look at preliminary data um, for, for our seniors this year, the class of 2023. But when we look at this data, remember, again, Jennifer talked about the states um, state goals and that state goal for CCMR data um, up to 2025 is at that 60% level. And you'll recall we're, we're in the 80s and so we've set goals, we, we set goals um, to get up to 90% as we head to the end of that goal setting cycle. Um, one thing you'll see is that um, while we were, we were upticking from 18 to 19, and you'll see that in almost every area, um, we flattened out a little bit, but our people worked super hard over the last couple of years to maintain our students' readiness for post-secondary. So this data is broken out by different student groups, and um, again, you can see um, in almost every area that there, we were, you know, we were putting strategies into place um, from 2018 and 2019, and you know, hate to beat the dead horse, but then we had a couple, you know, a couple challenge years um, in there. And when you look at still that 2021 data, not even last year's seniors 2022, because we don't have that that data um, officially re available to us, but the class of 2021. Um, we were leveled off at that 2018 level pretty much again, and you'll see the uptick as we continue. Um, looking at our, our, our students um, involved with receiving special education services, um, that is definitely a celebration, as is our, our students, our, our emergent bilinguals, or as they're labeled on this, our, our English learners. Um, the, our teachers and, and our programs, our teaching and learning folks have really um, worked super hard. And you can see that um, even back in 2021, as we're still facing challenges, our students um, were continuing to, to get that college and career military readiness. And so I just thank those people. I'm sure they're all watching right now. And um, I hope they're getting their, their sleep for tomorrow, actually. Again, you've seen this many, many times. Um, this is back to that class of 2021, and that 85% we looked on in that first slide of percentage of students college and career military ready. Um, you'll see the breakdown um, based on not only um, that those scores on, um, on college assessments or TSI, but also those industry-based certifications, taking dual credit courses, on-ramps, things like that. Um, you'll see that, that yellow bar, that w there's, there are the additional ways that you can um, achieve and be considered college career military readiness. Um, rose in 2021. Um, other data bites that we've shared with you relative to in industry-based certifications, um, participation in dual credit. You'll see that yellow bar continue to grow, and our, our blue bar will, will be jumping into the 70s. And as we work, you know, Bruce just reported out that we received um, an award today from the Austin Chamber relative to the Central Texas region and the districts in those region and our um, preliminary college career military readiness um, number being um, number one in that region. So look for good things as we report out on 2022 and then 2023. And that is the report. So we're going to talk real quick about next, oh, steps. Yeah, next steps. So our next stops for reading and mathematics are really focused on instructional practices. We know that we need to focus on instructional practices specifically in the area of reading as we think about early reading. 
Our focus this year is on taking the learning that our teachers had in the Reading Academy all year last year and putting it into practice this year. And so we've got lots of efforts happening across our system focused on that um, level of implementation. We know that because House Bill 3 is focused on STAR data, there are also lots of changes coming to the STAR exam next year. And so as we think about the best practices instructionally, we believe that that's gonna make the biggest difference for our students being able to be successful. And then for next steps of mathematics, again, we are going to focus on instructional practices. Just, um, and Matt talked a little bit about the school improvement visit structure. So I wanted to give a little bit of a scenario that we experienced this week specifically for mathematics. So we had a school improvement visit. Uh, campus identified math as an area of focus. We worked with that support team, the coordinators and specialists that are supporting that team. Um, Matt and I went and walked uh, the campus with those math leaders. They are working together on a plan and are implementing professional learning and coaching practices on the campus. So that's the kind of work that's happening as we think about instructional practices practices. When we read through these bullets, sometimes we say, yeah, yeah, that's what we always see. But the work really is down at the campus and the teacher level. So we're very excited about that. Next steps for CCMR are very specific for the needs of individual campuses. Sometimes those needs are based on participation opportunities. So thinking about participation in industry-based certifications. Um, sometimes it's about um, academic support. So making sure that our students can pass AP and IB exams, those kinds of things. And so Camille and her team work very closely with each campus for them to set the goals that they need to set based on the areas where they need to see changes in their data. So those are our next steps. Board members. I just have a question regarding the math. We're just used to, from the minute a kid is born, it's like read to your child every day, read to your child every day. You go to um, summer programs, they're like, here's a reading list. There's just so much about reading. How can we develop something similar to happen at home, just out in the community, invite community members over? Um, they've been helping with reading, but it's just getting that extra push. So there's spreading spreading the joys yeah i was just going to say so like like the literacy partners i think playing games with kids i think math pentathlon i think there's lots of options we have on the table that have been around our community and our district for a long long time and i think that you know some of those programs fell off a little bit because of the pandemic you didn't have parents weren't allowed to go in schools kids couldn't gather things like that i think as as we you know, hopefully, you know, come out of this and we don't see any kind of weird thing happen, knock on wood, um, that, you know, as we, you know, ha have PTAs and, and parents interested in supporting those math programs again, I think as you continue to do that, it doesn't necessarily have to be a club. They don't have to compete. They can just play the games in the classroom. They can use it as an extension. They can use it as an enrichment opportunity. There's lots of games that are spread out all over this district. And so I know that that is a huge potential for critical thinking and lots of math skills without really, not all of it feels like mathy. It does, it's not all, it's not all, you know, um, arithmetic. You know, there's a lot of spatial recognition. There's a lot of things that, that Math Pentathlon and programs like it um, offer to our, our students that are, are great enrichment opportunity and get them interested in math. It's not, it's not always just, um, you know, it's, it's understanding the concepts and, and, and that math touches us every single day. So I think that that's a great opportunity. When you spoke a little bit about from our earliest learners, so I want to reiterate the importance of our early childhood programs. Now that we have students in our buildings beginning at age three, we believe that that's gonna make a difference. I think about the work that happens with our parents as teachers programs. Um, we got to be over there not too long ago and just the types of activities that they're doing, counting every time that you're doing things as you're talking about shapes and puzzle pieces and those kinds of things, all of that will help out with math reasoning. And so I think that the things that you're talking about are right on point. I do feel like we're getting closer to that alignment because there's times where we brought this information to the board and the board's like, okay, well, what are we going to do? And, and it's almost like spitballing. Well, do we need to do this or do we need to do that? It seems like now with our district plans and our, our, our site-based plans, am I right that this data is informing those plans and the improvement? And so what you've got is it's now kind of more aligned where the community is talking on campus what they want to do to make improvements. And then at a district level, we've got discussion with DWIC on what they want to do to make improvements. And so when we look at these results, 
if I go home, because I know I'm going to read the site-based plans too, and our district plans, oh, they're good stuff. But um, I'm assuming I'm going to see more of these steps kind of um, pulled out of it and more robust talking about what we're going to do. Am I right on that alignment that that's the way it's working now? I think you are, and I think that we're going to continue to see even more of a focus as we go through the school improvement visit structures. So I think that the school improvement visits are shining a light on areas where we can really celebrate with our campuses, as well as areas where we can support our campuses. We're really trying to view our campus improvement plans as a living, breathing document this year. And so how do we give our principals and our campus leaders time and permission to go back into those campus improvement plans and massage them after they've um, gathered some additional data? So I think that we'll continue to see a focus there as we have additional data through the year. I think a key part of that is the fact that the support teams in mathematics that are supporting our different campuses when they're at those school improvement visits, they're invited to them. They go to them. I don't go to every single one, but the, the coordinator or the specialist that supports that campus is in there. They're hearing what's happening. They're coming back as a team and developing plans. They're making a relationship with that area superintendent and that principal to focus. If math is the focus, then let's really dig in there and come up with some of these plans. So I think it's a concerted effort putting together the school improvement visits, the campus improvement plans, and, and the people involved to make it all happen. So given that, then the next steps, when we look at these, these are more high level. If you want to drill down, we'll look at our district from site-based. But as I'm looking at the high level, here's something that I'm curious about. I'm sure there's more detail in site-based. But our HB3 goals talk to us about our general population, but then they also bring out and break out um, specific populations by race, ethnicity, and then we have it break out by our eco dis and programs. But I don't see kind of a closing the gaps specifically brought out here. Is that something that you are going to start implementing, or can we start seeing that? Because I think that closing the gap is going to become vital as we keep moving forward. Right, and I really think that that's at the student by student level as well. So we do want to look at groups of students, but we also want to look at growth for each and every student. So as we are digging in for each and every student um, and making plans to meet their needs, we believe that that's also going to shift the data for each and every student group uh, moving forward. So you are exactly right. I also believe, as we think about school improvement visits, different student groups that are um, uh, um, participating on each and every campus as they're enrolled in different campuses. The types of supports that we're providing do vary from campus to campus. It does not look like a cookie cutter as you think about one campus support to another. Um, and so you will see that as well at the campus level support. I know HB3 requires the disaggregation by ethnicity. Um, I would encourage us to be forward thinking and look at disaggregation by gender as well. Um, I'm increasingly concerned about how our young men may be falling behind and would be interested to see that data and see what we can learn about that population as well. I also think about closing the gaps. It's a lot of what we've been doing the work with our um, 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 inclusion. I want to say DEI because that's just, but it's, it is kind of that work, right, of diversity and equity and inclusion. I see that as kind of a focus part of closing the gap. That's what we're supposed to be aiming at. Um, do we see that overlay in us being able to utilize some of those resources that our DEI office is doing as well to help us close the gap? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Actually, on Tuesday with our instructional leaders, we're going to be focusing in on equity and access data, and a lot of that is around participation. And so which of our students are participating in advanced math programs? Which of our students are participating in um, after-school activities, right? And so we believe that that data layered on top of the academic achievement data is fascinating. We're going to be looking by feeder patterns so that the Cedar Park feeder pattern, for example, can say, let's try this strategy, elementary, middle, and high school, and see if it makes a difference moving through the system. So we're excited about that. I would also just say Mr. Street has been accompanying us on school improvement visits as well. Uh, we just went on one at one of our high schools a couple days ago. And um, having his perspective has been indispensable and invaluable um, in addressing and what he calls working towards parity. 
I, I do have a request as the CCMR and the accountability update comes up at the end of the month. I know CCMR, there's been a lot of discussion. I've been in several meetings where they're talking about those might change um, substantially. Um, and, and then how does that impact your district or the programs you're rolling out to the students? When you get some initial analysis, if you could include that in a Friday memo to the board um, as we're thinking you know, of other things like legislative initiatives, this might end up being something that impacts those discussions. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to, I think, sharing that because I, we're very well positioned with some of the um, changes we've made to student opportunities and options going down to middle school with CTE and things like that um, to be able to uh, still see really strong strong data when we look at students who may have to um, you know complete that that program of study and things that some of those things they're considering for the changes yeah I have some concern with the changes that have been proposed so far to the CCMR accountability piece especially because of uh, industry-based certifications and what they're trying to do there that's one of the questions that we will be addressing at Commissioner's cabinet next week um, it's on our list already it's been submitted so that's good news. We'll like an update on that too then. Hopefully those are good conversations. Board members, anything else? Okay, we will move on to our next agenda item, the 2023-2024 academic calendar discussions. All right, Madam President, members of the board of trustees, I'm here again. And I think this is a preliminary, well, I know that this is a preliminary conversation about academic calendar development. So this um, I know we have a lot of more agenda items, so we'll, we'll talk through this, but it's just a preliminary conversation about um, looking at our process that we use to develop this year's calendar and then discussing, op discussing options for um, moving forward uh, to be able to present to you a calendar draft for your consideration for the 23-24 school year. So we'll start out, um, if you recall, uh, in the development for this current year's calendar, um, this, is a, this is a timeline and just a description of the different stakeholder meetings and, and surveys and, and listening sessions that occurred, times we brought to the Board of Trustees for feedback in development of this year's calendar. Um, final kind of culmination of that was the survey taken by over 5,200 people, um, including 4,300 community members. And um, you'll see these things in a minute. They're, they're currently in our calendar, but these were the things that were emphasized um, by the respondents. Remember, we were starting, they said we were starting school a little bit too early in, the, in August, and they'd like to see us start a week later. Um, they'd still like to have that short first week in August, you know, starting on that Wednesday or Thursday um, as we get back into the swing of things. The over, overwhelming feedback that our current holiday schedules and the way they were formatted um, what was something that people felt positive about, wanted to keep. Um, there was discussion about alignment to other uh, central Texas districts. Um, looking at an additional break, keeping early release at the end of each, sem uh, basically each semester, and then um, adding full days for staff development and for teacher planning, teacher work days and collaboration. Remember that was um, one of our, our biggest points of discussion as we um, had, had moved, we made a decision to move away from the two years of early release Wednesdays. And then, all of that and still end the school year by Memorial Day, which um, was kind of, a, kind of a challenge. So this is the current year calendar that was approved on January 27th of this year. And just pointing out some of the, some of the areas that came out of the survey. First, just a note, uh, the calendar does exceed the state requirement for minutes of, of instruction and operation. Uh, we were able to move that first day of school, um, one actually six days later, and um, we were able to keep that short first week. We were able to end uh, by Friday um, before Memorial Day weekend. As far as that staff development and teacher planning, uh, one of the I think one of the most important and significant things that our 
our campuses were able to do, and I want to just report, because you had questions about it originally, was that 100% of our campuses did um, provide and allocate those two dedicated teacher work days uh, before school started, and that's not training, that was not professional development, that was teacher work days for them to prepare for the school year. Uh, we did build in September 26th because we heard from our campuses and teachers that um, parent-teacher conferences at the elementary level, that they wanted that built in and a full day. We've done some little half days and early releases and that was really just kind of um, nipping at the edges of the need. And but also, so we picked that September 26th day because it also uh, landed at the end of a grading period for the secondary levels so they could um, spend that time grading, finishing up their grading, and also making parent contacts as well. Um, Got to include the Continuous Improvement Conference. Uh, of course, 29th Annual Con Continuous Improvement Conference just, just took place. Um, we did keep, as asked, those student early release days before Christmas and before summer break. And then we built in additional full days of staff development and um, cross-district collaboration time. Last question on the survey that we asked um, on, leading into the calendar, final calendar development was, um, would you like us to present um, two years worth of calendar or just do the one year and continue to go through a process um, year by year? And the numbers on, on the actual pie graph are too small for me to see, but overall 67% of those 5,200 people said they either strongly agreed or agreed that they would like us to bring uh, two years worth of calendars to establish that consistency in their lives and they could, they could plan their lives, plan their, their uh, daycare, their you know, camps and, and vacations. So, um, Remember, we did bring a tentative 2023-24 calendar draft um, to the board on January 27, 2022. At that time, we did not seek approval for that calendar because we were um, coming up on the need to renew our, our five-year District of Innovation plan that we had put into place um, in order to have flexibility around that school start date. Uh, so it did come up for renewal this year, and you passed it. I think it was the, you approved our, our plan for that flexibility with the start date at our last board meeting. And so now we are able to uh, move forward with, with planning and uh, seeking approval of a calendar for 23-24. So that's where we are today. Uh, the, the calendar presented in January was basically this year's calendar, but you know, adjusted uh, for next year. Moving forward, because uh, it is that time of the year to work on calendar and get something out, um, we really have, have a couple of options. We could take that draft for 23-24 and go through a streamlined process. We can take it to um, like DWIC. We can get some feedback, make some minor tweaks and bring you a calendar that is either the same or very sim similar to that second year that we presented in January. Uh, the other option is we can go back out and begin that full process um, for gathering feedback from stakeholders and then look at bringing you two years of calendar as requested and looking at it as a 23-24-24-25 um, situation. Uh -huh. So. We are up for either of those and asking for feedback from the board. Okay, board members. I like the full process. I'd like somebody else who full process streamline just kind of let me know what you're interested in. Well, I think in our earlier discussions, my conception of this was it, it would still be an annual process, but in that process, we would finalize one calendar and draft a tentative second year calendar and then a year later, we would finalize that tentative calendar and propose the next draft calendar. Um, I think that gives us, what, it gives us a, a kind of continuous cycle in terms of possibilities to update things as needed, uh, but it also gives our community some visibility into what we expect the calendar will look like unless something significant changes, right? 
Aaron, I'm sorry, I see streamlined and full. You want some type of hybrid. Can you please explain them what that is, what you're? So I was suggesting what I thought we were uh, tracking towards the last time we had this conversation about calendars as it relates to where we stand today. Um, we have a draft calendar for 22-23, or sorry, 23-24. Um, I think we need to finalize that calendar and we need to bring forward a draft for 24-25. So um, uh, I, I don't know, that, I guess it's, uh, like I said, I think we should, we should continue to have an annual process. This isn't, this isn't a two-year adoption cycle. It's an annual adoption cycle. Um, but we will always have two calendars on the books, one adopted and one draft. And so as it relates to 23-24, we already have that draft. We just need to review it and finalize it. So I think it is a streamlined process for that one. 24-25, um, we haven't looked at yet. So that would be a new process. So my memory of this may be a little different, but when I remember when we did it um, back before COVID, I think it was, oh my goodness. We had two calendars we approved, so we knew what one year was gonna be and the next year. And um, then I think something happened. But I thought we had approved both calendars with the factor that they would bring back that second one if amendments were needed or if we needed to make change. But that way we had full discussion. It was all done, everybody all weighed in. And I think it helped kind of move things along. So. That's what I remember the full process being. That's why I would support that. Yours seems to be a different memory of it, but that's fine if that's what you would, you'd like to see. Um, that's what we were here. Let's get opinions. I mean, what do y'all want to do? Based on your explanation, I think our memories are very, very similar. We're just characterizing that second year calendar a little bit differently. You're saying it was completed and I'm saying it was draft. I think that's the only difference. I think we did approve two years before COVID and then COVID happened and we were gun shy of or we weren't wanting to do that because we didn't know how COVID would impact because we put early release Wednesdays in, we did some other things, right, to really get us through the pandemic. So um, I, I don't care if it's a streamlined process or a full process, but I think the two years um, and, and approving that gives that look that benefit of planning ahead for your family and vacation and whatever when you just have one year in draft, it doesn't give you that full advantage. So I'm all on board for a two year. Um, I think I agree with the way Aaron characterized it, which is one year approved and the second year is a draft. Because when you have that second year approved and then you come back and start making changes, it's you're almost leading people to, if you say it's approved, you're leading them to rely on it. Rely on it. But when you say it's a draft, then they know that it could change, as opposed to approved but can change. I kind of feel it's worse because it's a draft and then people make decisions around that draft and then you're like, oh, it was just a draft. I think if you're putting it out there, I'd rather approve it and say these are our options and people can make plans according to that. And I think having it in and draft and just saying, well, sorry, you followed that draft, but it but was it, just a draft that we didn't really expect you to make plans according to. And you are, I was under the same history thought, you know, as, as you are, Alexis, I thought we did approve two years and then COVID happened and we were like, oh, we're doing this early release. Let's, you know. I think there may be an embedded question here too about when is the earliest date that we'd feel comfortable formally approving a calendar for a specific school year, right? Maybe our cycle could be adjusted forward six months or something like that to where, um, you know, by the time we, um, we're adopting the next calendar year early enough that people have plenty of time to plan for that. And that way the draft that we're presenting is kind of like year three almost, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I think some of this starts to come out in the wash if we talk about exactly how that cycle's timed. 
So to piggyback off what Aaron said, I know some DWIC members, when this was our, the calendar presented last year, the feedback I got was, why can't we approve the calendar earlier in the year? Were we mandated because of certain rules or whatever? And so I don't, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to moving it up. Um, I was also the assumptions that once we got through the early release and this year, I thought we were gonna look at adopting two years because I know, again, going back to our DWIC individuals, our member, committee members, I, at least from those who have reached out and I know um, I, I could be making it up, but I remember hearing their concern was again, the two year, the stability, so they knew what to expect. Um, I personally want the full process because I, Again, our community changes year to year. We're not in a COVID year. We've had new individuals come in. And I would like to potentially see if there's a possibility for us to move, instead of us approving in January, is it possible for us to move it up earlier? Christine, you're the only one who's so in. Do you have any? I just, I, I like the idea of, of, of moving it up earlier. I just don't know what that does to admin. Um, yeah, I don't want to freak you out, but I, I think having a, having the draft that you have now, I think at least gives you like framework to work with and, and if we can get that moved up, if it doesn't put an undue pressure on admin. So Matt, you're up. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, first, I was just thinking to myself, um, like way back when the original two year thing was, I think kind of you're all right, because I feel like I remember that there was, in the end, it ended up being a tentative approval for that second year, and then we brought it, then we, I think we simply brought it back and said, hey, remember the tentative approval, do you want to approve it now? And you guys were like, yes, and then like y'all said a few months later, then, um, you know, stuff happened and we changed it up a lot more. Um, I'll, I'll process, I'll probably have to watch the comments and just um, think through it again. I, as I think about the doing it earlier, um, we can do anything. We're, we're kind of barely starting this year and I'm like, if we get much earlier, it starts to sound like adopting two years of calendar, um, but um, which I'm, I'm fine with. Um, we can definitely go through a full process. Um, I'll, I'll watch the video of y what y'all said and try to develop, make sure we're developing a process that honors um, everybody's comments, but I think we'll end up going through a full process is what I, I feel like I'm hearing. Um, although I'm, I'm kind of secretly hoping it doesn't change much since last year we, kind of, we people said they wanted two years. Well, and but I, like I shouldn't say that out loud because then people will feel like I'm trying to steer their comments one way or the other. Whoever's joining in on the stakeholders, you say whatever you want. Okay. I'm just gonna say that up front. Tell us what works for you. Love that attitude. And yes, the full, full process, I do like like survey listening sessions focus group where we're getting student, teacher, and parent input because that's so important when we end up adopting a final calendar. So I think having those voices um, being represented is important as well. So yeah, I'm looking for board members head shake. So okay. All right, thank you, Matt. We're gonna go ahead, um, if the board members don't object, and we're gonna move down into operations and get an update on transportation services, if that's okay. All right. Transportation's like, yes! Yes, yes, let's get them, let's get them up here. You, need, you do not need to stay up with us till midnight. We need to get you up and out. Good evening, Madam President, trustees, Dr. Gearing. Uh, this evening I get the privilege of uh, allowing our transportation directors to have an opportunity to speak about the work that they are currently doing in transportation and the work that they, they know that they need to continue to do to improve. And so uh, I'd like to welcome Myron Wilson, our Director of Transportation, uh, Ken Turner, and Christy DeVille, our Assistant Directors in Transportation. Myron? How was that? 
Madam President, Dr. Gary and board members, we're excited to be here and just share these updates with you. While we have some improvement uh, definitely to make, we're definitely excited about all the things that we have been doing out in transportation, which is why we took the opportunity to invite all of you out to our in-service at the beginning of the school year as we rolled out the red carpet for our team coming back at the beginning of the year. And, and some of you came out and we just had a really great time. But as we're moving on with this, uh, oops, what's this? Where we're going. Moving on with this presentation, we want to take a quick overview of the state of the department and then just talk a little bit about our and share with you our continuous improvement efforts and also our strategic focus areas um, going forth in this uh, school year. We have over, a lot of people do not know really the size of the transportation department, but we have over 300 employees, and that is not only our bus drivers and our bus monitors, but also our office staff, uh, mechanics, crossing guards. Uh, so we just have a, a pretty large group there. We have about 165 bus routes running now, and that's actually down from about 180 from last year, due, uh, partly due to the bell time change. So as a result of the bell time change, in most cases now, uh, what it would take three buses to do, now we can do with only two buses. So that really helped us with some efficiencies and really is helping us with our uh, driver shortage that we've been in for the past several years. We've been kind of hovering around that 30 open driver positions for some time because even though we've had great success in hiring. We've also had turnover. But we really are at a spot now that we're really excited about because we really feel that our, we're beginning to see the, really the fruit of our driver retention and uh, recruitment efforts at this particular time. Because really at the core of that has been really cultivating a, a really cultivating a culture of a uh, professional development culture eh, is what I'm really trying to say there. Uh, because we found out that while you can hire really people looking, pla looking at places where they want to work. I'm a big Costco and Chick-fil-A fan, and so I really took from that that no matter what goes on, Chick-fil-A, y'all are in that line, I'm in that line, and we're not next door at the next place. So I really said if they can do it, uh, we can do it now. So we really wanted to become a destination department within a destination district to ensure other uh, drivers, other school transportation employees wanted to come, even wanted to come to Leander. And and we're seeing that happening because right now, y'all may not be aware of that, but we have employees right now here in Leander in the school trans in our department from Round Rock, from Austin, from Pflugerville, and the list goes on. We even currently have a, a prior transportation director that came to Leander and brought three or four people uh, with her because the word is really out there. We're doing really great things and they want to they wanna be a, uh, a part of that. But even though we're making that great success uh, with our open driver positions because we got 12 to uh, 10 to 12 new drive 10 to 12 new drivers in the hire training pipeline and one thing interesting about that in most cases when you think about hiring if you if you interview somebody today you give them a job you think they can start in two weeks not for us not when they don't have a cdl we're talking about maybe eight weeks so if i was to hire somebody tomorrow friday they may be ready to drive a school bus with students on it after Christmas in, in January. So within a lot of things can happen within that time, so we can lose some people within that same time. So sometime we keep coming back to this number. But right now, with our efforts paying off, we anticipate being down in the 20s and being more in that number as we go into the as we go into the next semester. So we're really excited about that. But what kind of has been our Achilles heel has been absenteeism. So even though we uh, we can cover our routes, so no one ever asks how you cover 30 open routes, that's because just about everybody, including myself and Ken and Christy, we all have CDLs. So just about 80 to 90 percent of our people in our department have CDLs. So the reason you call us and no one answers the phone is because we're on the bus and we're not supposed to be answering the phone while we're driving the school bus with kids on it. So we apologize for, we apologize for that and being slow getting back to some of those let's talks that y'all enjoy reading about, tra about transportation. But we're really trying to do some stuff, so we're in a lot of talks about what we can do to improve uh, absenteeism, some uh, additional initiatives, so we continue to have conversations uh, about that. But that really what sets us back, because we can plan tomorrow, hey, knowing we got X amount of openings, but if somebody calls in sick or multiple people call in sick, it really, it, uh, really, sets, us, it really sets us back. So in light of that, one other thing that's been kind of hot is about routes and running late. We really are improving over last year. I know some people didn't already forgot last year, but this time last year, I promise you, we still had buses running over an hour late. 
That is not the case today unless there's some, uh, something out of control, an accident, uh, on, uh, accident, a mechanical breakdown or something like that. But from normal operations, we're running about 85 to 90 percent on time, depending, depending on which layer you're talking about or what's going on. And uh, Ken's going to talk a little bit about that. And even in areas where we have had some buses running late, we began something called triple R meetings, which he is talking about, that when we identify a particular route that's having some problems, we all meet to meet together collaboratively. It's a team. We set aside focused time, and we meet to uh, hit the, take those head on. So we're all together in that one place to make sure we're able to get that on. Smart Tag, we've been excited about that. That actually started last year, for those who don't remember, when we first started rolling that out, getting that system installed uh, on our buses. So now we have that tablet uh, solution. And right there at the end of the year, we did a, a pilot program with about six uh, campuses that went really well. And right now, we, we're about 75 percent complete. Uh, with that rollout. So uh, we w had hoped to be able to distribute all the, ta all the uh, cards to all the students, but our vendor also has some supply chain and staffing issues that have slowed that, uh, slowed that down. And doing that at the beginning of the year was a challenge, but we were up to that challenge. But we're not experiencing something uh, that's uncommon when you roll out a new system in a school district or any, any uh, organization. Uh, something brand new. So I think we're, we're really tracking uh, very well. We have about 1,800 cards that we just submitted uh, to Smart Tag this week, and we hope to get those back in the next seven to 10 days. And we've also received some, uh, uh, some supplies that were on back order, some ink and some cards. So once we get those 1,800, we'll have several hundred cards in-house as well, and we can print smaller, smaller volumes. So we anticipate hopefully going into next semester that all those cards will be distributed and we'll be, really be off and running. And that's going to be a lot in this presentation that we talk about. We have about 10,000 parents registered in Smart Tag, uh, and the uh, feedback has really been positive. We're still having some growing pains with that, so we're still learning ourselves and sharing those learnings uh, with the community. But we're really excited about where we're at now, but we still have some room, uh, definitely some room for improvement in, in that particular area. Before you leave that slide, oh. Almost missed it. I tried. I was uh, trying to get past before you. <laughs> absenteeism on yes, average 20 per day. Those things that they all end up working on. If you need board support, I'm curious, where does that end up coming in a request? Does John end up reaching out? How, how does that, or is it CDL? Where, where do we see that kind of come up for sub? Oh. Board members are trying to get their license, CDL. Yes. <laughs> yes, I was thinking about meeting that young gentleman at Danielson High School who recruited his his friends to help clean the tables. I wanted to meet. I wanted to talk with him. <laughs> Uh, but really, I guess that support it really starts uh, conversations between us and HR and with John them, and usually we have some dis discussions from that standpoint. And once we agree on something that we think we can all support, and then we bring it forth to the board after those discussions. Yes, oh, yes, ma'am. We we have started having some conversations. We absenteeism has been a, a, a concern for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think we see that on, on our campuses also, and. Uh, I know that Brandon and, and uh, John West and HR have been working on some things together over the last few weeks, and uh, we know that at some point we will, besides you all getting your CDLs, uh, I, I, we, we do understand that we, we may need to come to the board at some point for some additional assistance when we look at absenteeism. It, it is a concern uh, within the department. Quick question. Um, when we look at the 85 to 95 percent routes on time, that um, 15, you know, that 5 to 15 percent, is it the same routes consistently or is it various routes? Yes. <laughs> No, nah, no, no. <laughs> yes, and, and why well, I say yes because we have definitely identified some routes that have been consistently late. So, for example, since the beginning of the year, actually, I think about one that we're work, working on now, where we have discovered that as designed, it can't make it because we're the only department in the entire district that encompasses that whole 200 square square miles. We go to the very corners of those uh, of the district. So, in some cases, just the distance from that campus to where that kid lives way up there, or you know, or way, way over there is very far. So we have found out in some cases, we really, the three tier, for example, 
though we have it constructed that way, we find out there's not enough time and distance between it. We can't do it, so we need to come back to the drawing board. And then it gets a little bit more uh, challenging uh, because anything we do, say, to correct at the middle school level, which is last now, that means we have to go all the way back to elementary if there's a three tier and see if we can get that bus in there earlier. So it's a little bit complicated. So yes, we have we do have some pockets where we've had some that's been late consistently, but we've been working through it through our three tier. And then other times it's various just because of traffic or other things that we, uh, or, or accidents. Like I remember Tarvin is getting very difficult to get up when we're coming out of Tarvin over there is holding up buses and stuff like that. So that's why I say it's kind of a yes. Right. We have some of both. So is four points one of those yeah so four points is one of the ones we worked on okay. today, yeah, today. Um, and <laughs> like ken will talk about more on the triple r yeah. uh, that's been running for two weeks the other piece is is we get feedback from principals um, both through text messages and chats um, of going hey where's this bus at and we're also tracking that plus we've also uh, sought out feedback from them of hey what are you seeing because we the great yeah. thing about smart tag I can pull it up on any of my computer from anywhere, and I can see where that bus is right then in real time, um, and also be able to run those um, type of reports and go, hey, for instance, 246 down in four yeah. points. It's a hot topic because right. traffic getting there, um, their elementary run is perfectly on time when they're leaving Grandview, um, but by the time they're making it all the way up 620 and then all the way back down, it takes 20 minutes sometimes, depending upon what it looks like at 2222. So, all of those things are things that are happening in the layers that we're talking about uh, to the point we're going, okay, how can we incorporate Hop, Skip, Drive to go grab that kid that's up by Twin Creeks Country Club instead of running it all the way up and then all the way back down and then hitting that light that we know is going to take, what did you say, 10 minutes or four minutes for each? Minutes. Three to four minutes. I mean, so that's really the level that the discussions are happening. And for me to know that, um, because we've had all those conversations too, and, and also had those conversations with Mr. Crawford um, out at Four Points. Uh, all right. So uh, y'all may not know this, but we've had a mo our motto has been driving first class service with a commitment to excellence. And to bring this motto into fruition, we've embarked really on a continuous improvement journey, ensuring that we are aligned uh, with the district's vision, mission, and strategic plan. And one of those things were a, um, an op operational review about a year and a half ago. Uh, this was, if y'all may have forget this, but we had COVID and it was this time after a uh, freeze had happened and there had been a lot of change, um, a lot of change in the district, a lot of change with John coming on. And then so we all collaborated and wanted to really get a baseline of where we were at with transportation. I had been here at that time myself about a year and a half uh, and I had observations, but we wanted a third, you know, kind of have somebody come in with some fresh eyes to ensure we were all on the same page and we could uh, kind of corral ourselves around that and, you know, in moving forward. So we had an operational review team came in and they did interviews with uh, our transportation and campus staff and also with some administrators. Uh, we got some good feedback from that and then they overall they reviewed all the things that are listed there, the organization organizational setup all the way down the evaluation process. And here, this is not an exhaustive list, but about 75% of some of the findings and recommendations that were listed there because we have a training department. Matter of fact, the gentleman sitting right here to my right, um, Mr. Ken Turner uh, led that up when we first started the safety and training the uh, department, but uh, and we have drivers that help train in there. So that was one of the observations we talked about, about making that more of a department and staffing that. And then there was some other stuff down there. You see the bell time adjustment and the bus route efficiency. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's interesting in the same way that enrollment dropped off uh, during COVID and during those years, we obviously saw that with, uh, with our bus ridership. So during the 1920, it dropped down to about 4,800 students. Then the following year, 21, 22, it was up to about 87, uh, 8,700 8, students, and now we're almost getting back uh, to that higher level. So when they did this uh, report, they were seeing two or three students on one bus, 15 to 20 students on another bus, and this is another place where Smart Tag has come in place to help us identify and make those adjustments when we have, because really what you want, the most efficiency is when those buses are, are full, when we have 50 students for every level. When they're full, we're really doing a good job and um, you, you know, maxim, maximizing utilization 
of those particular assets. So that's some of the work we're doing with the triple R is getting those efficiencies down, but it takes time because we actually do not know how many students are going to be riding the bus on the first, on the first day of school. We do not have that data, so we plan based on last year. So, well, we had 80-something, 8,000 students writing last year. So how do you, and before that, 4,000 students, and before that, 11,000. So coming in this year, I'm just trying to get some background to some of the challenges that we have that usually at the beginning of the year, we all playing some catch up. But with the data we're getting, uh, with some of the things that we're doing now, we're definitely looking at improvement going forward. Um, in the future. And some other stuff, I'm sure y'all seen our leopard hoods, they just saw those, talked about some painting of, of that, but we're making progress in, in all those other areas as well. Mr. Ken Turner. I had a quick question about oh. the day one ridership um, count. Isn't that something that's captured on the um, student registration, whether they're gonna be riding the bus and you can use that or it's, is it it's gonna be helpful? Not accurately, no, no not, not accurately. People say they ride the bus and they don't. And interesting enough, 100% of eligible riders do not even ride the bus and this is kind of just some data that we're, we're actually at the elementary level, it's about 50% of the eligible riders ride, about at the middle school level, is about 75%, and at the high school level, is about 35%. So we're, but some parents want that option in their pocket just in case, or something that can just change during the, course, during the course of the school year. And guess what else happens on the first day or two of school? Most kids are not riding the bus. So therefore, we get into the first full week of school, and now our number, starts, our, our number starts climbing. We're used to it, and we can adjust to it. This is just some behind the scenes stuff that may not be common knowledge that we're dealing with. So that's why we kind of usually come off kind of rough, and we're like, hold on, you know, hold on one second. We're going to get it together. You know, and I'm calming down, trying to keep John patient and, 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 and the superintendent. I'm like, this, we, we, we got this. Just give us a minute. So. I know we had talked about at least I remember my first, I yes. came and visit y'all and that was one of my first questions is how do we register and get an idea of what we're serving? And it blew my mind, y'all were like, they just show up and then we figure it out. And I know at one point we were discussing, there was um, an option I believe um, that did when we were registering, not last year but the year before, do we have any plans to potentially try to guesstimate that at the beginning of the year when we do do the big registration for our students? Yes, and really uh, some districts do have a bus registration plan and it goes right into that. And we were kind of, this is the first year of Smart Tag, yes. but we look at that as a pull through, if you will, that would allow us to begin setting up that, you know, setting up that structure to be able to do that in the future because we were able to, I was able to get with ITS, so we did add this option that when students were, uh, parents were registering that if you want transportation, instead of being a checkbox, and we did this this year, it was go register for Smart Tag. So we were able to start directing people uh, that direction this year. So hopefully going forward in subsequent years, we start getting better data and can more uh, massage that process and get it to where we need it to be. So we won't have that, uh, have that in the future. So do you see Smart Tag, I guess, potentially next year being the way we will register students? Do you all do get a great representation, I guess, of how many students are gonna show up the first or even first, second week? Yes, and will we start that process earlier? So when we do our regular registration, you know, when we get them like in March, April, yes. register your kid whether they're gonna be here. Do you expect that to be rolled out then when we can all register for Smart Tag? Yes, hopefully, yes. No, that really would be the plan. Okay. We, <clears throat> that really would be the plan. Like I said, we thought this was a pull through. We had this discussion before it even rolled out. And we said, now we have a tool that we can kind of justify. Now we can go back to the district and say, this is why we want to do this. And now we can kind of set it up now that we have some way to track it. And it even takes some uh, pressure off the registrars from that standpoint because the system is separate. So they can literally say, if you, want, you need bus transportation, you need to go over here to Smart Tag so we can capture that data. And then we can say, we based our ridership for that year on, on that. And we know it won't be 100%, but we know we can get, you know, within the ballpark of, eight, you know, maybe 80% right out on the first day of school and do better than we maybe have in the past. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Dr. Ge uh, Dr. Gary, Madam President. Uh, we're really excited to come before you this evening and just to share, uh, just to take off from where Myron was talking about, um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about our empowered staff, and um, I kind of changed some things on this because uh, the name, name of the slide is empowered staff, 
but it's, I, I always like to say encouraged staff, <laughs> inspired staff. Because if you think about bus drivers and you think about monitors that come every day, 5.30, 5.45, 6 o'clock, and after about the second week of school, you know, we start out with a bang and everybody's excited. They're meeting new kids. They're saying hello to the parents. They're try, slowly getting that schedule down. After a while, the empowered staff, we are scraping people off the floor. I mean, <laughs> we really are. You know, they're okay. I'll, I'm, that 5.30, that 5 o'clock. So I always like to think about our empowered staff as in our job, the hard part of our job, as with teachers, et cetera, is keeping them inspired, keeping them involved, keeping them plugged in. And that's what I love because we do a lot of brainstorming uh, with drivers, keeping them coming to work, keeping them being on time, keeping them staying plugged into the vision of getting kids back and forth to school sa safely. So some of the things that we have come up with to attract and grow and retain collaborative community, uh, first-rate transportation employees, not just a body in the seat, mm -hmm. but literally people that have a heart for children, have a heart for kids, have a heart for students, is uh, we now have a recruiter, which we are excited about. I think this is the third year that that position exists. Um, third year, and uh, the lady that heads it up right now, her name is Scotty Arterberry, and just has a heart for transportation. Her background is transportation. Uh, she was a uh, dispatcher. Uh, so it's really exciting this year to have somebody that's in the, in the industry. Uh, another thing that she does for us, uh, she works with Indeed, and most of us know how Indeed works, but she works uh, with Indeed a little deeper than some companies. She can scrape, I think, they, uh, I think the uh, terminology is she can scrape anything uh, uh, in somebody's resume that says CDL or driver, she can grab those, she can go after those. And so the recruiting, which we desperately so need, is a little bit more aggressive. So let me ask you guys a question. How many of you guys have ever driven down the street, driven down 183, and in two miles you see 10 signs that says CDL drivers need it, hiring CDL positions, you know, truck drivers need it. Well, now we are there. So we've got a recruiter, and it's like, yes. Finally, we've got somebody that's recruiting for us. And to me, that is exciting because before then, the competition was cement truck drivers, cement truck companies, uh, um, over the road drivers. You know, they were our competition. So now that we've got somebody in place that's recruiting CDL bus drivers, that makes it all that more easy for us to work on our retention, work on our recruiting and what have you. So that's pretty exciting uh, for me. Um, I've got some notes here, so bear with me as I look down on my notes because I get excited and then I lose my place. <laughs> She's uh, doing a lot of job fairs, and you know we're excited about that. We've gotten quite a handful of drivers just from job fairs. You know, uh, when those job fairs pop up, us as staff sometimes we're looking at each other, going, "Who's going?" Who's going to go to this one? But Scotty's at all of them, and now it's for us, it's exciting to join her just because of the excitement that she brings to it. So that's another thing that we're doing. Um, I love our top tier training program. And if I could speak to that just a little bit, we probably, I would dare say respectfully that we have uh, one of the best training programs in Central Texas. We really do. I do believe that we have a lot of other districts now, uh, Dr. Gear, Gearing, that are reaching out to us. Uh, they're asking, okay, so how are you training people? Uh, how are you getting people hooked up now? There's a new component that DPS has come out with called the TP are the training provider registry. So if you're an entity at all, like a truck driving company, a cement truck driving company, a school district, and you train CDL drivers, you now have to register with the federal government. And it's called, you have to register and have a uh, training provider registry. And basically what it did, it caused the CDL industry to step up in accountability. Because what was going on, you had small companies that weren't really doing everything that it took to have safe drivers out there on the road, and so they came up with a, um, a, a mechanism called TPR, Training Provider Registry, and if you provide uh, training at all, you have to be registered with the federal government uh, to have a registry, and so we have that, and we got our set up pretty quick. This is the first year. It started in February. We got it set up. We hit it running. We were excited about it. Cedar Park, uh, the city of Cedar Park heard about it. They're like, wow, Leander has a TPR 
are already set up, they started calling us and said, hey, can you guys come over and help us set up our TPR? And so we were excited about that, that people are coming to us, other school districts, the same thing, because it was intimidating. And the paperwork, the book that they sent, uh, it was a lot of paperwork, a lot of legal ease, but we attacked it, we got it set up, and we got it set up officially and successfully. And so a lot of other school districts are actually coming to us asking, please help us get this set up. And that's exciting to us because we always want to say that we're the best in the district, or excuse me, we're the best in the area. We want people coming to us asking us, you know, how, how are you doing this? What are you doing? So that's just one of the things that we're excited about. Um, I started back in 08, March of 08. Uh, uh, there's my next door neighbor there smiling at me. <laughs> uh, well, March of 08, and um, uh, I pretty much jumped into training right off the bat. And so, you know, uh, I've been in involved with training for the first 12, 13 years of that, and now I'm the assistant director. But we've just seen some exciting things happening with training, and literally, um, it's just been kind of exciting to see the, the program grow. And let me speak to that just a little bit, don't want to bore you, but uh, Leander ISD has three certified DPS trainers. We're certified through DPS, went through their training, it was a whole week long. We do all, let me repeat, all, of our training in-house. That's exciting because before then, you had to go to DPS, you had to wait in that line and deal with that wonderful customer service that DPS gives you. I am being very sarcastic. You had to, you had to wait in that line and uh, to get uh, help from to get your CDL. Well, now that we are a certified third-party organization with DPS, we do it all. We do the, uh, the written test. There's five written tests that a person has to take when they get their CDL. It happens right in Leander ISD at, uh, at the North facility. And then after that, of course, we do all of the training, but then after that, we do all of the testing. So their driver tests, which is a two hour test, it happens right here. They don't have to go and make an appointment at DPS. We do it all in house and that's exciting. Um, I had a point. Oh yeah. So our latest gentleman that um, went through that that training, he went through the whole week, and then you have to do 15 tests. So you have to shadow a, a DPS agent as they do their tests. And his name is Mr. Terry Williams. So he came back after he got through with his 15 tests. Five of those tests have to match their test within three points. Uh, if they don't, it just goes on and on and on. And he came back. He said, "Ken, I just got." In fact, you talked to Myron and myself. He said. I am so excited about being a part of Leander ISD's training program because you're getting everybody from around here, and I won't name names, but he said it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing uh, what they send to DPS in the name of being ready for a CDL driving test. And he said uh, all of our training, all of our, everything that's involved is top notch. It's first class. And he said, it really made me glad to come back home and say to the directors, our training program is second to none. So anyway, uh, I, I'm excited about that. There's a whole lot more that I can say about that, but I don't want to bore you. But as you can tell, I'm very passionate about it. I get excited about it. And uh, it's just phenomenal. Um, our hospitality and recognition committee, guys, we have a hospitality crew that's second to none. They sell we do a, uh, an employee of the month. And again, like I, let me go back to what I said before. When it comes to empowered staff, uh, inspired staff, encouraged staff, in educated staff, that's where the work begins. So when we're having people that drive every day, we're trying to come up with things uh, to encourage them, to inspire them, to let them know how valuable they are. Because I really, truly believe we have the best around. Somehow, some way, Leander ISD uh, attracts incredible people. I mean, we really, really, really do. We have drivers, uh, they just show up every day and I love them. Uh, I, I gotta be careful because I'll get teary-eyed just talking about our family. Because we always say we're a huge department, but even more so, we're a large family. And that's literally, in fact, when we had our, um, our uh, beginning of the year uh, celebration, Guys, it was off the hook. And uh, next time you guys, yeah, 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 that's right. Now, next time you guys get an invitation, if you can, I, I know I talked to Miss Gloria and she said, I had to work. I wanted to be there. I was on the east side of Austin and I know you guys are having fun, but the next time I'm going to take a day off and come because I heard about it. Yeah. It was incredible. Um, it was, uh, the theme was um, uh, Picture Perfect Year. 
picture perfect year and we took all of the movie themes from this summer like uh, uh, Top Gun, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, my wife's a big, uh, what's the show with the, uh, um, the, uh, back in the 40s. Anyway, there was a movie that came out, and uh, it was, but it was the blockbuster this year. Um, uh, I forgot what it was. I mean, anyway, but we, everybody dressed up in themes. We had red carpet laid out. The Rouse band came, and uh, our drivers were like, they felt like such kings. They felt so welcome. The Rouse band was on one side. We were on the other side, and uh, I'm 59 years old. I think that day, myself and Myron, just to keep the excitement going, I, I exercised in clapping and jumping and dancing, probably about a week's worth of aerobics. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that night I was so exhausted, but our people were inspired. They were happy, they were encouraged, and it empowered them, and it let them know we're part of something bigger than just myself. And it was just powerful. Dr. Gearing came and spoke, and, and uh, man, I, I thought, man, this man needs to be in stand-up. It was phenomenal. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, we really enjoyed you. Thank you. And, and, but again, out of all the years that I have been at Leander ISD Transportation, the, the superintendent never came uh, to our orientation, yeah, yeah. to our in-service. And so it was phenomenal, and it made such a huge impact. Uh, again, our hospitality uh, organization, we do the uh, driver of the month. They get a free parking spot of their own up close to the building. Even their bus is parked up close, and that is huge. So if you think about if you've ever been to transportation, those roles are eternal. You can get your steps in just by walking to your bus. You really can. <laughs> but uh, they get a placard on their bus that says employee of the month. And that's really cool because the first year, the first time that we did it, one of the gentlemen that had that, uh, he got on Facebook, the teachers came out, and they were like, yeah, exactly right. This guy does this, this guy does that. And it's contagious because all of the other people that see that, they were like, well, hey, I got to step up my game because I want that. And uh, so there's just all kind of fun things that we're doing to inspire people and encourage them to come to work every day and to buy into what we're doing. Um, our surveys, our department surveys, we were involved with the UT survey. Uh, that went throughout the whole district and we, we do some other smaller things. Uh, we did one-on-one -on -one interviews, everybody. So when Mr. Wilson first came, uh, he said, I want to meet everybody, and I want to find out who you are, where you're from. People loved it because, again, it was an opportunity for us, for us to hear about them and for him to find out who's working for Leander ISD, NASCAR drivers, uh, ex-police, ex-law enforcement, doctors, retired doctors, and, you know, just to find out the huge, broad, wide volume of people that make up transportation. Again, we always say, you know, uh, transportation, or excuse me, education, starts with transportation. I love my teachers, I love y'all, but, but, but transportation starts with us. We're, first class. we're the first class. So, <laughs> I mean, we get them before you do, and we get to impart manners, we get to impart uh, encouragement, we get to love on them. So I think I woke some of y'all up. It's getting late and I, I see a lot of smiles, so that's okay, that's good. <laughs> um, but uh, our monthly training, we do a, um, we do um, our safety meetings. And I know Ms. Anna Smith, thank you so much for coming. Uh, she's been there several times checking out what we do. We do monthly safety meetings, celebration meetings. Again, I already mentioned the one that we did at the beginning of the school year, but we've got one also planned and we'll be sending out invites and we'd love to see you come if you can. We're gonna do one in January. Cause think about it, January is after Christmas, after the holidays, you know, typically it's a little bit grayer outside, it's cooler, it's colder. And for our drivers, if you think about it, they just celebrated Thanksgiving, they had a week off. For us, that's no pay. They had uh, Christmas break off. For us, that's two weeks of no pay. So come January, we as the directors, as the cheerleaders, we're scraping people off the floor again. I mean, because they're like, okay, man, you know, I'm back in January. So we're going to do a mid-year celebration to let them know how valuable they are. We're going to brainstorm. We'll send out invites. But we would love, we really, 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 we would love for you to come and be a part of that. It, it makes a huge statement when you all show up. I know Mr. Matt, where's, uh, where's Matt? Uh, the, uh, yeah, Matt Como came over. Uh, the uh, second week of school, I know some of the chiefs were visiting all of the different departments, and we sure appreciated that. We really did. He came, we gave him a tour, and I told him about the red carpet event that we had. You know, it's kind of likened to the Academy Awards. He was like, man, I missed out. I, you should have invited me. I said, you did miss out. But uh, <laughs> we would love to have you all come and be a part of it. And he got to hear about it, and it was just really exciting. But lastly, real quick, we're doing something because of, again, we're trying to uh, maximize and make 
make our routes as efficient as we can. So we call it Triple R. We have it every week, and we go over a list of routes that have been laid, that are overcrowded. Maybe they don't have enough kids on them, and we call it the Route Review and uh, Resolution. So we're trying to resolve routes that aren't being efficient, routes that are being late. And so again, the Let's Talks, and Mr. Brandon's a part of that. Uh, our uh, uh, directors are a part of that. Our dispatchers are a part of that. And we just basically brainstorm and collaborate on what routes that we can correct. And it's been very, very effective. So again, uh, thank you for your time. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Ms. Christie, because she's got some exciting things. So uh, behind you. <laughs> Good just, Good so, evening. just so everybody knows. Knows. We pra we, when we practice this, Ken said, it's not going to be more than two to three minutes. <laughs> and I said, there's no way, Ken. And Ms. Christie goes, hey, you can have a couple of my minutes, Mr. Ken. <laughs> you gave them to me, so I took them. Well, I know, but I didn't know if I was going to be behind you. Good evening. So we're going to talk about equitable access. Across the district, we're going to provide equitable access equitable access to all Leander ISD opportunities by eliminating the barriers for each and every student. Some of the things, we support all the special programs within the district. This year they added the early college high school program, so we're transporting kids from Vandegrift all the way up to San Gabriel Parkway to the college out there. We also do our live programs. We've got pre-K three and four, our SPED program, we do our bilingual IB, gifted and talented swim team, just to name a few. So we do a lot. So we work hand in hand with the Hop Skip Drive to provide additional resources. Even more, we provide, we provide transportation to our added district students. That's going to include our McKinney Vento students. These students or displaced by no fault of their own. We want to provide some kind of stability in their life during this difficult time, so we're gonna allow these students to stay at their home campus. We're gonna go to areas such as Austin, Georgetown, Round Rock, to pick these students up and bring them back in district so they can, they, they can stay at their home campus. We also provide transportation to the Texas School for the Blind and the Visually Impaired, and we provide transportation to the Texas School for the Deaf. In addition to all things I just mentioned, we support and provide transportation to roughly 6,000 6, trips per year. These include our band, our choir, our color guard, and our dance teams, and many more. We also cover all school field trips. Festival of the Bands was one of our biggest undertakings that we do. That took place on October 10th. We require that required 47 school buses to bring all of our middle and high school kids into Gupton Stadium. In addition to providing the buses, we also provided the drivers, we provided the semi-trucks, and all transportation office staff members were on hand for this event to ensure that it was successful. By supporting all these special programs, we're giving students both in and out of the district the ability to meet their individual needs, which provides each student the opportunity to be successful. Thank you. All right, and then I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> How long um, do they give you for this one? <laughs> I'll go through it quick, I promise. <laughs> um, Impactful family engagement and some of the ways that we're doing that to engage diverse community by fostering positive relationships through reciprocal communication and collaboration. Of course, we talked a lot about the smart tag and the parent uh, portal, the notifications and bus tracking. Guys, seriously, we have had so much positive feedback about that. I'm a parent. My, my daughter is at Rouse High School. Uh, Christy's a parent for uh, um, uh, Leander ISD, three, three in the district at Rouse as well. The parent portal is phenomenal. I mean, parents can track. Uh, uh, they can track the bus, well, actually, not their, not, uh, not their, their child. They can tell. Students. Yeah, we don't track students. That's one of the corrections that we have made over and over and over again. But they can tell when, they, when their child gets on the bus. And for me, that's huge. Because if I know that my daughter's fine, she's safe, she's on the bus, uh, she's been dropped off, she's at school, that's been just huge. And the feedback on that is wonderful. I love it. Um, uh, Let's Talk has been redesigned. In fact, Myron, did you want to speak to that a little bit? Yes, and we that's, that's my favorite. Yes, I love Let's Talks. 
I really love it. So uh, let's talk right now. Whenever they go on there to communicate with us, it's pretty much just one button. If there's any transportation issues, they just select that. But we are kind of piloting a redesign where we're going from one category to a dozen categories so they can it can more uh, drill down into the specific issues, even if it's recognition, no matter what it is, they can drill down and they can select which, uh, which category they want to respond. So that helps it. Uh, so we have the ability to route that to the right place and also now we can track those numbers as well so that we can see where the biggest issues are at maybe at different times of the year and it's pretty interesting because like I said SCR got, got with us and we start having these discussions and said hey we think this would be great for uh, transportation and we can get it rolled out with you guys and then we can see if it's effective for other departments uh, throughout uh, throughout the district so that's something that we really exci uh, excited about because like I said we think that would be uh, uh, instrumental in getting feedback uh, from our from our community and our other fun, fun thing that we like uh, every year is our annual net zone survey and that's where we go out to all our uh, all our folks within the net zone and just uh, request any feedback from them if they're currently not getting transportation and they feel they may qualify or they want us to come out and look at uh, particular areas so we send that out and then we wait to get that feedback and then we follow up with them so that's another way that we are engaging them and getting feed feedback uh, from them uh, throughout the year, and I'm going to take the next one, Ken. And then one of the, one <laughs> and then one thing that we talked about, and, and really, we actually really excited about. We, we're always brainstorming. We really are. I came into the district. Uh, continuous improvement has been around for a very long time. When I interviewed uh, John, told me, uh, John Graham was on. He told me just because I mentioned continuous improvement, that's the only reason I got the job. But but I mentioned continuous improvement because I've always been a proponent of continuous improvement. So even walking in the door, I was always a believer in that. So I'm always pushing the team in that area. So it's how can we do more? How can we do more? So you know, looking down the road, we I start we start talking and collaborating about wanting to do student advisory committees where we actually go to our customers, which really are the students, and start talking to them about their experience and and how can we improve. That that experience because even if we want to bring something to the board or work with HR, I think even that ha having that data directly back from them would be uh, very beneficial. So we're going to start doing that, probably have our first one going in, in the next semester. Uh, uh, in, in the next semester. So we're really excited about getting that set up. And then also, we know we have opportunity in this area, uh, a large opportunity in this area. So we're going to continue to evaluate and improve, you know, try to improve our engagement. Because like I said, I think we have a, a great opportunity in this area for transportation to get more, get that engagement and to partner with the campuses and with the board, et cetera, on doing that. So they feel that they're being heard whenever they have, whenever they have concerns. Before y'all, uh -huh. oh, before y'all have slide, um, you know, I had told you earlier. There's a question of, I've been noodling, and I'm still noodling, so I'm not going to ask that one. I'm going to go down a level and tell you one of the things that keeps me kind of going up, going, how do we do this well? And it's the net survey, our evaluation and improving um, engagement, which is that when we have our hazardous route discussion, John knows I love to ask questions <laughs> about hazardous routes. I, I didn't use that word. Every time we have that hazardous routes, I know he didn't use it on purpose, I guess. We have a discussion. One of the things is that I, I feel like the conversation ends up becoming, um, for the community, this route isn't as hazardous, therefore you can drive. But it's the what is hazardous, because if we don't take into account things like accidents that happen on the road, then I think some of our community goes, well, wait, this feels hazardous to me. I feel like there's an issue here with communication. Have you in any of this started looking at some of those features of hazardous routes or what where does that fall? Because I keep having questions and asking John, and I'm, you know, it's going to come up again. So just maybe if I can focus in the right area of, of how we do this well with our community, because I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that it's not so much about, um, well, this route isn't that, that dangerous, so you can use it. I don't think really that's the discussion. I think the discussion is we have a limited amount of resources that we have a limited amount of vehicles and people, and we are trying to get transportation to all the things that you, you've you talked about. And so with that, the not for transportation zone is the way we've been able to at least give us some parameters. I'm just trying to figure out though, how we do that so it feels equitable to all those who are impacted by it. I can go ahead. 
Well, I think we've done that because there were with the, and this was when I just came in and I, I know Jimmy sitting back there when we, we did the matrix because that matrix and when we had the community, uh, that committee, uh, that came together and we went through all that work to redo that matrix just to make sure that we were doing that. So now we use that very uh, objective score, scoring sheet, which is online and anybody can look at to see exactly what we're looking at. And I remember, now, maybe not the last hazardous route, but the one before that, there was a question about on one particular road that I happen to be familiar with, Quinlan, down south, and there was some talk about accidents. Technically, there's accidents on every road, but even when we looked at the data, and I remember because John actually did it, we found out that during the uh, bus times when people would be going to and from school, because there's only a very narrow window when people would be going to and from schools. I think there had been one accident. I don't remember, I don't want to misquote you, but one accident in several years. They, they, the, the data, we did look at that data, and it was very minor compared to, based on what some of the folks were saying. I think, John, you want to talk to that? Yes, Myron. Uh we did look at that because that was a road that was that was uh, brought to our attention and it was very difficult data for us to attain for one thing i had to have russell assist us in getting that information from uh, from transportation services in, in Travis County. And so it's not easily accessible data for us to, to obtain. And then when we looked at the data for that road, when accidents occurred, most of the accidents occurred at, at night, at dark, when our students are, are not traveling. And, and Myron was correct, there was one, one route. I think one of the things I, that we have talked about tonight, and I agree, when we go out for those uh, surveys on net zones and we're asking for feedback, are we doing a good enough job of giving feedback back to the community on why the, the route may not be hazardous? And we always provide a safe walking route, uh, but maybe that, not maybe, that could be an area where we could pr uh, improve is this is why the route did not, was not deemed hazardous. And also communicate to the community just because a route is not hazardous or that uh, students are, are walking in an area that, uh, uh, that may not even impact our, our routes, we meet regularly when we know that there is a risk to our students yes. when, when transporta transportation's impacted, not only for our, our bus riders and our students that walk with crossing guards, but even routes that, uh, I can use Parkside as an example. I could use uh, the Vista Ridge, uh, Henry, Reagan area. And so it's not a net zone type of issue, but we do have those conversations. So myself and Jimmy and Laura Lynn and Brandon, we go out and, and have conversations with cities and counties to look at what can we do it's not going to necessarily impact a hazardous route, but we still need to ensure that that's a safe walking route for our students. And so I don't know that we have done a good job of communicating that to the public, that that is the work that we've done and will continue to do. And there has been improvements and in, in work that, that will may happen in the future or already has happened. And, and Jimmy can speak way more about that than, than I can, but I think that's the, the matrix, I think y'all as trustees did work on a few years ago, and I think we made some very good improvements. And so I don't know that it's a matrix issue. I'm, I think maybe it's a communication issue mm -hmm. on how we communicate to our, to our parents on why a student may not be eligible for a route. Well, and I don't want to derail. This is a great presentation. I think your question or your comment about communication mm -hmm. is, is right on it is that, you know, there is this communication piece. I love that we continuous improvement can keep working on how do we help explain. And it isn't, I, I don't think there's one road in the district. I think it, as I go throughout the district, there's a few of them that keep coming up and saying, do y'all realize what happens on this road? Yes. Um, and so. Um, and, and, and we do, and it is impactful for us. Uh, I, I, when we get those comments, we, I'll be the first one to call Brandon, and Brandon, of course, go straight to, to Myron. What are we doing to ensure that that is a safe route for our students? Yes. And, and if that means that, that the three of them have to go and walk that route, they will go walk that route. And they do that. 
Another aspect of communication that I've heard has to do with um, those hazard hazardous routes reviews. Do they happen annually? Because sometimes people are worried about losing. Yes. It's like we got our bus back, and then, but because you keep doing yes. it annually, we're worried that we're going to lose that bus. Or elementary got the bus, but middle school didn't get it. And then just having that communication with them just to ease their minds and explain what's going on. Yes, and it is annually. It, it, it is annually, and with our growth, it almost, uh, with the growth that we're having, actually, it, it makes even more sense uh, for it to be annual because things change quite quickly. Like, uh, I think Raider Way is finally going to get done over there. <laughs> but, you know, with the changes, with the construction and with stuff going on, there are some long-term and short-term, so we need to be adjust to that where there may be some areas that there's some have that just is not going to, I mean, whatever it is, it is what it is, and it's not going nowhere because that they're landlocked, there's no new construction, et cetera, so on and so forth. But in some other areas, like up here north, I can we can definitely see that happening. And it's a very tricky thing because everybody yeah it's this is very tricky it's a lot once we put transportation in there it's very difficult to 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 get it out once we put once we put the bus in there but we'll continue to do uh you know improve on our communication because even with the growth this year i can already tell we have a lot of new uh families that have moved in so when we get into hazardous routes i anticipate we're going to have a lot more feedback than maybe in the past two years just because we've had a lot more families move in and it's to your point to that education process and even understanding that we didn't really create hazardous routes and that actually is from the state we didn't create the two miles because I've had to, you know, make sure that we communicate. That is not a Leander ISD thing. That is actually tied back to the state, and we are just complying. We're just really just complying with the state and doing what we can at the local level through the board and, and, and through the work that we're that we're doing here. Oh, good. All right, has routes. <laughs> <laughs> so we continue to work on our safe and innovative learning environment. Um, one of the sayings that we have as each new driver enters our training program is that we're driving first class service with a commitment to excellence. We are the first class of the day and we're the last class of the day. So we encourage each of our drivers to learn every student's name, to greet them with a smile each and every time. We purpose to make each student feel welcome and empower them to be their best. This helps us set the tone for the day in the class. Also, one thing that we did this summer, we installed Wi-Fi on all Leander ISD buses using the grant. So this allows our students to get on the bus and do their homework, do their homework. as they're going to and from school, <laughs> sporting events. And yes, we have actually seen footage of a student logged onto his laptop doing his homework. Yeah, um, this Wi-Fi will also allow our smart tag system to work in areas that would normally not have, normally that we would lose signals which will prevent our dispatchers from being able to have accurate locations on a route. So Wi-Fi is going to help us kick, to keep from losing that signal. We are excited about the rollout of SmartTag. SmartTag offers modern innovation coupled with safety features that allows us to partner with our students, families, and communities. I find that it's important to know that each of our buses are equipped with cameras, which will give us a bird's eye view both inside and outside of the cameras inside and outside of our buses in the event that an incident or an accident occurs. About three years ago, the board approved and the, the board voted and approved the buses outfitted with AC, which makes for a more comfortable ride for our students in this Texas heat. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. As a parent with three kids in the district, they have literally been riding the bus since they were in kinder. They are now in high school. Um, the features that have been installed on these buses allow me to be at ease while my students and my kids are being transported to and from school. Any more questions? Yeah, board members? I do have a question. Um, when we're doing our training for our bus drivers, what kind of uh, training are we giving our drivers and interacting with our children with disabilities? Because I know our, you know, there's certain uh, transportation routes for our students mm -hmm. who are receiving special education services and I know I have two of them and I know they're very particular about certain things so how are we preparing our drivers so that way those students are getting the same success and you know interaction and there's no ahead, bumps along the way 
Excellent, excellent. Um, we have every driver, whether they're gen ed or sped, goes through uh, sped training. So yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a whole video series that uh, we use from a great company in Ohio. It's called School Bus Safety Company. And their videos are second to none, they're just phenomenal. Uh, we do a lot of role playing, that kind of thing. Uh, the gentleman that's over our safety and training right now, Mr. Robert Bella, he is, yeah, he's got two sped kids as well. That's exactly right, right. And just super passionate. So when we're doing observation or riding with drivers, if there's ever an issue that comes up, he is on it. He is riding with them. He's doing refresher training. He is doing observation, um, that kind of thing. Uh, like I said, we do some some fun things as far as role playing and what have you, and uh, it's <coughs> excuse me, it's just really neat to see the inhibitions come off of people because if they've never worked with sped sped kids, you know sometimes there is some some hesitancy, but uh, just through the training, we have a lot of people that are like they love it. Once they get into the sped world, they love it, they enjoy it, and um, it's been very successful. And we have also partnered with uh, folks in the district as well, because during some of our training, uh, Robert leaned that up. He has invited out various groups to talk about uh, seizure training and, and brought people out. So during our safety meetings, usually just something on, on, with students with, uh, with special needs. So we uh, you, utilize those to bring more people out. But it's something that we uh, actually have been recently talking about that it's it's something that we need to continue to enhance because right. the uh, it seems like our, that population appears to be growing mm -hmm. in Leander, and we're starting to see it. And uh, one student can be three different, you know, have three different things going on. Oh, now it gets hot. Now we got one issue. Now it's cold. Now it's day. So we definitely have opportunity to continue in, in improve because you, you it's something that you really have to stay on. But I believe we got the right the right person at the wheel because when you have somebody. That's to, they, 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 they know it firsthand. Uh, we're really we're really on we're really on the really on the right track uh, with that. So we're we're doing a great job. I think we're doing a good job, but I think we can do great. But it's, I, I just believe in continuous improvement. So I feel we always are going to have some room uh, for improvement. Like I said, definitely as that com our that community grows here in Leander ISD. Uh, just a real quick story. I like stories. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I do. <laughs> Uh, Thanksgiving. Back at Thanksgiving, I had a driver call me um, during Thanksgiving break, and she said, thank you. And I asked, what? what? And she said, the uh, seizure training that we get every year as bus drivers, she said, uh, my son, he's home from the military, et cetera, and through, through some uh, medical issues, he had his first seizure. And she said, I knew exactly what to do. And she said, you know, and she's older than me, and she said, all these years, I sat through that, that training, and you never thought you'd have to use it. I never thought that I would be the one, my family or anybody around me, and she said, I called on Thanksgiving to thank you for having the uh, seizure training that you all do for Leander ISD bus drivers. Uh, we do several now. Uh, we, in fact, we just did a refresher, and it's just one of those things that's on our radar that we do want to do and need to do continually. And so I'm excited about that. And then um, I was just going to mention another thing that our uh, wonderful trainer does. He invited the foundation of missing and exploited children. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That oh, yeah. was that. phenomenal. Because yeah. think about it, you know, we're drivers. We're going up and down the neighborhoods. We're the eyes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and just some of the things that they brought to us that empowered us to protect and to keep safe our communities, it was awesome. And so those are some of the things that we're doing just uh, along the, those lines. So I have one quick question. Uh, as you know, the, the bands in the district are world class. Yes, and I are. do know yes. that we had some issues with uh, children being um, allowed to bring instruments on buses. Can you speak to that really quickly? And are they allowed? Are we, are we past all of the issues that we had? I know Styles was a specific situation. Well, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any so, issues. So, no. oh, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, John. Go ahead. So, according to our handbook, yes. if a student has a large item like an instrument on a bus and it could potentially cause a safety hazard or take away a seat from a student, then a student is not allowed to bring that large item. It's not specific just to banned instruments, it's any large item that could potentially cause harm or safety issue or take away a bus from a student. And that is our district 
uh, handbook, and it is a rule that we will continue to follow. Now, we know that there are times where this, the bus may not be overcrowded. We know that the bus may not, it may not cause a safety hazard, and so our, our bus drivers do have that opportunity to work with the student. But I cannot say that we have removed that because if it is going to cause a safety or a security or, or a hazard, or a take away a seat from a student, then, then we have to say no. And some of the times, especially in the style zone, some of those buses can be loaded pretty heavy. And so is it something we wanna do? Not necessarily, but it is something we have to do if it is meeting, causing a safety hazard or causing a bus to be overloaded. I, I will say that that does bring up an equity issue. You have students that are in band that then can't basically. And, and it's not just banned. It no, could be a student banned. that's bringing their football pads on the bus. And so it's not unique to one program or another. I guess it the is only the thing size. We've, we've heard a lot about is, is banned, so that's why we're mentioning yeah. that. But whatever the extracurricular is, it does become an equity issue because there are students that don't have any other mode of transportation and then they're not able to participate in their extracurricular if they can't. I don't know. And that's where we work with the principal and the, and the teachers to work with that student and the family to ensure how are we giving that student an opportunity. And that's the conversations that we have. I don't know that we can ever say we can allow every instrument or every large item on our buses, not with how our buses are loaded and the safety risks that they could cause. But it does cause us, this is a concern, Miss Maples, she reached out to me. Let's work through this to ensure that we can meet that, that student's need or other student's need, knowing that this is the rule that we have to follow if it's gonna cause harm to a student or take away a ride from another student. And that's the conversations that we have to have, an individual conversation. Here's the need, what can we do, knowing that we can't do this necessarily? And that was the conversation that I did have with Ms. Maples. I had a question, is this a local policy? I would, Never worked in any other district uh, I have. with transportation? I have, and it's very standard. I've been in transportation over 15 years, almost going on 20 years. Every school district I've been out, it's been the same, and I've been there, so it's, it's been the exact same thing for the, really exact, for the exact same reason. One exception, I would say I was at one district and we had under, uh, Early on, the district had made the decision to get more buses with the undercarriage. So, so therefore, if the students were able to put it for, uh, in the undercarriage, then it, it eliminated that particular issue. But that was a decision, even though that caused some problems too. But now we had a, a place to put the large items in that undercarriage so that it can be transported to avoid that. But it's, it's very yeah. standard in the industry. I would be curious. I'm going to go look if it's a local or local policy or not, because I know there's many other districts, right, that have banned students and. I would really hate for us to eliminate, you know, that access to a child performing in our bands or football or whatever. And I'm curious to see how many students have been affected by that. And so I'm going to go down a rabbit hole to go see what that policy is. Well, I appreciate too if we're working individually to then, like, get the instrument. If you know, if they can have a backup one at school and and then sure. you know have, you know, leave one at campus yeah. and have the one at home and and things like that. So. I'm, I'm glad that we're my, figuring my, it out. My other area that I work closely with is extracurriculars. And so I promise you I'm hearing from Myron, but I'm also hearing from Mike. And, <laughs> and, and my job is to figure it out where we work together as a team. And, and that's what we do daily. Well, I can say that um, I enjoyed the kickoff so much. Thank you all so much for the invite. Um, but what was so evident was um, the thought and the care everyone had for each other. I mean, from at the kickoff event, somebody went to the extra step to design the Willy Wonka candy things to make sure then there was a golden ticket. Yeah. Like that, that type of attention to detail for each other to be able to celebrate kicking off the year 
I think I also see that and hear that in the stories of the attention to detail our bus drivers are providing for our students and for their family. Um, I think the um, from everything from the water with the little story and the starfish theme to um, to the community coming in and getting breakfast donated for this event. Mm -hmm. To me, being able to see that whole thing come together, there were so many little pieces and parts that just really helped embody how much work this department is doing and how much they really do enjoy each other as a family. Um, and so that was amazing. Thank you so much for the invite. And I hope you will um, continue to reach out to the board. We can't always make all of them. Yes. Uh, we, we sometimes have to trade off. And so Gloria might get to tell me how great it is. I'm like, man, I missed that one. I want to go to the next one then. But, um, but thank you for letting us know of the event. Thanks for the update and all the amazing work. It is exciting. There's a lot of good work going on. And, and thank you for hanging in there. Uh, transportation, so much in education has been a wild ride. Um, so thank you all for good spirits and for being with us this evening and telling us about all the great things you're working on. All right. All right. We're going to take a five minute break and we'll be back at 11, well, six minutes, we'll be back at 11.30.
All right, it's 1130, and we're going to go ahead one, two, three, four, and get started. We've got the, going back up to the top, governance discussion of the Leander Education Excellent Foundation LEAF Memorandum of Understanding. And we've had um, meetings on this. So a couple board members have already been. So, yeah, I was going to say, we already have kind of like a little committee work on this, so. So first, I'm just making a note never to follow transportation again <laughs> on the agenda. I, I'm not nearly as entertaining. Um, what you'll find in your board packet is a product. Um, it is the product of the work that administration and two of your board members uh, and LEAF have done, uh, have created coming out of a process. I'm not going to read the product to you. I think that you're all reasonably intelligent adults. And my personal goal anytime I draft a contract is I look for concision and readability. So if you're really confused about it, we'll have some time at the end of this for you to ask any questions you need to. And that, that gives me the signal that I didn't meet that objective. The process that we went through, um, Dr. Gearing uh, suggested, and I heartily approved, that what we did as a group was we used our, our continuous improvement tools to work on redrafting what has been an agreement we've had with our partners, the Leander uh, Educational Excellence Foundation, that is, was outdated, uh, has gone through multiple addenda, and was starting to get difficult to track what the most recent agreement was on any given issue. And so our main objective as a group was to come up with one agreement to rule them all, to completely freshen up, sorry for the Lord of the Rings reference. I, I was a nerd in high school, okay? Um, but, but truly to have one document that was readable and that was re refreshed and that we, so that we all knew and understood what, what it is that we wanted to work on. And we used tools such as bone diagrams where we look at our ideal state. And I think what was really powerful in that process, um, I, I have used personally used uh, continuous improvement tools in the past for various negotiations. And what's really powerful about it is that instead of focusing on your differences, you have a real opportunity to look at what all the things that you actually agree on, what your shared objectives are. And it, it was really good for helping us to build relationships, uh, and I, which I thought was a, uh, a good use of our time with a new executive director on that board. And so long story short, I will be much shorter than transportation, I promise. What you see now as a result of that is the draft that we've created and has gone back and forth between district administration. Um, your, um, Anna and Trish were on, on that committee with us and have given feedback and, and also the feedback that we've received from LEAF and we believe is the proper agreement between the parties that really art articulates our, our partnership and, and how we will work together moving forward. Um, you'll take action on this, hopefully, at your next board meeting. Tonight is just for discussion, and if you have any particular questions or concerns as you've looked at that document. So this would go on our consent agenda unless um, y'all get Sean questions, and then Sean, we don't want it on the consent. We want to make sure we have time to discuss it on our next agenda item. Certainly. Okay. All right, great. Well, I'm getting the head nods. We're moving on. Thank you, Sean. We'll move on to our annual announcement regarding continuing education of board members. Board members, I have to say, um, education is just outstanding. The board members have done a lot of continuing education. This does not uh, give us a comprehensive list of how many requirements and hours and all the trainings that y'all have exceeded. This is just a statement that's required for um, specific continuing education that I'll be reading. This is a script that has been written to make sure I read it into the record. Um, so, under the State Board of Education rule, completing required continuing education each year of service is a basic obligation and expectation of any sitting board member. As board president, I am required to announce the name of each board member who has completed the required continuing education, has exceeded the required continuing education, and is deficient in meeting the required continuing education. These requirements for training are measured as of the first anniversary of the date of the trustee's election or appointment or the two-year anniversary of his or her previous training as applicable. There are eight training areas for board members continuing education. Local district orientation for first year board members. 
orientation to the Texas Education Code for first-year board members, post-legislative update to the Texas Education Code after each legislative session for the first-year board members during the 2021-2022 reporting period, team building sessions, additional continuing education, evaluating student academic performance and setting goals, child abuse prevention, identifying and reporting abuse, trafficking and other maltreatment of children, and school safety. safety. To the extent applicable to each board member, I will announce the completion or deficiency as to required training. For training number one, local district orientation for first year board members. The following first year board member has completed the local district orientation, Shade Fashakum. Training number two, orientation to the Texas Education Code for first year board members. The following first year board member has completed the orientation to the Texas Education Code, Shade Fashakum. Training number three, Post-legislative update to the Texas Education Code for first-year board members during the 2021-2022 reporting period. The following first-year board member has completed the post-legislative update to the Texas Education Code. Shade Fashakum. Training number four, team, we okay? Okay, team, I'm looking, <laughs> team building sessions. Dr. Gehring and the following board members have completed the annual team building session. Trish Bodie, Gloria gonzalez Delacchia. Alexis Grimes, Shade Fashakun, Aaron Johnson, Christine Maurer, and Anna Smith. Training number five, additional continuing education. The following board members have exceeded the additional of the additional continuing education requirements. Trish Bodie, Gloria gonzalez Delacchia, Alexis Grimes, Shade Fashakun, Aaron Johnson, Christine Maurer, and Anna Smith. Training number six, evaluating student academic performance and setting goals. The following board members have completed the biennial training of evaluating student academic performance and setting goals. Trish Bodie, Gloria gonzalez Delacchia, Alexis Grimes, Shade Fashakun, Aaron Johnson, Christine Maurer, and Anna Smith. If you're listening to see if any names are missing, they're not, they're all gonna be here, but I still have to read them. Training number seven, child abuse prevention, identifying and report abuse, trafficking, and other maltreatment of children. The following board members have completed the biennial training of child abuse prevention, identifying and reporting abuse, trafficking, and other maltreatment of children. Trish Bodie, Gloria gonzalez Delacchia, Alexis Grimes, Shadai Fashakun, Aaron Johnson, Christine Maurer, and Anna Smith. Training number eight, School safety. The following board members have completed the biennial training on school safety. Trish Bodie, Gloria gonzalez Delacchia, Alexis Grimes, Shade Fashakun, Aaron Johnson, Christine Maurer, Anna Smith. This concludes the annual announcement regarding continuing education of board members for the current reporting period. If there are no questions. We'll be done with this agenda item and move on to the next one. To operations C1, the discussion of district-wide intruder detection audit report findings. Thank you. I am actually going to read tonight. This Texas School Safety Center has given us parameters on, on this presentation, and so uh, it's easier for me just to, to, to read a statement. Uh, the top priority of Leander ISD in the state of Texas is keeping students and staff safe every, every day. The Texas School Safety Center recently conducted intruder detection audits at seven of our campuses. The audits test whether a campus is accessible to an unauthorized individual. The audits conducted as part of Governor Abbott's school safety directives for all school systems following the tragedy in Uvalde. Seeks to help districts identify how campuses can improve safety for students, such as ensuring exterior doors are locked. Uh, the district appreciates and supports the measures the state and safety center have taken to help ensure our, our campuses are safe. Uh, I ac actually added that line. It has been beneficial to, to our district. Um, and you can see that when you walk on our campuses. The audit provides us with an opportunity to create a safer learning environment for our students and staff. One, uh, one out of the seven campuses audited had a state finding. Uh, the campus had two findings for exterior issues. One finding was due to an exterior door that was locked, but the auditor was able to access the main campus because the latch malfunctioned and the door was able to be pulled open. The auditor was able to access the inside of the school but was immediately, and this is uh, what, what helps us for these audits and this is why we have them, uh, was immediately confronted by a staff member and escorted to the front of the office. The door was locked and not propped, and on the campus last weekly audit check, the door was functioning properly. 
Uh, after the state's intruder audit was completed, the door was checked again by the campus, and the door was actually functioning properly. So I'm not sure why it malfunctioned, but it did. Uh, the, the campus did put in a work order to, to determine why the latch did not function properly, and plant services uh, responded immediately and uh, went ahead and replaced the latch to ensure that it did not malfunction again. The other finding was attributed to the campus, but the responsibility for the security of this facility is truly not under the campus's control. I'm sorry, I'm not going to, to provide additional details for, for this finding because it could potentially identify the campus and the location and, and do not want to provide that information because it could provide a safety concern for that campus. Since the summer, we have been working closely with our campus and district administrators to ensure that we are training all of our staff and securing our doors for the protection of everyone at our campuses. We will continue to work with our school safety and security meeting for feedback and support on best practices to provide a safe learning environment for our students and staff while maintaining best practices for learning. The support from the state in conducting the intruder detection audits is just one of the many actions we are taking to ensure our schools are safe. We know that this work does not end and we appreciate the board's support. We acknowledge that parents and community members are likely very interested in the details of the audit results. However, it is in the best interest of the students that we do not share the inform this information to the broader public as it could lead to compromising important security information. Specific details of the intruder detection audit will be discussed in closed session with the, and with the Safety and Security Committee on November 1st. We are committed to providing a safe and secure learning environment for our students and staff. All right, board members. Thank you, John. We'll go ahead and conclude that agenda item. We'll get more updates in closed. And we'll move to operations, C3, uh, review the guaranteed maximum price Number one for elementary number 30. Madam President, board members, Dr. Gearing, last June we did um, present the long range facility plan to the board and in that plan it um, laid out that elementary 30 was to open in 2024, 2025. And so at that time we started the process to design it and we brought up the issue of supply chain issues with a lot of the materials and so we have gone out to bid and got those prices just to make sure everyone's aware everybody sees it when you go to the grocery store inflation is playing a part and since we bid for north elementary which was number 29 to number 30 we've actually seen 49 percent price increase on our um, mechanical equipment 48 percent price increase electrical and 38 on plumbing. That is significant dollars, but we did plan for those costs when we set the budget for 30 in the bond project savings. And so we do have those costs covered, but it's real costs that are impacting the cost of our projects in the future also. And so we are bringing GMP number one to get approved at the next board meeting and it's in the amount of nineteen million eight hundred seventy eight thousand and two hundred twenty eight dollars and so that'll get us started and then we'll be bringing another gmp back sometime in the spring any questions all right thank you jimmy thank you, thank you. interesting times thank you for all your work all right we will move on um to operations uh C5, consider approval of appointment of investment officer and amend investment pool resolutions. Back for the second time. <laughs> and Pete's thinking, yeah, but last time y'all got done so early. What happened? You guys tricked me there. Uh, hey, uh, members of the board, uh, tonight, uh, with my new position, uh, just pretty a formality is uh, we need to, uh, or we recommend that the board approve of me being added as the investment officer for the district, as well as being added uh, to the three investment pools. And is that uh, for approval tonight? Then I need a motion. I move that the authorized representatives with text pool and Lone Star be admitted to include Pete Poppy. Poppy. I second. Poppy. Have a motion from Alexis, second from Anna. Any other questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven, seven eyes, no nays. No, I, yeah. 
Okay. Seven. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Motion carries. Um, the next item is business and finance monthly report. But isn't there, uh, isn't there just oh, another, motion. another motion? Oh, then I need another motion. I move that Leander ISD appoint Pete Poppy as investment officer. I second. Okay, I have a motion from Anna, second from Christine. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven ayes, no nays, motion carries. We're done with the motions? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll move on to the business and finance monthly report. Usually board members, we ask questions. Is there any questions, if you have any? Okay, do you have anything for us? No, I just want to say uh, during this transition, we'll, we'll pretty much keep the same uh, format style. Uh, we'll be some minor changes going forth, uh, but for the most part, we'll ease into any, any, any changes. Uh, we will look at adding a, a cash flow report. That's really the only thing oh. I can see us as being anything different. That'd so, be great. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And that concludes this agenda item. Board members, there's a board uh, member debrief in the um, agenda, it's after closed session. It's item number 11. I'm hoping the link works this time. If you have any things of what you think would help or that we need to do for our meetings, let us know. I don't know if you want to limit numbers of items <laughs> or whatever, but if you have any thoughts that you like, put them in there. That goes to Cindy and then she uses that for kind of our continual um, meeting improvement. Um, and I appreciate all your feedback. We'll be moving now to closed session. Uh, we will be going into closed session for the purposes permitted by, oh, it is 11.47, and we'll be going into closed session for purposes permitted by Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with attorney regarding pending or contemplated litigation and or attorney-client privilege matter. Texas Government Code 551.074, personnel, deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties of a public officer or employee. Texas Government Code 551.0821. Deliberation regarding matters whereby personally identifiable information regarding one or more students will be disclosed. Texas Government Code 551.074, Superintendent Summative Evaluation. And Texas Government Code 551.089, Discussion of District-Wide Intruder Detection Audit Report Findings. There will be no action taken in closed session. We will come back out to open for any action.
All right, board members, it is 12-12, October 28th. Do I have a motion from closed? I move that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendations for teacher employment contract for personnel additions as presented in accordance with salary scale policies and contract of Lene uh, Leander Independent <laughs> School District for the 2022-2023 school year. I second. I have a motion from Christine, second from Anna. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven ayes, no nays, motion carries. Is that it? Is that all the motions? Okay. It is 1213. We have completed our agenda for the evening. If there are no objections, we will adjourn. Thank you, board members.